Ruth by Elizabeth Gaskell Chapter 1 The Dressmaker's Apprentice at Work There is an assize town in one of the eastern counties which was much distinguished by the Tudor sovereigns, and in consequence of their favour and protection, attained a degree of importance that surprises the modern traveller. A hundred years ago its appearance was that of picturesque grandeur. The old houses, which were the temporary residence of such of the county families as contented themselves with the gaieties of a provincial town, crowded the streets, and gave them the irregular but noble appearance yet to be seen in the cities of Belgium. The sides of the streets had a quaint richness from the effect of the gables, and the stacks of chimneys which cut against the blue sky above, while, if the eye fell lower down, the attention was arrested by all kinds of projections in the shape of balcony and oriel. It was amusing to see the infinite variety of windows that had been crammed into the walls long before Mr. Pitt's days of taxation. The streets below suffered from all these projections and advanced stories above. They were dark and ill-paved with large, round, jolting pebbles, and with no side-path protected by curbstones. There were no lamp-posts for long winter nights, and no regard was paid to the wants of the middle class, who neither drove about in coaches of their own, nor were carried by their own men in their own sedans into the very halls of their friends. The professional men and their wives, the shopkeepers and their spouses, and all such people walked about at considerable peril both night and day. The broad, unwieldy carriages hemmed them up against the houses in the narrow streets. The inhospitable houses projected their flights of steps almost into the carriageway, forcing pedestrians again into the danger they had avoided for twenty or thirty paces. Then, at night, the only light was derived from the glaring, flaring oil lamps hung above the doors of the more aristocratic mansions, just allowing space for the passers-by to become visible, before they again disappeared into the darkness, where it was no uncommon thing for robbers to be in waiting for their prey. The traditions of those bygone times, even to the smallest social particular, enable one to understand more clearly the circumstances which contributed to the formation of character. The daily life into which people are born, and into which they are absorbed before they are well aware, forms chains which only one in a hundred has moral strength enough to despise, and to break when the right time comes when an inward necessity for independent individual action arises, which is superior to all outward conventionalities. Therefore, it is well to know what were the chains of daily domestic habit, which were the natural leading strings of our forefathers before they learnt to go alone. The picturesqueness of those ancient streets has departed now. The Astleys, the Dunstons, the Waverhams, names of power in that district, go up duly to London in the season, and have sold their residences in the county town fifty years ago or more. And when the county town lost its attraction for the Astleys, the Dunstons, the Waverhams, how could it be supposed that the Dumvilles, the Bextons, and the Wilds would continue to go and winter there in their second-rate houses, and with their increased expenditure? So the grand old houses stood empty a while, and then speculators ventured to purchase and to turn the deserted mansions into many smaller dwellings, fitted for professional men, or even 
bend your ear lower lest the shade of marmaduke first baron waverham here into shops even that was not so very bad compared with the next innovation of the old glories the shopkeepers found out that the once fashionable street was dark and that the dingy light did not show off their goods to advantage the surgeon could not see to draw his patient's teeth the lawyer had to ring for candles an hour earlier than he was accustomed to when living in a more plebeian street in short by mutual consent the whole front of one side of the street was pulled down and rebuilt in the flat mean unrelieved style of george the third the body of the houses was too solidly grand to submit to alteration so people were occasionally surprised after passing through a commonplace-looking shop to find themselves at the foot of a grand carved oaken staircase lighted by a window of stained glass storied all over with armorial bearings up such a stair past such a window through which the moonlight fell on her, her with a glory of many colours ruth hilton passed wearily one january night now many years ago i call it night but strictly speaking it was morning two o'clock in the morning chimed forth the old bells of st saviour's and yet more than a dozen girls still sat in the room into which ruth entered stitching away as if for very life not daring to gape or show any outward manifestation of sleepiness they only sighed a little when ruth told mrs mason the hour of the night as the result of her errand for they knew that stay up late as they might the work hours of the very next day must begin at eight and their young limbs were very weary mrs mason worked away as hard as any of them but she was older and tougher and besides the gains were hers but even she perceived that some rest was needed young ladies there will be an interval allowed of half an hour ring the bell miss sutton martha shall bring you up some bread and cheese and beer you will be so good as to eat it standing away from the dresses and to have your hands washed ready for work when i return in half an hour she said once more very distinctly and then she left the room it was curious to watch the young girls as they instantaneously availed themselves of mrs mason's absence one fat particularly heavy-looking damsel laid her head on her folded arms and was asleep in a moment refusing to be wakened for her share in the frugal supper but springing up with a frightened look at the sound of mrs mason's returning footstep even while it was still far off on the echoing stairs two or three others huddled over the scanty fireplace which with every possible economy of space and no attempt whatever at anything of grace or ornament was inserted in the slight flat-looking wall that had been run up by the present owner of the property to portion off this division of the grand old drawing-room of the mansion some employed the time in eating their bread and cheese with as measured and incessant a motion of the jaws and almost as stupidly placid an expression of countenance as you may see in cows ruminating in the first meadow you happen to pass some held up admiringly the beautiful ball dress in progress while others examined the effect backing from the object to be criticised in the true artistic manner others stretched themselves into all sorts of postures to relieve the weary muscles one or two gave vent to all the yawns coughs and sneezes that had been pent up so long in the presence of mrs mason but ruth hilton sprang to the large old window and pressed against it as a bird presses against the bars of its cage she put back the blind and gazed into the quiet moonlit night it was doubly light almost as much so as day 
for everything was covered with the deep snow which had been falling silently ever since the evening before. The window was in a square recess. The old strange little panes of glass had been replaced by those which gave more light. A little distance off, the feathery branches of a larch waved softly to and fro in the scarcely perceptible night breeze. Poor old larch, the time had been when it had stood in a pleasant lawn, with the tender grass creeping caressingly up its very trunk. But now the lawn was divided into yards and squalid back premises, and the larch was pent up and girded about with flagstones. The snow lay thick on its boughs, and now and then fell noiselessly down. The old stables had been added to, and altered into a dismal street of mean-looking houses, back to back with the ancient mansions. And over all these changes from grandeur to squalor bent down the purple heavens with their unchanging splendor. Ruth pressed her hot forehead against the cold glass, and strained her aching eyes in gazing out on the lovely sky of a winter's night. The impulse was strong upon her to snatch up a shawl, and wrapping it round her head to sally forth and enjoy the glory, and time was when that impulse would have been instantly followed. But now Ruth's eyes filled with tears, and she stood quite still, dreaming of the days that were gone. Someone touched her shoulder while her thoughts were far away, remembering past January nights which had resembled this, and were yet so different. "'Ruth, love,' whispered a girl, who had unwillingly distinguished herself by a long, hard fit of coughing. "'Come and have some supper. You don't know yet how it helps one through the night. "'One run, one blow of the fresh air would do me more good,' said Ruth. "'Not such a night as this,' replied the other, shivering at the very thought." "'And why not such a night as this, Jenny?' answered Ruth. "'Oh, at home I have many a time run up the lane all the way to the mill just to see the icicles hang on the great wheel, and when I was once out I could hardly find it in my heart to come in, even to mother, sitting by the fire, even to mother,' she added in a low melancholy tone, which had something of inexpressible sadness in it. "'Why, Jenny,' said she, rousing herself, but not before her eyes were swimming in tears. Own, now, that you never saw those dismal, hateful, tumble-down old houses there look half so, what shall I call them, almost beautiful, as they do now, with that soft, pure, exquisite covering, and if they are so improved, think of what trees and grass and ivy must be on such a night as this." Jenny could not be persuaded into admiring the winter's night, which to her came only as a cold and dismal time, when her cough was more troublesome and the pain in her side worse than usual. But she put her arm round Ruth's neck and stood by her, glad that the orphan apprentice, who was not yet inured to the hardship of a dressmaker's workroom, should find so much to give her pleasure in such a common occurrence as a frosty night. They remained deep in separate trains of thought till Mrs. Mason's step was heard when each returned supperless but refreshed to her seat. Ruth's place was the coldest and the darkest in the room, although she liked it the best. She had instinctively chosen it for the sake of the wall opposite to her, on which was a remnant of the beauty of the old drawing-room, which must once have been magnificent to judge from the faded specimen left. It was divided into panels of pale sea-green, picked out with white and gold, and on these panels were painted, were thrown with the careless triumphant hand of a master, the most lovely wreaths of flowers, profuse and luxuriant beyond description, and so real-looking that you could almost fancy you smelt their fragrance, and heard the south wind go softly rustling in and out among the crimson roses. 
the branches of purple and white lilac, the floating golden tressed laburnum boughs. Besides these, there were stately white lilies, sacred to the virgin, hollyhocks, fraxinella, monk's hoods, pansies, primroses, every flower which blooms profusely in charming old-fashioned country gardens was there, depicted among its graceful foliage, but not in the wild disorder in which I have enumerated them. At the bottom of the panel lay a holly branch, whose stiff straightness was ornamented by a twining drapery of English ivy, and mistletoe, and winter aconite, while down either side hung pendant garlands of spring and autumn flowers, and crowning all came gorgeous summer, with the sweet musk roses and the rich colored flowers of June and July. Surely Manoyer, or whoever the dead and gone artist might be, would have been gratified to know the pleasure his handiwork, even in its wane, had power to give to the heavy heart of a young girl, for they conjured up visions of other sister flowers that grew and blossomed and withered away in her early home. Mrs. Mason was particularly desirous that her workwomen should exert themselves to-night, for, on the next, the annual hunt-ball was to take place. It was the one gaiety of the town since the assize balls had been discontinued. Many were the dresses she had promised should be sent home without fail the next morning. She had not let one slip through her fingers for fear, if it did, it might fall into the hands of the rival dressmaker who had just established herself in the very same street. She determined to administer a gentle stimulant to the flagging spirits, and with a little preliminary cough to attract attention, she began. I may as well inform you, young ladies, that I have been requested this year, as on previous occasions, to allow some of my young people to attend in the antechamber of the assembly room with sandal ribbon, pins, and such little matters, and to be ready to repair any accidental injury to the ladies' dresses. I shall send four of the most diligent. She laid a marked emphasis on the last words but without much effect. They were too sleepy to care for any of the pomps and vanities, or indeed for any of the comforts of this world, excepting one sole thing, their beds. Mrs. Mason was a very worthy woman, but, like many other worthy women, she had her foibles, and one, very natural to her calling, was to pay an extreme regard to appearances. Accordingly, she had already selected in her own mind the four girls who were most likely to do credit to the establishment, and these were secretly determined upon, although it was very well to promise the reward to the most diligent. She was really not aware of the falseness of this conduct, being an adept in that species of sophistry with which people persuade themselves that what they wish to do is right. At last there was no resisting the evidence of weariness. They were told to go to bed, but even that welcome command was languidly obeyed. Slowly they folded up their work, heavily they moved about, until at length all was put away and they trooped up the wide, dark staircase. Oh, how shall I get through five years of these terrible nights in that close room, and in the oppressive stillness which lets every sound of the thread be heard as it goes eternally backwards and forwards, sobbed out Ruth, as she threw herself on her bed without even undressing herself. Nay, Ruth, you know it won't be always as it has been to-night. We often get to go to bed by ten o'clock, and by and by you won't mind the closeness of the room. You're worn out to-night, or you would not have minded the sound of the needle. I never hear it. Come, let me unfasten you,' said Jenny. 
what is the use of undressing we must be up again and at work in three hours and in those three hours you may get a great deal of rest if you will but undress yourself and fairly coat to bed come love jenny's advice was not resisted but before ruth went to sleep she said oh i wish i was not so cross and impatient i don't think i used to be no i am sure not most new girls get impatient at first but it goes off and they don't care much for anything after a while poor child she's asleep already said jenny to herself she could not sleep or rest the tightness at her side was worse than usual she almost thought she ought to mention it in her letters home but then she remembered the premium her father had struggled to pay and the large family younger than herself that had to be cared for and she determined to bear on and trust that when the warm weather came both the pain and the cough would go away she would be prudent about herself what was the matter with ruth she was crying in her sleep as if her heart would break such agitated slumber could be no rest so jenny wakened her ruth ruth oh jenny said ruth sitting up in bed and pushing back the masses of hair that were heating her forehead i thought i saw mamma by the side of the bed coming as she used to do to see if i were asleep and comfortable and when i tried to take hold of her she went away and left me alone i don't know where so strange it was only a dream you know you'd been talking about her to me and you're feverish with sitting up late go to sleep again and i'll watch and waken you if you seem uneasy but you'll be so tired oh dear dear ruth was asleep again even while she sighed morning came and though their rest had been short the girls arose refreshed miss sutton miss jennings miss booth and miss hilton you will see that you are ready to accompany me to the shire hall by eight o'clock one or two of the girls looked astonished but the majority having anticipated the selection and knowing from experience the unexpressed rule by which it was made received it with the sullen indifference which had become their feeling with regard to most events a deadened sense of life consequent upon their unnatural mode of existence their sedentary days and their frequent nights of late watching but to ruth it was inexplicable she had yawned and loitered and looked off at the beautiful panel and lost herself in thoughts of home until she fully expected the reprimand which at any other time she would have been sure to receive and now to her surprise she was singled out as one of the most diligent much as she longed for the delight of seeing the noble shire hall the boast of the county and of catching glimpses of the dancers and hearing the band much as she longed for some variety to the dull monotonous life she was leading she could not feel happy to accept a privilege granted as she believed in ignorance of the real state of the case so she startled her companions by rising abruptly and going up to mrs mason who was finishing a dress which ought to have been sent home two hours before if you please mrs mason i was not one of the most diligent i am afraid i believe i was not diligent at all i was very tired and i could not help thinking and when i think i can't tend to my work she stopped believing she had sufficiently explained her meaning but mrs mason would not understand and did not wish for any further elucidation well my dear you must learn to think and work too or if you can't do both you must leave off thinking your guardian you know expects you to make great progress in your business and i am sure you won't disappoint him but that was not to the point ruth stood still an instant although mrs mason resumed her employment 
in a manner which any one but a new girl would have known to be intelligible enough that she did not wish for any more conversation just then but as i was not diligent i ought not to go ma'am miss wood was far more industrious than i and many of the others tiresome girl muttered mrs mason i've half a mind to keep her at home for plaguing me so but looking up she was struck afresh with the remarkable beauty with which ruth possessed such a credit to the house with her waving outline of figure her striking face with dark eyebrows and dark lashes combined with auburn hair and a fair complexion no diligent or idle ruth hilton must appear to-night miss hilton said mrs mason with stiff dignity i am not accustomed as these young ladies can tell you to have my decisions questioned what i say i mean and i have my reasons so sit down if you please and take care and be ready by eight not a word more as she fancied she saw ruth again about to speak jenny you ought to have gone not me said ruth in no low voice to miss wood as she sat down by her ruth ruth i could not go if i might because of my cough i would rather give it up to you than any one if it were mine to give and suppose it is then take the pleasure as my present and tell me every bit about it when you come home to-night well i shall take it in that way and not as if i'd earned it which i haven't so thank you you can't think how i shall enjoy it now i did work diligently for five minutes last night after i heard of it i wanted to go so much but i could not keep it up oh dear and i shall really hear a band and see the inside of that beautiful shire hall End of chapter one chapter two ruth goes to the shire hall in due time that evening mrs mason collected her young ladies for an inspection of their appearance before proceeding to the shire hall her eager important hurried manner of summoning them was not unlike that of a hen clucking her chickens together and to judge from the close investigation they had to undergo it might have been thought that their part in the evening's performance was to be far more important than that of temporary ladies maids is that your best frock miss hilton asked mrs mason in a half dissatisfied tone turning ruth about for it was only her sunday black silk and was somewhat worn and shabby yes ma'am answered ruth quietly oh indeed then it will do still the half-satisfied tone dress young lady you know is a very secondary consideration conduct is everything still miss hilton i think you should write and ask your guardian to send you some money for another gown i am sorry i did not think of it before i do not think he would send any if i wrote answered ruth in a low voice he was angry when i wanted a shawl when the cold weather set in mrs mason gave her a little push of dismissal and ruth fell into the ranks by her friend miss wood never mind ruthie you're prettier than any of them said a merry good-natured girl whose plainness excluded her from any of the envy of rivalry yes i know i am pretty said ruth sadly but i am sorry i have no better gown for this is very shabby i am ashamed of it myself and i can see mrs mason is twice as much ashamed i wish i need not go i did not know we should have to think about our own dress at all or i should not have wished to go never mind ruth said jenny you have been looked at now and mrs mason will soon be too busy to think about you in your gown did you hear ruth hilton say she knew she was pretty whispered one girl to another so loudly that ruth caught the words 
I could not help knowing, answered she simply, for many people have told me so. At length these preliminaries were over, and they were walking briskly through the frosty air. The free motion was so inspiring that Ruth almost danced along, and quite forgot all about shabby gowns and grumbling guardians. The Shire Hall was even more striking than she had expected. The sides of the staircase were painted with figures that showed ghostly in the dim light, for only their faces looked out of the dark, dingy canvas, with a strange, fixed stare of expression. The young milliners had to arrange their wares on tables in the ante-room, and make all ready before they could venture to peep into the hall-room, where the musicians were already tuning their instruments, and where one or two charwomen, strange contrast with their dirty loose attire and their incessant chatter to the grand echoes of the vaulted room, were completing the dusting of benches and chairs. They quitted the place as Ruth and her companions entered. They had talked lightly and merrily in the ante-room, but now their voices were hushed, awed by the old magnificence of the vast apartment. It was so large that objects showed dim at the further end, as through a mist. Full-length figures of county worthies hung around, in all varieties of costume from the days of Holbein to the present time. The lofty roof was indistinct, for the lamps were not fully lighted yet, while through the richly painted Gothic window at one end the moonbeams fell, many tinted on the floor and mocked with their vividness the struggles of the artificial light to illuminate its little sphere. High above sounded the musicians, fitfully trying some strain of which they were not certain. Then they stopped playing and talked, and their voices sounded goblin-like in their dark recess, where candles were carried about in an uncertain wavering manner, reminding Ruth of the flickering zigzag motion of the will-of-the-wisp. Suddenly the room sprang into the full blaze of light, and Ruth felt less impressed with its appearance, and more willing to obey Mrs. Mason's sharp summons to her wandering flock, than she had been when it was dim and mysterious. They had presently enough to do in rendering offices of assistance to the ladies who thronged in, and whose voices drowned all the muffled sound of the band Ruth had longed so much to hear. Still, if one pleasure was less, another was greater than she had anticipated. On condition of such a number of little observances that Ruth thought Mrs. Mason would never have ended enumerating them, they were allowed during the dances to stand at a side door and watch. And what a beautiful sight it was! Floating away to that bounding music, now far away like garlands of fairies, now near and showing as lovely women with every ornament of graceful dress, the elite of the county danced on, little caring whose eyes gazed and were dazzled. Outside all was cold and colourless and uniform, one coating of snow over all, but inside it was warm and glowing and vivid, flowers scented the air, and wreathed the head and rested on the bosom as if it were midsummer. Bright colours flashed on the eye and were gone, and succeeded by others as lovely in the rapid movement of the dance. Smiles dimpled every face, and low tones of happiness murmured indistinctly through the room in every pause of the music. Ruth did not care to s separate figures that formed a joyous and brilliant whole. It was enough to gaze and the dream of the happy smoothness of the lives in which such music and such profusion of flowers, of jewels, elegance of every description and beauty of all shapes and hues, were everyday things. She did not want to know who the people were, 
although to hear a catalogue of names seemed to be the great delight of most of her companions. In fact, the enumeration rather disturbed her, and, to avoid the shock of too rapid a descent into the commonplace world of Miss Smith's and Mr. Thompson's, she returned to her post in the anteroom. There she stood, thinking or dreaming. She was startled back to actual life by a voice close to her. One of the dancing young ladies had met with a misfortune. Her dress of some gossamer material had been looped up by nosegays of flowers, and one of these had fallen off in the dance, leaving her gown to trail. To repair this she had begged her partner to bring her to the room where the assistants should have been. None were there but Ruth. "'Shall I leave you?' asked the gentleman. "'Is my absence necessary?' "'Oh, no,' replied the lady. "'A few stitches will set all to rights. Besides, I dare not enter that room by myself.' So far she spoke sweetly and prettily, but now she addressed Ruth. "'Make haste. Don't keep me an hour.' And her voice became cold and authoritative. She was very pretty, with long dark ringlets and sparkling black eyes. These had struck Ruth in the hasty glance she had taken before she knelt down to her task. She also saw that the gentleman was young and elegant. "'Oh, that lovely gallop! How I long to dance to it! Will it never be done? What a frightful time you are taking, and I'm dying to return in time for this gallop!' By way of showing a pretty childlike impatience, she began to beat time with her feet to the spirited air the band was playing. Ruth could not darn the rent in her dress with this continual motion, and she looked up to remonstrate. As she threw her head back for this purpose, she caught the eye of the gentleman who was standing by. It was so expressive of amusement at the airs and graces of his pretty partner that Ruth was infected by the feeling, and had to bend her face down to conceal the smile that mantled there. But not before he had seen it, and not before his attention had been thereby drawn to consider the kneeling figure that habited in black up to the throat with the noble head bent down to the occupation in which she was engaged, formed such a contrast to the flippant, bright, artificial girl who sat to be served with an air as haughty as a queen on her throne. "'Oh, Mr. Bellingham, I'm ashamed to detain you so long. I had no idea any one could have spent so much time over a little tear.' No wonder Mrs. Mason charges so much for dressmaking if her workwomen are so slow. It was meant to be witty, but Mr. Bellingham looked grave. He saw the scarlet color of annoyance flush to that beautiful cheek, which was partially presented to him. He took a candle from the table and held it so that Ruth had more light. She did not look up to thank him for she felt ashamed that he should have seen the smile which she had caught from him. "'I am sorry I have been so long, ma'am,' she said gently as she finished her work. "'I was afraid it might tear out again if I did not do it carefully.' She rose. "'I would rather have it torn than have missed that charming galop,' said the young lady, shaking out her dress as a bird shakes its plumage. "'Shall we go, Mr. Bellingham?' looking up at him. He was surprised that she gave no word or sign of thanks to the assistant. He took up a camellia that someone had left on the table. "'Allow me, Miss Dunscombe, to give this, in your name, to this young lady, as thanks for her dexterous help.' "'Oh, of course,' said she. Ruth received the flowers silently but with a grave, modest motion of her head. They had gone, and she was once more alone. Presently her companions returned. "'What was the matter with Miss Dunscombe? Did she come here?' asked they. "'Only her lace dress was torn, and I mended it,' answered Ruth quickly. 
did mr bellingham come with her they say he's going to be married to her did he come ruth yes said ruth and relapsed into silence mr bellingham danced on gaily and merrily through the night and fitted with miss dunscombe as he thought good but he looked often to the side door where the milliner's apprentices stood and once he recognized the tall slight figure and the rich auburn hair of the girl in black and then his eyes sought for the camellia it was there snowy white in her bosom and he danced on more gaily than ever the cold grey dawn was drearily lighting up the streets when mrs mason and her company returned home the lamps were extinguished yet the shutters of the shops and dwelling-houses were not opened all sounds had an echo unheard of by day one or two houseless beggars sat on doorsteps and shivering slept with heads bowed on their knees or resting against the cold hard support afforded by the wall ruth felt as if a dream had melted away and she were once more in the actual world how long would it be even in the most favourable chance before she should again enter the shire hall or hear a band of music or even see again those bright happy people as much without any semblance of care or woe as if they belonged to another race of beings had they ever to deny themselves a witch much less a want literally and figuratively their lives seemed to wander through flowery pleasure paths here was cold biting midwinter for her and such as her for those poor beggars almost a season of death but to miss dunscombe and her companions a happy merry time when flowers still bloomed and fires crackled and comforts and luxuries were piled around them like fairy gifts what did they know of the meaning of the word so terrific to the poor what was winter to them but ruth fancied that mr bellingham looked as if he could understand the feelings of those removed from him by circumstance and station he had drawn up the windows of his carriage it is true with a shudder ruth then had been watching him yet she had no idea that any association made her camellia precious to her she believed it was solely on account of its exquisite beauty that she tended it so carefully she told jenny every particular of its presentation with open straight-looking eye and without the deepening of a shade of colour was it not kind of him you can't think how nicely he did it just when i was a little bit mortified by her ungracious ways it was very nice indeed replied jenny such a beautiful flower i wish it had some scent i wish it to be exactly as it is it is perfect so pure said ruth almost clasping her treasure as she placed it in water who is mr bellingham he is son to that mrs bellingham of the priory for whom we made the grey satin police answered jenny sleepily that was before my time said ruth but there was no answer jenny was asleep it was long before ruth followed her example even on a winter day it was clear morning light that fell upon her face as she smiled in her slumber jenny would not waken her but watched her face with admiration it was so lovely in its happiness she is dreaming of last night thought jenny it was true she was but one figure flitted more than all the rest through her visions he presented flower after flower to her in that baseless morning dream which was all too quickly ended the night before she had seen her dead mother in her sleep and she wakened weeping and now she dreamed of mr bellingham and smiled and yet was this a more evil dream than the other the realities of life seemed to cut more sharply against her heart than usual that morning the late hours of the preceding nights and perhaps the excitement of the evening before 
had indisposed her to bear calmly the rubs and crosses which beset all mrs mason's young ladies at times for mrs mason though the first dressmaker in the county was human after all and suffered like her apprentices from the same causes that affected them this morning she was disposed to find fault with everything and everybody she seemed to have risen with the determination of putting the world and all that it contained her world at least to rights before night and abuses and negligence which had long passed unreproved or winked at were to-day to be dragged to light and sharply reprimanded nothing less than perfection would satisfy mrs mason at such times she had her ideas of justice too but they were not divinely beautiful and true ideas they were something more resembling a grocer's or tea-dealer's ideas of equal right a little overindulgence last night was to be balanced by a good deal of over-severity to-day and this manner of rectifying previous errors fully satisfied her conscience ruth was not inclined for or capable of much extra exertion and it would have tasked all her powers to have pleased her superior the workroom seemed filled with sharp calls miss hilton where have you put the blue persian whenever things are mislaid i know it has been miss hilton's evening for siding away miss hilton was going out last night so i offered to clear the workroom for her i will find it directly ma'am answered one of the girls oh i am well aware of miss hilton's custom of shuffling off her duties upon any one who can be induced to relieve her replied mrs mason ruth reddened and tears sprang to her eyes but she was so conscious of the falsity of the accusation that she rebuked herself for being moved by it and raising her head gave a proud look round as if in appeal to her companions where's the skirt of lady farnham's dress the flounce is not put on i am surprised may i ask to whom this work was entrusted yesterday inquired mrs mason fixing her eyes on ruth i was to have done it but i made a mistake and had to undo it i am very sorry i might have guessed certainly there is little difficulty to be sure in discovering when work has been neglected or spoilt into whose hands it has fallen such were the speeches which fell to ruth's share on this day of all days when she was least fitted to bear them with equanimity in the afternoon it was necessary for mrs mason to go a few miles into the country she left injunctions and orders and directions and prohibitions without end but at last she was gone and in the relief of her absence ruth laid her arms on the table and burying her head began to cry aloud with weak unchecked sobs don't cry miss hilton ruthie never mind the old dragon how will you bear on for five years if you don't spirit yourself up not to care a straw for what she says were some of the modes of comfort and sympathy administered by the young workwomen jenny with a wiser insight into the grievance and its remedy said suppose ruth goes out in instead of you fanny barton to do the errands the fresh air will do her good and you know you dislike the cold east winds while ruth says she enjoys frost and snow and all kinds of shivery weather fanny barton was a great sleepy-looking girl huddling over the fire no one so willing as she to relinquish the walk on this bleak afternoon when the east wind blew keenly down the street drying up the very snow itself there was no temptation to come abroad for those who were not absolutely obliged to leave their warm rooms indeed the dusked hour showed that it was the usual tea-time for the humble inhabitants of that part of the town through which ruth had to pass on her shopping expedition as she came to the high ground just above the river where the street sloped rapidly down to the bridge she saw the flat country beyond all covered with snow making the black dome of the cloud-laden sky appear yet blacker 
as if the winter's night had never fairly gone away but had hovered on the edge of the world all through the short bleak day down by the bridge where there was a little shelving bank used as a landing place for any pleasure boats that could float on that shallow stream some children were playing and defying the cold one of them had got a large washing tub and with the use of a broken oar kept steering and pushing himself hither and thither in the little creek much to the admiration of his companions who stood gravely looking on immovable in their attentive observation of the hero although their faces were blue with cold and their hands crammed deep into their pockets with some faint hope of finding warmth there perhaps they feared that if they unpacked themselves from their lumpy attitudes and began to move about the cruel wind would find its way into every cranny of their tattered dress they were all huddled up and still with eyes intent on the embryo sailor at last one little man envious of the reputation that his playfellow was acquiring by his daring called out i'll set thee a craddy tom thou daren't go over yon black line in the water out into the real river of course the challenge was not to be refused and tom paddled away toward the dark line beyond which the river swept with smooth steady current ruth a child in years herself stood at the top of the declivity watching the adventurer but as unconscious of any danger as the group of children below at their playfellow's success they broke through the calm gravity of observation into boisterous marks of applause clapping their hands and stamping their impatient little feet and shouting well done tom thou hast done it rarely tom stood in childish dignity for a moment facing his admirers then in an instant his washing-tub boat was whirled around and he lost his balance and fell out and both he and his boat were carried away slowly but surely by the strong full river which eternally moved onwards to the sea the children shrieked aloud with terror and ruth flew down to the little bay and far into its shallow waters before she felt how useless such an action was and that the sensible plan would have been to seek for efficient help hardly had this thought struck her when louder and sharper than the sullen roar of the stream that was ceaselessly un and unrelentingly flowing out on came the splash of a horse galloping through the water in which she was standing past her like lightning down in the stream swimming along with the current a stooping rider an outstretched grasping arm a little life redeemed and a child saved to those who loved it ruth stood dizzy and sick with emotion while all this took place and when the rider turned the swimming horse and slowly breasted up the river to the landing place she recognized him as the mr bellingham of the night before he carried the unconscious child across his horse the body hung in so lifeless a manner that ruth believed it was dead and her eyes were suddenly blinded with tears she waded back to the beach to the point toward which mr bellingham was directing his horse is he dead asked she stretching out her arms to receive the little fellow for she instinctively felt that the position in which he hung was not the most conducive to returning consciousness if indeed it would ever return i think not answered mr bellingham as he gave the child to her before springing off his horse is he your brother do you know who he is look said ruth who had sat down upon the ground the better to prop the poor lad his hand twitches he lives oh sir he lives whose boy is he to the people who came hurrying and gathering to the spot at the rumour of an accident he's old nelly brownson said they her grandson we must take him into a house directly said she is his home far off no no it's just close by one of you go for a doctor at once said mr bellingham authoritatively and bring him to the old woman's without delay 
you must not hold him any longer he continued speaking to ruth and remembering her face now for the first time your dress is dripping wet already here you fellow take him up do you see but the child's hand had nervously clenched ruth's dress and she would not have him disturbed she carried her heavy burden very tenderly toward a mean little cottage indicated by the neighbours an old crippled woman was coming out of the door shaking all over with agitation dear heart said she he's the last of em all and he's gone afore me nonsense said mr bellingham the boy is alive and likely to live but the old woman was helpless and hopeless and insisted on believing that her grandson was dead and dead he would have been if it had not been for ruth and one or two of the more sensible neighbours who under mr bellingham's directions bustled about and did all that was necessary until animation was restored what a confounded time those people are in fetching the doctor said mr bellingham to ruth between whom and himself a sort of silent understanding had sprung up from the circumstances of their having been the only two besides mere children who had witnessed the accident and also the only two to whom a certain degree of cultivation had given the power of understanding each other's thoughts and even each other's words it takes so much to knock an idea into such stupid people's heads they stood gaping and asking which doctor they were to go for as if it signified whether it was brown or smith so long as he had his wits about him i have no more time to waste here either i was on the gallop when i caught sight of the lad and now he has fairly sobbed and opened his eyes i see no use in my staying in this stifling atmosphere may i trouble you with one thing will you be so good as to see that the little fellow has all that he wants if you'll allow me i'll leave you my purse continued he giving it to ruth who was only too glad to have this power entrusted to her of procuring one or two requisites which she had perceived to be wanted but she saw some gold between the network she did not like the charge of such riches i shall not want so much really sir one sovereign will be plenty more than enough may i take that out and i will give you back what is left of it when i see you again or perhaps i had better send it to you sir i think you had better keep it all at present oh what a horrid dirty place this is insufferable two minutes longer you must not stay here you'll be poisoned with this abominable air come toward the door i beg well if you think one sovereign will be enough i will take my purse only remember you apply to me if you think they want more they were standing at the door where some one was holding mr bellingham's horse ruth was looking at him with her earnest eyes mrs mason and her errands quite forgotten in the interest of the afternoon's event her whole thoughts bent upon rightly understanding and following out his wishes for the little boy's welfare and until now this had been the first object in his own mind but at this moment the strong perception of ruth's exceeding beauty came again upon him he almost lost the sense of what he was saying he was so startled with admiration the night before he had not seen her eyes and now they looked straight and innocently full at him grave earnest and deep but when she instinctively read the change in the expression of his countenance she dropped her large white veiling lids and he thought her face was lovelier still the irresistible impulse seized him to arrange matters so that he might see her again before long no said he i see it would be better that you should keep the purse many things may be wanted for the lad which we cannot calculate upon now if i remember rightly there are three sovereigns and some loose change i shall perhaps see you again in a few days when if there be any money left in the purse you can restore it to me oh yes sir said ruth alive to the magnitude of the wants to which she might have to administer and yet rather afraid of the responsibility implied in the possession of so much money is there any chance of my meeting you again in this house asked he 
i hope to come whenever i can sir but i must run in errand times and i don't know when my turn may be oh he did not fully understand this answer i should like to know how you think the boy is going on if it is not giving you too much trouble do you ever take walks not for walking's sake sir well he said you go to church i suppose mrs mason does not keep you at work on sundays i trust oh no sir i go to church regularly then perhaps you will be so good as to tell me what church you go to and i will meet you there next sunday afternoon i go to st nicholas's sir i will take care and bring you word how the boy is and what the doctor they get and i will keep an account of the money i spend very well thank you remember i trust to you he meant that he relied on her promise to meet him but ruth thought that he was referring to the responsibility of doing the best she could for the child he was going away when a fresh thought struck him and he turned back into the cottage once more and addressed ruth with half a smile on his countenance it seems rather strange but we have no one in to introduce us my name is bellingham yours is ruth hilton sir she answered in a low voice for now that the conversation no real longer related to the boy she felt shy and restrained he held out his hand to shake hers and just as she gave it to him the old grandmother came tottering up to ask some question the interrogation jarred upon him and made him once more keenly alive to the closeness of the air and the squalor and dirt by which he was surrounded my good woman said he to nelly brownson could you not keep your place a little neater and cleaner it is more fit for pigs than human beings the air in this room is quite offensive and the dirt and filth is really disgraceful by this time he was mounted and bowing to ruth he rode away then the old woman's wrath broke out who may you be that knows no better manners than to come into a poor woman's house to abuse it fit for pigs indeed what do you call yon fellow he is mr bellingham said ruth shocked at the old woman's apparent ingratitude it was he that rode into the water to save your grandson he would have been drowned but for mr bellingham i thought once they would both have been swept away by the current it was so strong the river is none so deep either the old woman said anxious to diminish as much as possible the obligation she was under to one who had offended her some one else would have saved him if this fine young spark had never been here he's an orphan and god watches over orphans they say i'd rather it had been any one else as had picked him out than one who comes into a poor body's house only to abuse it he did not come in only to abuse it said ruth gently he came with little tom he only said it was not quite so clean as it might be what you're taking up the cry are you wait till you are an old woman like me crippled with rheumatiz and a lad to see after like tom who is always in mud and isn't when he isn't in water and his food and mine to scrape together god knows we're often short and i do the best i can and water to fetch up that steep brow she stopped to cough and ruth judiciously changed the subject and began to consult the old woman as to the wants of her grandson in which consultation they were soon assisted by the medical man when ruth had made one or two arrangements with a neighbour whom she asked to procure the most necessary things and had heard from the doctor that all would be right in a day or two she began to quake at the recollection of the length of time she had spent at nelly brownson's and to remember with some affright the strict watch kept by mrs mason over her apprentice's outgoings and incomings on working days she hurried off to the shops and tried to recall her wandering thoughts to the respective merits of pink and blue as a match to lilac found she had lost her patterns and went home with ill-chosen things and in a fit of despair at her own stupidity the truth was that the afternoon's adventure filled her mind only the figure of tom who was now safe and likely to do well was receding into the background 
and that of Mr. Bellingham becoming more prominent than it had been. His spirited and natural action of galloping into the water to save the child was magnified by Ruth into the most heroic deed of daring. His interest about the boy was tender, thoughtful benevolence in her eyes, and his careless liberality of money was fine generosity, for she forgot that generosity implies some degree of self-denial. She was gratified, too, by the power of dispensing comfort he had entrusted to her, and was busy with al Nascar visions of wise expenditure. When the necessity of opening Mrs. Mason's house-door summoned her back into actual present life, and the dread of an immediate scolding. For this time, however, she was spared, but spared for such a reason that she would have been thankful for some blame in preference to her impunity. During her absence Jenny's difficulty of breathing had suddenly become worse, and the girls had, on their own responsibility, put her to bed, and were standing round her in dismay, when Mrs. Mason's return home, only a few minutes before Ruth arrived, fluttered them back into the workroom. And now all was confusion and hurry, a doctor to be sent for, a mind to be unburdened of directions for a dress to a forewoman who was too ill to understand, scoldings to be scattered with no illiberal hand amongst a group of frightened girls, hardly sparing the poor invalid herself for her inopportune illness. In the middle of all this turmoil Ruth crept quietly to her place with a heavy saddened heart at the indisposition of the gentle forewoman. She would gladly have nursed Jenny herself, and often longed to do it, but she could not be spared. Hands unskillful in fine and delicate work would be well enough qualified to tend the sick until the mother arrived from home. Meanwhile, extra diligence was required in the workroom, and Ruth found no opportunity of going to see little Tom, or to fulfil the plans for making him and his grandmother more comfortable, which she had proposed to herself. She regretted her rash promise to Mr. Bellingham, of attending to the little boy's welfare. All that she could do was done by means of Mrs. Mason's servant, through whom she made inquiries and sent the necessary help. The subject of Jenny's illness was the prominent one in the house. Ruth told of her own adventure, to be sure, but when she was at the very crisis of the boy's fall into the river, the more fresh and vivid interest of some tidings of Jenny was brought into the room, and Ruth ceased, almost blaming herself for caring for anything besides the question of life or death to be decided in that very house. Then a pale, gentle looking woman was seen moving softly about, and it was whispered that this was the mother come to nurse her child. Everybody liked her. She was so sweet-looking, and gave so little trouble, and seemed so patient and so thankful for any inquiries about her daughter, whose illness it was understood, although its severity was mitigated, was likely to be long and tedious while all the feelings and thoughts relating to Jenny were predominant, Sunday arrived. Mrs. Mason went to the accustomed visit to her father's, making some little show of apology to Mrs. Wood for leaving her and her daughter. The apprentices dispersed to the various friends with whom they were in the habit of spending the day, and Ruth went to St. Nicholas with a sorrowful heart, depressed on account of Jenny and self-reproachful at having rashly undertaken what she had been unable to perform. As she came out of the church she was joined by Mr. Bellingham. She had half hoped that he might have forgotten the arrangement, and yet she wished to relieve herself of her responsibility. She knew his step behind her, and the contending feelings made her heart beat hard, and she longed to run away. "'Miss Hilton, I believe,' said he, overtaking her, and bowing forward, so as to catch a sight of her rose-red face. "'How is our little sailor going on? Well, I trust, from the symptoms the other day?' "'I believe, sir, he is quite well now. I am very sorry, but I have not been able to go and see him. I am so sorry. I could not help it. 
but i have got one or two things through another person i have put them down on this slip of paper and here's your purse sir for i am afraid i can do nothing more for him we have illness in the house and it makes us very busy ruth had been so much accustomed to blame of late that she almost anticipated some remonstrance or reproach now for not having fulfilled her promise better she little guessed that mr bellingham was far more busy trying to devise some excuse for meeting her again during the silence that succeeded her speech than displeased with her for not bringing a more particular account of the little boy in whom he had ceased to feel any interest she repeated after a minute's pause i am very sorry i have done so little sir oh yes i am sure you have done all you could it was thoughtless in me to add to your engagements he is displeased with me thought ruth for what he believes to have been neglect of the boy whose life he risked his own to save if i told all he would see that i could not do more but i cannot tell him all the sorrows and worries that have taken up my time and yet i am tempted to give you another little commission if it is not taking up too much of your time and presuming too much on your good nature said he a bright idea having just struck him mrs mason lives in hennage place does she not my mother's ancestors lived there and once when the house was being repaired she took me in to show me the old place there was an old hunting piece painted on a panel over one of the chimney pieces the figures were portraits of my ancestors i have often thought i should like to purchase it if it still remained there can you ascertain this for me and bring me word next sunday oh yes sir said ruth glad that this commission was completely within her power to execute and anxious to make up for her previous seeming neglect i'll look directly i get home and ask mrs mason to write and let you know thank you said he only half satisfied i think perhaps however it might be as well not to trouble mrs mason about it you see it would compromise me and i am not quite determined to purchase the picture if you would ascertain whether the painting is there and tell me i would take a little time to reflect and afterwards i could apply to mrs mason myself very well sir i will see about it so they parted before the next sunday mrs wood had taken her daughter to her distant home to recruit in that quiet place ruth watched her down the street from an upper window and sighing deep and long returned to the workroom whence the warning voice and gentle wisdom had departed end of chapter two chapter three sunday at mrs mason's mr bellingham attended afternoon service at st nicholas's church the next sunday his thoughts had been far more occupied by ruth than hers by him although his appearance upon the scene of her life was more an event to her than it was to him he was puzzled by the impression she had produced on him though he did not in general analyzed the nature of his feelings but simply enjoyed them with the delight which youth takes in experiencing new and strong emotion he was old compared to ruth but young as a man hardly three-and-twenty the fact of his being an only child had given him as it does to many a sort of inequality in those parts of the character which are usually formed by the number of years that a person has lived the unevenness of discipline to which only children are subjected the thwarting resulting from over-anxiety the indiscreet indulgence arising from a love centred all in one object had been exaggerated in his education probably from the circumstance that his mother his only surviving parent had been similarly situated to himself he was already in possession of the comparatively small property he inherited from his father the estate on which his mother lived was her own 
and her income gave her the means of indulging or controlling him after he had grown to man's estate as her wayward disposition and her love of power prompted her had he been double dealing in his conduct towards her had he condescended to humour her in the least her passionate love for him would have induced her to strip herself of all her possessions to add to his dignity or happiness but although he felt the warmest affection for her the regardlessness which she had taught him by example perhaps more than by precept of the feelings of others was continually prompting him to do things that she for the time being resented as mortal affronts he would mimic the clergyman she specially esteemed even to his very face he would refuse to visit her schools for months and months and when wearied into going at last revenge himself by puzzling the children with the most ridiculous questions gravely put that he could imagine all these boyish tricks annoyed and irritated her far more than the accounts which reached her of more serious misdoings at college and in town of these grave offences she never spoke of the smaller misdeeds she hardly ever ceased speaking still at times she had great influence over him and nothing delighted her more than to exercise it the submission of his will to hers was sure to be liberally rewarded for it gave her great happiness to extort from his indifference or his affection the concessions which she never sought by force of reason or by appeals to principle concessions which he frequently withheld solely for the sake of asserting his independence of her control she was anxious for him to marry miss duncombe she cared little or nothing about it it was time enough to be married ten years hence and so he was dawdling through some months of his life sometimes flirting with the nothing loth miss duncombe sometimes plaguing and sometimes delighting his mother at all times taking care to please himself when he first saw ruth hilton and a new passionate hearty feeling shot through his whole being he did not know why he was so fascinated by her she was very beautiful but he had seen many more agasseries calculated to set off the effect of their charms there was perhaps something bewitching in the union of the grace and loveliness of womanhood with the naivete simplicity and innocence of an intelligent child there was a spell in the shyness which made her avoid and shun all admiring approaches to acquaintance it would be an exquisite delight to attract and tame her wildness just as he had often allured and tamed the timid fawns in his mother's park by no overbold admiration or rash passionate word would he startle her and surely in time she might be induced to look upon him as a friend if not something nearer and dearer still in accordance with this determination he resisted the strong temptation of walking by her side the whole distance home after church he only received the intelligence she brought respecting the panel with thanks spoke a few words about the weather bowed and was gone ruth believed she should never see him again and in spite of sundry self-upbraidings for her folly she could not help feeling as if a shadow were drawn over her existence for several days to come mrs mason was a widow and had to struggle for the sake of the six or seven children left dependent on her exertions thus there was some reason and great excuse for the pinching economy which regulated her household affairs on sundays she chose to conclude that all her apprentices had friends who would be glad to see them to dinner and give them a welcome reception for the remainder of the day while she and those of her children who were not at school went to spend the day at her father's house several miles out of the town accordingly no dinner was cooked on sundays for the young workwomen 
no fires were lighted in any of the rooms to which they had access on this morning they breakfasted in mrs mason's own parlour after which the room was closed against them through the day by some understood though unspoken prohibition what became of such as ruth who had no home and no friends in that large populous desolate town she had hitherto commissioned the servant who went to market on saturdays for the family to buy her a bun or biscuit whereon she made her fasting dinner in the deserted workroom sitting in her walking dress to keep off the cold which clung to her in spite of the shawl and bonnet then she would sit at the window looking out on the dreary prospect till her eyes were often blinded by tears and partly to shake off thoughts and recollections the indulgence in which she felt to be productive of no good and partly to have some ideas to dwell upon during the coming week beyond those suggested by the constant view of the same room she would carry her bible and place herself upon the window-seat on the wide landing which commanded the street in front of the house from thence she could see the irregular grandeur of the place she caught a view of the grey church tower rising hoary and massive into mid-air she saw one or two figures loiter along on the sunny side of the street in all the enjoyment of their fine clothes and sunday leisure and she imagined histories for them and tried to picture to herself their homes and their daily doings and before long the bells swung heavily in the church tower and struck out with musical clang the first summons to afternoon church after church was over she used to return home to the same window-seat and watch till the winter twilight was over and gone and the stars came out over the black masses of houses and then she would steal down to ask for a candle as a companion to her in the deserted workroom occasionally the servant would bring her up some tea but of late ruth had declined taking any as she had discovered she was robbing the kind-hearted creature of part of the small provision left out for her by mrs mason she sat on hungry and cold trying to read her bible and to think the old holy thoughts which had been her childish meditations at her mother's knee until one after another the apprentices returned weary with their day's enjoyment and their week's late watching too weary to make her in any way a partaker of their pleasure by entering into details of the manner in which they had spent their day and last of all mrs mason returned and summoning her young people once more into the parlour she read a prayer before dismissing them to bed she always expected to find them all in the house when she came home but asked no questions as to their proceedings through the day perhaps because she dreaded to hear that one or two had occasionally nowhere to go and that it would be sometimes necessary to order a sunday's dinner and leave a lighted fire on that day for five months ruth had been an inmate at mrs mason's and such had been the regular order of the sundays while the forewoman stayed there it is true she was ever ready to give ruth the little variety of hearing of recreations in which she was no partaker and however tired jenny might be at night she had ever some sympathy to bestow on ruth for the dull length of day she had passed after her departure the monotonous idleness of the sunday seemed worse to bear than the incessant labour of the work-days until the time came when it seemed to be a recognised hope in her mind that on sunday afternoons she should see mr bellingham and hear a few words from him as from a friend who took an interest in her thoughts and proceedings during the past week ruth's mother had been the daughter of a poor curate in norfolk and early left without parents or home she was thankful to marry a respectable farmer a good deal older than herself after their marriage however everything seemed to go wrong mrs hilton fell into a delicate state of health and was unable to bestow 
the ever-watchful attention to domestic affairs so requisite in a farmer's wife. Her husband had a series of misfortunes of a more important kind than the death of a whole brood of turkeys from getting among the nettles, or the year of bad cheeses spoilt by a careless dairymaid, which were the consequences, so the neighbours said, of Mr. Hilton's mistake in marrying a delicate fine lady. His crops failed, his horses died, his barn took fire. In short, if he had been in any way a remarkable character, one might have supposed him to be the object of an avenging fate, so successive were the evils which pursued him. But, as he was only a somewhat commonplace farmer, I believe we must attribute his calamities to some want in his character of the one quality required to act as keystone to many excellences. While his wife lived, all worldly misfortunes seemed as nothing to him. Her strong sense and lively faculty of hope upheld him from despair. Her sympathy was always ready, and the invalid's room had an atmosphere of peace and encouragement which affected all who entered it. But when Ruth was about twelve, one morning in the busy hay-time, Mrs. Hilton was left alone for some hours. This had often happened before, nor had she seemed weaker than usual when they had gone forth to the field, but on their return with merry voices to fetch the dinner prepared for the haymakers, they found an unusual silence brooding over the house. No low voice called out gently to welcome them, and ask after the day's progress, and on entering the little parlour which was called Mrs. Hilton's and was sacred to her, they found her lying dead on her accustomed sofa. Quite calm and peaceful she lay. There had been no struggle at last. The struggle was for the survivors, and one sank under it. Her husband did not make much ado at first, at least not in outward show. Her memory seemed to keep in check all external violence of grief. But day by day, dating from his wife's death, his mental powers decreased. He was still a hale-looking elderly man, and his bodily health appeared as good as ever. But he sat for hours in his easy chair, looking into the fire, not moving, nor speaking, unless when it was absolutely necessary to answer repeated questions. If Ruth, with coaxings and draggings, induced him to come out with her, he went with measured steps around his fields, his head bent to the ground with the same abstracted, unseeing look, never smiling, never changing the expression of his face, not even to one of deeper sadness, when anything occurred which might be supposed to remind him of his dead wife. But in this abstraction from all outward things his worldly affairs went even lower down. He paid money away, or received it, as if it had been so much water. The gold-mines of Potosi could not have touched the deep grief of his soul, but God in his mercy knew the sure balm, and sent the beautiful messenger to take the weary one home. After his death, the creditors were the chief people who appeared to take any interest in the affairs, and it seemed strange to Ruth to see people whom she scarcely knew, examining and touching all that she had been accustomed to consider as precious and sacred. Her father had made his will at her birth. With the pride of newly and late acquired paternity, he had considered the office of guardian to his little darling as one which would have been an additional honour to the Lord Lieutenant of the County. But, as he had not the pleasure of his lordship's acquaintance, he selected the person of most consequence among those whom he did know, not any very ambitious appointment in those days of comparative prosperity. But certainly the flourishing maltster of Skelton was a little surprised when, fifteen years later, he learnt that he was executor to a will bequeathing many vanished hundreds of pounds, and a guardian to a young girl whom he could not remember ever to have seen. 
he was a sensible hard-headed man of the world having a very fair proportion of conscience as consciences go indeed perhaps more than many people for he had some ideas of duty extending to the circle beyond his own family and did not as some would have done decline acting altogether but speedily summoned the creditors examined into the accounts sold up the farming stock and discharged all the debts paid about eighty pounds into the skelton bank for a week while he inquired for a situation or apprenticeship of some kind for poor heartbroken ruth heard of mrs mason's arranged all with her in two short conversations drove over for ruth in his gig waited while she and the old servant packed up her clothes and grew very impatient while she ran with her eyes streaming with tears round the garden tearing off in a passion of love whole boughs of favourite china and damask roses late flowering against the casement window of what had been her mother's room when she took her seat in the gig she was little able even if she had been inclined to profit by her guardian's lectures on economy and self-reliance but she was quiet and silent looking forward with longing to the night-time when in her bedroom she might give way to all her passionate sorrow at being wrenched from the home where she had lived with her parents in that utter absence of any anticipation of change which is either the blessing or the curse of childhood but at night there were four other girls in her room and she could not cry before them she watched and waited till one by one they dropped off to sleep and then she buried her face in the pillow and shook with sobbing grief and then she paused to conjure up with fond luxuriance every recollection of the happy days so little valued in their uneventful peace while they lasted so passionately regretted when once gone for ever to remember every look and word of the dear mother and to moan afresh over the change caused by her death the first clouding in of ruth's day of life it was jenny's sympathy on this first night when awakened by ruth's irrepressible agony that had made the bond between them but ruth's loving disposition continually sending forth fibres in search of nutriment found no other object for regard among those of her daily life to compensate for the want of natural ties but almost insensibly jenny's place in ruth's heart was filled up there was some one who listened with tender interest to all her little revelations who questioned her about her early days of happiness and in return spoke of his own childhood not so golden in reality as ruth's but more dazzling when recounted with stories of the beautiful cream-coloured arabian pony and the old picture gallery in the house and avenues and terraces and fountains in the garden for ruth to paint with all the vividness of imagination as scenery and background for the figure which was growing by slow degrees most prominent in her thoughts it must not be supposed that this was effected all at once though the intermediate stages have been passed over on sunday mr bellingham only spoke to her to receive the information about the panel nor did he come to st nicholas's the next nor yet the following sunday but the third he walked by her side a little way and seeing her annoyance he left her and then she wished for him back again and found the day very dreary and wondered why a strange undefined feeling had made her imagine she was doing wrong in walking alongside of one so kind and good as mr bellingham it had been very foolish of her to be self-conscious all the time and if ever he spoke to her again she would not think of what people might say but enjoy the pleasure which his kind words and evident interest in her might give then she thought it was very likely he would never notice her again for she knew she had been very rude with her short answer 
it was very provoking that she had behaved so rudely she would be sixteen in another month and she was still childish and awkward thus she lectured herself after parting with mr bellingham and the consequence was that on the following sunday she was ten times as blushing and conscious and mr bellingham thought ten times more beautiful than ever he suggested that instead of going straight home through high street she should take the round by the lisos at first she declined but then suddenly wondering and questioning herself why she refused a thing which was as far as reason and knowledge her knowledge went so innocent and which was certainly so tempting and pleasant she agreed to go the round and when she was once in the meadows that skirted the town she forgot all doubt and awkwardness nay almost forgot the presence of mr bellingham in her delight at the new tender beauty of an early spring day in february among the last year's brown ruins heaped together by the wind in the hedgerows she found the fresh green crinkled leaves and pale star-like flowers of the primroses here and there a golden celandine made brilliant the sides of the little brook that full of water in february fildyke bubbled along by the side of the path the sun was low in the horizon and once when they came to a higher part of the lisos ruth burst into an exclamation of delight at the evening glory of mellow light which was in the sky behind the purple distance while the brown leafless woods in the foreground derived an almost metallic lustre from the golden mist and haze of sunset it was but three-quarters of a mile round by the meadows but somehow it took them an hour to walk it ruth turned to thank mr bellingham for his kindness in taking her home by this beautiful way but his look of admiration at her glowing animated face made her suddenly silent and hardly wishing him good-bye she quickly entered the house with a beating happy agitated heart how strange it is she thought that evening that i should feel as if this charming afternoon's walk were somehow not exactly wrong but yet as if it were not right why can it be i am not defrauding mrs mason of any of her time that i know would be wrong i am left to go where i like on sundays i have been to church so it can't be because i have missed doing my duty if i had gone this walk with jenny i wonder whether i should have felt as i do now there must be something wrong in me myself to feel so guilty when i have done nothing which is not right and yet i can thank god for the happiness i have had in this charming spring walk which dear mamma used to say was a sign when pleasures were innocent and good for us she was not conscious as yet that mr bellingham's presence had added any charm to the ramble and when she might have become aware of this as week after week sunday after sunday loitering ramble after loitering ramble succeeded each other she was too much absorbed with one set of thoughts to have much inclination for self-questioning tell me everything ruth as you would to a brother let me help you if i can in your difficulties he said to her one afternoon and he really did try to understand and to realize how an insignificant and paltry person like mason the dressmaker could be an object of dread and regarded as a person having authority by ruth he flamed up with indignation when by way of impressing him with mrs mason's power and consequence ruth spoke of some instance of the effects of her employer's displeasure he declared his mother should never have a gown made again by such a tyrant such a mrs brownrigg that he would prevent all his acquaintances from going to such a cruel dressmaker till ruth was alarmed at the threatened consequences of her one-sided account 
and pleaded for Mrs. Mason as earnestly as if a young man's menace of this description were likely to be literally fulfilled. Indeed, sir, I have been very wrong. If you please, sir, don't be so angry. She is often very good to us, and it is only sometimes she goes into a passion, and we are very provoking, I dare say. I know I am for one. I have often to undo my work, and you can't think how it spoils anything, particularly silk, to be unpicked. And Mrs. Mason has to bear all the blame. Oh, I am sorry I said anything about it. Don't speak to your mother about it, pray, sir. Mrs. Mason thinks so much of Mrs. Bellingham's custom. Well, I won't this time recollecting that there might be some awkwardness in accounting to his mother for the means by which he had obtained his very correct information as to what passed in mrs mason's workroom but if she ever does so again i'll not answer for myself i will take care and not tell again sir said ruth in a low voice nay ruth you are not going to have secrets from me are you don't you remember your promise to consider me as a brother? Go on telling me everything that happens to you. Pray, you cannot think how much interest I take in all your interests. I can quite fancy that charming home at Millam you told me about last Sunday. I can almost fancy Mrs. Mason's workroom, and that surely is a proof either of the strength of my imagination or of your powers of description. Ruth smiled. It is indeed, sir. Our workroom must be so different to anything you ever saw. I think you must have passed through Millam often on your way to Lowford. Then don't you think it is any stretch of fancy to have so clear an idea as I have of Millam Grange on the left hand of the road, is it, Ruth? Yes, sir, just over the bridge and up the hill where the elm trees meet overhead and make a green shade and then comes the dear old Grange, that I shall never see again. Never? Nonsense, Ruthie, it is only six miles off. You may see it any day. It is not an hour's ride. Perhaps I may see it again when I am grown old. I did not think exactly what never meant. It is so very long since I was there, and I don't see any chance of my going for years and years at any rate. Why, Ruth, you— we may go next sunday afternoon if you like she looked up at him with a lovely light of pleasure in her face at the idea how sir can i walk it between afternoon service and the time mrs mason comes home i would go for only one glimpse but if i could get into the house oh sir if i could just see mamma's room again he was revolving plans in his head for giving her this pleasure and he had also his own in view if they went in any of his carriages the loitering charm of the walk would be lost and they must to a certain degree be encumbered by and exposed to the notice of servants are you a good walker ruth do you think you can manage six miles if we set off at two o'clock we shall be there by four without hurrying or say half-past four then we might stay two hours and you could show me all the old walks and old places you love and we could still come leisurely home oh it's all arranged directly but do you think it would be right sir it seems as if it would be such a great pleasure that it must in some way be wrong why you little goose what can be wrong in it in the first place i miss going to church by setting out at two said ruth a little gravely only for once surely you don't see any harm in missing church for once you will go in the morning you know i wonder if mrs mason would think it right if she would allow it no i dare say not but you don't mean to be governed by mrs mason's notions of right and wrong she thought it right to treat that poor girl palmer in the way you told me about you would think that wrong you know and so would every one of sense and feeling come ruth don't pin your faith on any one but judge for yourself the pleasure is perfectly innocent it is not a selfish pleasure either for i shall enjoy it to the full as much as you will i shall like to see the places where you spent your childhood 
I shall almost love them as much as you do. He had dropped his voice and spoke in low, persuasive tones. Ruth hung down her head and blushed with exceeding happiness, but she could not speak, even to urge her doubts afresh. Thus it was in a manner settled. How delightfully happy the plan made her through the coming week! She was too young when her mother died to have received any cautions or words of advice respecting the subject of a woman's life, if indeed wise parents ever directly speak of what in its depth and power cannot be put into words, which is a brooding spirit with no definite form or shape that men should know it, but which is there and present before we have recognized and realized its existence. Ruth was innocent and snow-pure. She had heard of falling in love, but did not know the signs and symptoms thereof, nor, indeed, had she troubled her head much about them. Sorrow had filled up her days, to the exclusion of all lighter thoughts than the consideration of present duties, and the remembrance of the happy time which had been. But the interval of blank, after the loss of her mother and during her father's life in death, had made her all the more ready to value and cling to sympathy, first from Jenny and now from Mr. Bellingham, to see her home again, and to see it with him, to show him, secure of his interest, the haunts of former times, each with its little tale of the past, of dead and gone events, no coming shadow threw its gloom over this week's dream of happiness, a dream which was too bright to be spoken about to common and indifferent ears. End of chapter 3「Four, Treading in Perilous Places」Sunday came, as brilliant as if there were no sorrow or death or guilt in the world. A day or two of rain had made the earth fresh and brave as the blue heavens above. Ruth thought it was too strong a realization of her hopes, and looked for an overclouding at noon, but the glory endured, and at two o'clock she was in the Lisos with a beating heart full of joy, longing to stop the hours which would pass too quickly through the afternoon. They sauntered through the fragrant lanes, as if their loitering would prolong the time and check the fiery-footed steeds galloping apace toward the close of the happy day. It was past five o'clock before they came to the great mill-wheel, which stood in Sabbath idleness, motionless, in a brown mass of shade, and still wet with yesterday's immersion in the deep transparent water beneath. They clambered the little hill, not yet fully shaded by the overarching elms, and then Ruth checked Mr. Bellingham by a slight motion of the hand which lay within his arm, and glanced up into his face to see what that face should express as it looked on Millam Grange now lying still and peaceful in its afternoon shadows. It was a house of afterthoughts. Building materials were plentiful in the neighbourhood, and every successive owner had found a necessity for some addition or projection, till it was a picturesque mass of irregularity, of broken light and shadow, which, as a whole, gave a full and complete idea of a home. All its gables and nooks were blended and held together by the tender green of the climbing roses and young creepers. An old couple were living in the house until it should be let, but they dwelt in the back part and never used the front door, so the little birds had grown tame and familiar, and perched upon the window sills and porch, and on the old stone cistern which caught the water from the roof. They went silently through the untrimmed garden, full of the pale-coloured flowers of spring. A spider had spread her web over the front door. 
the sight of this conveyed a sense of desolation to ruth's heart she thought it was possible the state entrance had never been used since her father's dead body had been borne forth and without speaking a word she turned abruptly away and went round the house to another door mr bellingham followed without questioning little understanding her feelings but full of admiration for the varying expression called out upon her face the old woman had not yet returned from church or from the weekly gossip or neighbourly tea which succeeded the husband sat in the kitchen spelling the psalms for the day in his prayer book and reading the words out loud a habit he had acquired from the double solitude of his life for he was deaf he did not hear the quiet entrance of the pair and they were struck with the sort of ghostly echo which seems to haunt half-furnished and uninhabited houses the verses he was reading were the following why art thou so vexed o my soul and why art thou so disquieted within me o put thy trust in god for i will yet thank him which is the help of my countenance and my god and when he had finished he shut the book and sighed with the satisfaction of having done his duty the words of holy trust though perhaps they were not fully understood carried a faithful peace down into the depths of his soul as he looked up he saw the young couple standing in the middle of the floor he pushed his iron-rimmed spectacles on to his forehead and rose to greet the daughter of his old master and ever-honoured mistress god bless thee lass god bless thee my old eyes are glad to see thee again ruth sprang forward to shake the horny hand stretched forward in the action of blessing she pressed it between both of hers as she rapidly poured out questions mr bellingham was not altogether comfortable at seeing one whom he had already begun to appropriate as his own so tenderly familiar with a hard-featured meanly dressed day labourer he sauntered to the window and looked out into the grass-grown farmyard but he could not help overhearing some of the conversation which seemed to him carried on too much in the tone of equality and who's he on asked the old labourer at last is he your sweetheart your missy's son i reckon he's a spruce young chap anyway mr bellingham's blood of all the howards rose and tingled about his ears so that he could not hear ruth's answer it began by hush thomas pray hush but how it went on he did not catch the idea of his being mrs mason's son it was really too ridiculous but like most things which are too ridiculous it made him very angry he was hardly himself again when ruth shyly came to the window recess and asked him if he would like to see the house place into which the front door entered many people thought it very pretty she said half timidly for his face had unconsciously assumed a hard and haughty expression which he could not instantly soften down he followed her however but before he left the kitchen he saw the old man standing looking at ruth's companion with a strange grave air of dissatisfaction they went along one or two zigzag damp-smelling stone passages and then entered the house-place or common sitting-room for a farmer's family in that part of the country the front door opened into it and several other apartments issued out of it such as the dairy the state bedroom which was half parlour as well and a small room which had been appropriated to the late mrs hilton where she sat or more frequently lay commanding through the open door the comings and goings of the household in those days the house place had been a cheerful room full of life with the passing to and fro of a husband child and servants with a great merry wood fire crackling and blazing away every evening and hardly let out in the very heat of summer 
for with the thick stone walls and the deep window seats and the drapery of vine leaves and ivy that room with its flag floor seemed always to want the sparkle and cheery warmth of a fire but now the green shadows from without seemed to have become black in the uninhabited desolation the oaken shovel-board the heavy dresser and the carved cupboards were now dull and damp which were formerly polished up to a brightness of a looking-glass where the fire-blaze was for ever glinting they only added to the oppressive gloom the flag floor was wet with heavy moisture ruth stood gazing into the room seeing nothing of what was present she saw a vision of former days an evening in the days of her childhood her father sitting in the master's corner near the fire sedately smoking his pipe while he dreamily watched his wife and child her mother reading to her as she sat on a little stool at her feet it was gone all gone into the land of shadows but for the moment it seemed so present in the old room that ruth believed her actual life to be the dream then still silent she went on into her mother's parlour but there the bleak look of what had once been full of peace and mother's love struck cold on her heart she uttered a cry and threw herself down by the sofa hiding her face in her hands while her frame quivered with her repressed sobs dearest ruth don't give way so it can do no good it cannot bring back the dead said mr bellingham distressed at witnessing her distress i know it cannot murmured ruth and that is why i cry i cry because nothing will ever bring them back again she sobbed afresh but more gently for his kind words soothed her and softened if they could not take away her sense of desolation come away i cannot have you stay here full of painful associations as these rooms must be come raising her with gentle violence show me your little garden you have often told me about near the window of this very room is it not see how well i remember everything you tell me he led her round through the back part of the house into the pretty old-fashioned garden there was a sunny border just under the windows and clipped box and yew trees by the grass plot farther away from the house and she prattled again of her childish adventures and solitary plays when they turned round they saw the old man who had hobbled out with the help of his stick and was looking at them with the same grave sad look of anxiety mr bellingham spoke rather sharply why does that old man follow us about in that way it is excessively impertinent of him i think oh don't call old thomas impertinent he is so good and kind he is like a father to me i remember sitting on his knee many and many a time when i was a child whilst he told me stories out of the pilgrim's progress he taught me to suck up milk through a straw mamma was very fond of him too he used to sit with us always in the evening when papa was away at market for mamma was rather afraid of having no man in the house and used to beg old thomas to stay and he would take me on his knee and listen just as attentively as i did while mamma read aloud you don't mean to say you have sat upon that old fellow's knee oh yes many and many a time mr bellingham looked graver than he had done while witnessing ruth's passionate emotion in her mother's room but he lost his sense of indignity in admiration of his companion as she wandered among the flowers seeking for favourite bushes or plants to which some history or remembrance was attached she wound in and out in natural graceful wavy lines between the luxuriant and overgrown shrubs which were fragrant with a leafy smell of spring growth she went on careless of watching eyes 
indeed unconscious, for the time, of their existence. Once she stopped to take hold of a spray of jessamine and softly kiss it. It had been her mother's favorite flower. Old Thomas was standing by the horse mount, and was also an observer of all her goings-on. But while Mr. Bellingham's feeling was that of passionate admiration mingled with a selfish kind of love, the old man gazed with tender anxiety, and his lips moved in words of blessing. "'She's a pretty creature, with a glint of her mother about her, and she's the same kind lass as ever, not a bit set up with yon fine manty-maker's shop she's in. I misdoubt that young fellow, though, for all she called him a real gentleman, and checked me when I asked if he was her sweetheart, if his are not sweetheart's looks, I've forgotten all my young days. Here, they're going, I suppose. Look, he wants her to go without a word to the old man, but she is none so changed as that, I reckon. Not Ruth, indeed. She never perceived the dissatisfied expression of Mr. Bellingham's countenance, visible to the old man's keen eye but came running up to Thomas to send her love to his wife, and to shake him many times by the hand. "'Tell Mary I'll make her such a fine gown as soon as ever I set up for myself. It shall be all in the fashion, big gigot sleeves, that she shall not know herself in them. Mind you tell her that, Thomas, will you?' "'Ay, that I will, lass, and I reckon she'll be pleased to hear thou hast not forgotten thy old merry ways.' The Lord bless thee, the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee. Ruth was halfway towards the impatient Mr. Bellingham when her old friend called her back. He longed to give her a warning of the danger that he thought she was in, and yet he did not know how. When she came up, all he could think of was to say was a text. Indeed, the language of the Bible was the language in which he thought, whenever his ideas went beyond practical, everyday life, into expressions of emotion or feeling. My dear, remember the devil goeth about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Remember that, Ruth. The words fell on her ear, but gave no definite idea. The utmost they suggested was the remembrance of the dread she felt as a child when this verse came into her mind, and how she used to imagine a lion's head with glaring eyes peering out of the bushes in a dark shady part of the wood, which, for this reason, she had always avoided, and even now could hardly think of without a shudder. She never imagined that this grim warning related to the handsome young man who awaited her with a countenance beaming with love, and tenderly drew her hand within his arm. The old man sighed as he watched them away. The Lord may help her to guide her steps aright. He may, but I'm afeard she's treading in perilous places. I'll put my missus up to going to the town and getting speech of her and telling her a bit of her danger. An old motherly woman like our Mary will set about it better, nor a stupid fellow like me. The poor old labourer prayed long and earnestly that night for Ruth. He called it wrestling for her soul, and I think that his prayers were heard, for God judgeth not as man judgeth. Ruth went on her way, all unconscious of the dark phantoms of the future that were gathering around her. Her melancholy turned with the pliancy of childish years, at sixteen not yet lost, into a softened manner which was infinitely charming. By and by she cleared up into sunny happiness. The evening was still and full of mellow light, and the newborn summer was so delicious that, in common with all young creatures, she shared its influence and was glad. They stood together at the top of a steep ascent, the hill of the hundred. At the summit there was a level space, sixty or seventy yards square, of unenclosed and broken ground, over which the golden bloom of the gorse cast a rich hue. 
while its delicious scent perfumed the fresh and nimble air on one side of this common the ground sloped down to a clear bright pond in which were mirrored the rough sand cliffs that rose abrupt on the opposite bank hundreds of martins found a home there and were now wheeling over the transparent water and dipping in their wings in their evening sport indeed all sorts of birds seemed to haunt the lonely pool the water wagtails were scattered around its margin the linnets perched on the topmost sprays of the gorse bushes and other hidden warblers sang their vespers on the uneven ground beyond on the far side of the green waste close by the road and well placed for the requirements of horses and their riders who might be weary with the ascent of the hill there was a public house which was more of a farm than an inn it was a long low building rich in dormer windows on the weather side which were necessary in such an exposed situation and with odd projections and unlooked-for gables on every side there was a deep porch in front on whose hospitable benches a dozen persons might sit and enjoy the balmy air a noble sycamore grew right before the house with seats all round it such tents the patriarchs loved and a nondescript sign hung from a branch on the side next to the road which being wisely furnished with an interpretation was found to mean king charles in the oak near this comfortable quiet unfrequented inn there was another pond for household and farmyard purposes from which the cattle were drinking before returning to the fields after they had been milked their very motions were so lazy and slow that they served to fill up the mind with the sensation of dreamy rest ruth and mr bellingham plunged through the broken ground to regain the road near the wayside inn hand in hand now pricked by the far-spreading gorse now ankle-deep in sand now pressing the soft thick heath which should make so brave an autumn show and now over wild thyme and other fragrant herbs they made their way with many a merry laugh once on the road at the summit ruth stood silent in breathless delight at the view before her the hill fell suddenly down into the plain extending for a dozen miles or more there was a clump of dark scotch firs close to them which cut clear against the western sky and threw back the nearest levels into distance the plain below them was richly wooded and was tinted by the young tender hues of the earliest summer for all the trees of the woods had donned their leaves except the cautious ash which here and there gave a soft pleasant grayness to the landscape far away in the champagne were spires and towers and stacks of chimneys belonging to some distant hidden farmhouse which were traced downwards through the golden air by the thin columns of blue smoke sent up from the evening fires the view was bounded by some rising ground in deep purple shadow against the sunset sky when first they stopped silent with sighing pleasure the air seemed full of pleasant noises distant church bells made harmonious music with the little singing birds near at hand nor were the lowings of the cattle nor the calls of the farm servants discordant for the voices seemed to be hushed by the brooding consciousness of the sabbath they stood loitering before the house quietly enjoying the view the clock in the little inn struck eight and it sounded clear and sharp in the stillness can it be so late asked ruth i should not have thought it possible answered mr bellingham but never mind you will be home long before nine stay there is a shorter road i know through the fields just wait a moment while i go in and ask the exact way he dropped ruth's arm and went into the public-house a gig 
had been slowly toiling up the sandy hill behind, unperceived by the young couple, and now it reached the tableland, and was close upon them as they separated. Ruth turned round, when the sound of the horse's footsteps came distinctly as he reached the level. She faced Mrs. Mason. They were not ten, no, not five yards apart. At the same moment they recognized each other, and what was worse, Mrs. Mason had clearly seen, with her sharp, needle-like eyes, the attitude in which Ruth had stood with the young man who had just quitted her. Ruth's hand had been lying in his arm, and fondly held there by his other hand. Mrs. Mason was careless about the circumstances of temptation into which the girls entrusted to her as apprentices were thrown, but severely intolerant if their conduct was in any degree influenced by the force of these temptations. She called this intolerance keeping up the character of her establishment. It would have been a better and more Christian thing if she had kept up the character of her girls by tender vigilance and maternal care. This evening, too, she was in an irritated state of temper. Her brother had undertaken to drive her round by Henbury in order to give her the unpleasant information of the misbehavior of her eldest son, who was an assistant in a draper's shop in a neighboring town. She was full of indignation against want of steadiness, though not willing to direct her indignation against the right object, her ne'er-do-well darling. While she was thus charged with anger, for her brother justly defended her son's master and companions from her attacks, she saw Ruth standing with a lover far away from home, at such a time in the evening, and she boiled over with intemperate displeasure. "'Come here directly, Miss Hilton,' she exclaimed sharply, then dropping her voice to low, bitter tones of concentrated wrath, she said to the trembling, guilty Ruth, "'Don't attempt to show your face at my house again after this conduct. I saw you.' and your spark, too. I'll have no slurs on the character of my apprentices. Don't say a word. I saw enough. I shall write and tell your guardian to-morrow. The horse started away, for he was impatient to be off, and Ruth was left standing there, stony, sick, and pale, as if the lightning had torn up the ground beneath her feet. She could not go on standing. She was so sick and faint. She staggered back to the broken sandbank and sank down and covered her face with her hands. My dearest Ruth, are you ill? Speak, darling, my love, my love, do speak to me. What tender words after such harsh ones! They loosened the fountain of Ruth's tears, and she cried bitterly. Oh, did you see her? Did you hear what she said? She, who, my darling, don't sob so, Ruth, tell me what it is. Who has been near you? Who has been speaking to you to make you cry so? Oh, Mrs. Mason. And there was a fresh burst of sorrow. You don't say so. Are you sure? I was not away five minutes. Oh, yes, sir, I'm quite sure. She was so angry. She said I must never show my face there again. Oh, dear, what shall I do? It seemed to the poor child as if Mrs. Mason's words were irrevocable, and that, being so, she was shut out from every house. She saw how much she had done that was deserving of blame, now when it was too late to undo it. She knew with what severity and taunts Mrs. Mason had often treated her for involuntary failings, of which she had been quite unconscious and now she had really done wrong, and shrank with terror from the consequences. Her eyes were so blinded by the fast-falling tears she did not see, nor, had she seen, would she have been able to interpret the change in Mr. Bellingham's countenance as he stood silently watching her. He was silent so long that even in her sorrow she began to wonder that he did not speak, and to wish to hear 
his soothing words once more. "'It is very unfortunate,' he began at last, and then he stopped, and then he began again. "'It is very unfortunate, for, you see, I did not like to name it to you before, but I believe I have business, in fact, which obliges me to go to town to-morrow, to London, I mean, and I don't know when I shall be able to return.' "'To London?' cried Ruth. "'Are you going away? "'Oh, Mr. Bellingham!' She wept afresh, giving herself up to the desolate feeling of sorrow which absorbed all the terror she had been experiencing at the idea of Mrs. Mason's anger. It seemed to her, at this moment, as though she could have borne everything but his departure, and she did not speak again, and after two or three minutes had elapsed, he spoke, not in his natural careless voice, but in a sort of constrained, agitated tone. "'I can hardly bear the idea of leaving you, my own Ruth, in such distress, too. For where can you go? I do not know at all. From all you have told me of Mrs. Mason, I don't think she is likely to mitigate her severity in your case.' no answer but tears quietly incessantly flowing mrs mason's displeasure seemed a distant thing his going away was the present distress he went on ruth would you go with me to london my darling i cannot leave you here without a home the thought of leaving you at all is pain enough but in these circumstances so friendless so homeless it is impossible you must come with me love and trust to me Still she did not speak. Remember how young and innocent and motherless she was. It seemed to her as if it would be happiness enough to be with him, and as for the future, he would arrange and decide for that. The future lay wrapped in a golden mist which she did not care to penetrate, but if he, her son, was out of sight and gone, the golden mist became dark heavy gloom, through which no hope could come he took her hand. "'Will you not come with me? Do you not love me enough to trust me? Oh, Ruth, reproachfully, can you not trust me?' She had stopped crying, but was sobbing sadly. "'I cannot bear this, love. Your sorrow is absolute pain to me, but it is worse to feel how indifferent you are, how little you care about our separation.' He dropped her hand, she burst into a fresh fit of crying. "'I may have to join my mother in Paris. I don't know when I shall see you again. Oh, Ruth,' said he vehemently, "'do you love me at all?' She said something in a very low voice, but he could not hear it, though he bent down his head, but he took her hand again. "'What was it you said, love? Was it not that you did love me? My darling, you do. I can tell it by the trembling of this little hand.' then you will not suffer me to go away alone and unhappy, most anxious about you. There is no other course open to you. My poor girl has no friends to receive her. I will go home directly and return in an hour with a carriage. You make me too happy by your silence, Ruth. Oh, what can I do? exclaimed Ruth. Mr. Bellingham, you should help me, and instead of that you only bewilder me. How, my dearest Ruth, bewilder you? It seems so clear to me. Look at this case fairly. Here you are, an orphan, with only one person to love you, poor old child, thrown off, for no fault of yours, by the only creature on whom you have a claim, that creature a tyrannical, inflexible woman. What is more natural, and being natural more right, than you should throw yourself upon the care of one who loves you dearly, who would go through fire and water for you, who would shelter you from all harm, unless, indeed, as I suspect, you do not care for him. If so, Ruth, if you do not care for me, we had better part. I will leave you at once. It will be better for me to go, if you do not care for me. He said this very sadly, it seemed so to Ruth at least, and made as though he would have drawn his hand from hers, but now she held it with soft force. "'Don't leave me, please, sir. It is very true I have no friend but you. Don't leave me, please. But, oh, 
to tell me what I must do. Will you do it if I tell you? If you will trust me, I will do my very best for you. I will give you my best advice. You see your position. Mrs. Mason writes and gives her own exaggerated account to your guardian. He is bound by no great love to you, from what I have heard you say, and throws you off. I, who might be able to befriend you, through my mother perhaps, I, who could at least comfort you a little, could not I, Ruth, am away, far away, for an indefinite time. That is your position at present. Now what I advise is this. Come with me into this little inn. I will order tea for you. I am sure you require it sadly. And I will leave you there, and go home for the carriage. I will return in an hour at the latest. Then we are together. Come what may. That is enough for me. Is it not for you, Ruth? Say yes. Say it ever so low, but give me the delight of hearing it, Ruth. Say yes. Low and soft, with much hesitation, came the yes, the fatal word of which she so little imagined the infinite consequences. The thought of being with him was all and everything. How you tremble, my darling! You are cold, love. Come into the house, and I'll order tea directly, and be off. She rose, and leaning on his arm, went into the house. She was shaking and dizzy with the agitation of the last hour. He spoke to the civil farmer landlord, who conducted them into a neat parlour, with windows opening into the garden at the back of the house. They had admitted much of the evening's fragrance through their open casements before they were hastily closed by the attentive host. Tea directly for this lady. The landlord vanished. Dearest Ruth, I must go. There is not an instant to be lost. Promise me to take some tea, for you are shivering all over and deadly pale with the fright that abominable woman has given you. I must go. I shall be back in half an hour, and then no more partings, darling. He kissed her pale, cold face and went away. The room whirled round before Ruth. It was a dream, a strange, varying, shifting dream, with the old home of her childhood for one scene, with the terror of Mrs. Mason's unexpected appearance for another, and then, strangest, dizziest, happiest of all, there was the consciousness of his love, who was all the world to her, and the remembrance of the tender words which still kept up their low, soft echo in her heart. Her head ached so much that she could hardly see. Even the dusky twilight was a dazzling glare to her poor eyes, and when the daughter of the house brought in the sharp light of the candles preparatory for tea, Ruth hid her face in the sofa pillows with a low exclamation of pain. "'Does your head ache, miss?' asked the girl in a gentle, sympathizing voice. "'Let me make you some tea, miss. It will do you good. Many's the time poor mother's headaches were cured by good strong tea.' Ruth murmured acquiescence. The young girl, about Ruth's own age, but who was the mistress of the little establishment owing to her mother's death, made tea, and brought Ruth a cup to the sofa where she lay. Ruth was feverish and thirsty, and eagerly drank it off, although she could not touch the bread and butter which the girl offered her. She felt better and fresher, though she was still faint and weak. "'Thank you,' said Ruth. "'Don't let me keep you. Perhaps you are busy. You have been very kind, and the tea has done me a great deal of good.' The girl left the room. Ruth became as hot as she had previously been cold, and went and opened the window, and leant out into the still, sweet evening air. The bush of sweet briar underneath the window scented the place, and the delicious fragrance reminded her of her old home. I think scents affect and quicken the memory more than either sights or sound, for Ruth had instantly before her eyes the little garden beneath the window of her mother's room, with the old man leaning on his stick watching her, just as he had done not three hours before on that very afternoon. "'Dear old Thomas, he and Mary would take me in, I think. They would love me all the more if—' 
if I were cast off, and Mr. Bellingham would perhaps not be so very long away, and he would know where to find me mm. if I stayed at Millam Grange. Oh, would it not be better to go to them? I wonder if he would be very sorry. I could not bear to make him so sorry, so kind as he has been to me, but I do believe it would be better to go to them and ask their advice at any rate. He would follow me there, and I could talk over what I better do with the three best friends I have in the world, the only friends I have. She put on her bonnet and opened the parlour door, but then she saw the square figure of the landlord standing at the open house door, smoking his evening pipe and looming large and distinct against the dark air and landscape beyond. Ruth remembered the cup of tea she had drunk. It must be paid for, and she had no money with her. She feared that he would not let her quit the house without paying. She thought that she would leave a note for Mr. Bellingham, saying where she was gone and how she had left the house in debt. For, like a child, all dilemmas appeared of equal magnitude to her, and the difficulty of passing the landlord while he stood there, and of giving him an explanation of the circumstances, as far as such explanation was due to him, appeared insuperable and as awkward and fraught with inconvenience as far more serious situations. She kept peeping out of her room after she had written her little pencil note to see if the outer door was still obstructed. There he stood, motionless, enjoying his pipe, and looking out into the darkness which gathered thick with the coming night. The fumes of the tobacco were carried by the air into the house and brought back Ruth's sick headache. Her energy left her. She became stupid and languid and incapable of spirited exertion. She modified her plan of action to the determination of asking Mr. Bellingham to take her to Millam Grange, to the care of her humble friends, instead of London. And she thought, in her simplicity, that he would instantly consent when he had heard her reasons. She started up, a carriage dashed up to the door. She hushed her beating heart mm -hmm. and tried to stop her throbbing head to listen. She heard him speaking to the landlord, though she could not distinguish what he said. She heard the jingling of money, and in another moment he was in the room and had taken her arm to lead her to the carriage. "'Oh, sir, I want you to t take me to Millam Grange,' said she, holding back. "'Old Thomas would give me a home.' oh dearest we'll talk of all that in the carriage i am sure you will listen to reason nay if you will go to millam you must go in the carriage said he hurriedly she was little accustomed to oppose the wishes of any one obedient and docile by nature and unsuspicious and innocent of any harmful consequences she entered the carriage and drove towards london End of chapter 4。Chapter 5 in North Wales。The June of 18 year left blank had been glorious and sunny and full of flowers, but July came in with pouring rain and it was a gloomy time for travellers and for weather-bound tourists, who lounged away the days in touching up sketches, dressing flies, and reading over again for the twentieth time the few volumes they had brought with them. A number of the times, five days old, had been in constant demand in all the sitting-rooms of a certain inn in a little mountain village of North Wales, through a long July morning. The valleys around were filled with thick, cold mist, which had crept up the hillsides till the hamlet itself was folded in its white, dense curtain, and from the inn windows nothing was seen of the beautiful scenery around. The tourists who thronged the rooms might as well have been with their dear little bairnies at home and so some of them seemed to think, as they stood with their faces flattened against the window-panes, 
looking abroad in search of event to fill up the dreary time. How many dinners were hastened that day by way of getting through the morning? Let the poor Welsh kitchen-maid say. The very village children kept indoors, or, if one or two more adventurous stole out into the land of temptation and puddles, they were soon clutched back by angry and busy mothers. It was only four o'clock, but most of the inmates of the inn thought it must be between six and seven. The morning had seemed so long, so many hours had passed since dinner, when a Welsh car, drawn by two horses, rattled briskly up to the door. Every window of the ark was crowded with faces at the sound. The leathern curtains were undrawn to their curious eyes, and out sprang a gentleman, who carefully assisted a well-cloaked-up lady into the little inn, despite the landlady's assurances of not having a room to spare. The gentleman, it was Mr. Bellingham, paid no attention to the speeches of the hostess, but quietly superintended the unpacking of the carriage, and paid the postillion. Then, turning round with his face to the light, he spoke to the landlady, whose voice had been rising during the last five minutes. "'Nay, Jenny, you're strangely altered, if you can turn out an old friend on such an evening as this. If I remember right, Pentre Volus is twenty miles across the bleakest mountain road I ever saw. Indeed, sir, and I did not know you, Mr. Bellingham, I believe. Indeed, sir, Pentre Volus is not above eighteen miles. We only charge for eighteen. It may not be much above seventeen, and we're quite full. Indeed, more's the pity." "'Well, but, Jenny, to oblige me, an old friend, you can find lodgings out for some of your people, that house across the street, for instance.' "'Indeed, sir, and it's at liberty. Perhaps you would not mind lodging there yourself. I could get you the best rooms, and send over a trifle or so of furniture, if they weren't as you'd wish them to be.' "'No, Jenny, here I stay. You'll not induce me to venture over into these rooms, whose dirt I know of old.' Can't you persuade someone who is not an old friend to move across? Say, if you like, that I had written beforehand to bespeak the rooms. Oh, I know you can manage it. I know your good-natured ways. Indeed, sir, well, I'll see. If you and the lady will just step into the back parlour, sir, there's no one there just now. The lady is keeping her bed to-day for a cold, and the gentleman is having a rubber at whist in number three. I'll see what I can do. "'Thank you, thank you. Is there a fire? If not, one must be lighted. Come, Ruthie, come.' He led the way into a large, bow-windowed room, which looked gloomy enough that afternoon, but which I have seen bright and buoyant with youth and hope within, and sunny lights creeping down the purple mountain slope, and stealing over the green soft meadows, till they reached the little garden, full of roses and lavender bushes, lying close under the window. I have seen, but I shall see no more. "'I did not know you had been here before,' said Ruth, as Mr. Bellingham helped her off with her cloak. "'Oh, yes, three years ago I was here on a reading party. We were here above two months, attracted by Jenny's kind heart and oddities, but driven away finally by the insufferable dirt. However, for a week or two it won't much signify.' "'But can she take us in? I thought her saying her house was full.' "'Oh, yes, I dare say it is, but I shall pay her well. She can easily make excuses to some poor devil and send him over to the other side for a day or two, so that we have shelter. It does not much signify.' "'Could not we go to the house on the other side? And have our meals carried across to us in a half-warm state, to say nothing of having no one to scold for bad cooking?' "'You don't know these out-of-the-way Welsh inns yet, Ruthie.' "'No, I only thought it seemed rather unfair,' said Ruth gently. But she did not end her sentence, for Mr. Bellingham formed his lips into a whistle and walked to the window to survey the rain. The remembrance of his former good payment 
prompted many little lies of which mrs morgan was guilty that afternoon before she succeeded in turning out a gentleman and lady who were only planning to remain till the ensuing saturday at the outside so if they did not fulfil their threat and leave on the next day she would be no very great loser these household arrangements complete she solaced herself with tea in her own little parlour and shrewdly reviewed the circumstances of mr bellingham's arrival indeed and she's not his wife thought jenny that's clear as day his wife would have brought her maid and given herself twice as many airs about the sitting-rooms while this poor miss never spoke but kept as still as a mouse indeed and young men will be young men and as long as their fathers and mothers shut their eyes it's none of my business to go about asking questions in this manner they settled down to a week's enjoyment of that alpine country it was most true enjoyment to ruth it was opening a new sense vast ideas of beauty and grandeur filled her mind at the sight of the mountains now first beheld in full majesty she was almost overpowered by the vague and solemn delight but by and by her love for them equalled her awe and in the night-time she would softly rise and steal to the window to see the white moonlight which gave a new aspect to the everlasting hills that girdled the mountain village their breakfast hour was late in accordance with mr bellingham's tastes and habits but ruth was up betimes and out and away brushing the dewdrops from the short crisp grass the lark sung high above her head and she knew not if she moved or stood still for the grandeur of this beautiful earth absorbed all idea of separate and individual existence even rain was a pleasure to her she sat in the window seat of their parlour she would have gone out gladly but that such a proceeding annoyed mr bellingham who usually at such times lounged away the listless hours on a sofa and relieved himself by abusing the weather she saw the swift fleeting showers come athwart the sunlight like a rush of silver arrows and she watched the purple darkness on the heathery mountain side and then the pale golden gleam which succeeded there was no change or alteration of nature that had not its own peculiar beauty in the eyes of ruth but if she had complained of the changeable climate she would have pleased mr bellingham more her admiration and her content made him angry until her pretty motions and loving eyes soothed down his impatience really ruth he exclaimed one day when they had been imprisoned by rain a whole morning one would think you had never seen a shower of rain before it quite wearies me to see you sitting there watching this detestable weather with such a placid countenance and for the last two hours you have said nothing more amusing or interesting than oh how beautiful or there's another cloud coming across mole win ruth left her seat very gently and took up her work she wished she had the gift of being amusing it must be dull for a man accustomed to all kinds of active employments to be shut up in the house she was recalled from her absolute self-forgetfulness what could she say to interest mr bellingham while she thought he spoke again i remember when we were reading here three years ago we had a week of just such weather as this but howard and johnson were capital whist players and wilbraham not bad so he got through the days famously can you play a cart ruth or piquet no sir i have sometimes played at beggar my neighbour answered ruth humbly regretting her own deficiencies he murmured impatiently and then there was silence for another half hour then he sprang up and rang the bell violently ask mrs morgan for a pack of cards ruthie i'll teach you a cart said he but ruth was stupid not so good as a dummy he said and it was no fun betting against himself so the cards were flung across the table on the floor anywhere ruth picked them up 
as she rose she sighed a little with the depression of spirits consequent upon her own want of power to amuse and occupy him she loved you're pale love said he half repenting of his anger at her blunders over the cards go out before dinner you know you don't mind this cursed weather and see that you come home full of adventure to relate come little blockhead give me a kiss and be gone she left the room with a feeling of relief for if he were dull without her she should not feel responsible and unhappy at her own stupidity the open air that kind of soothing balm which gentle mother nature offers to us all in our seasons of depression relieved her the rain had ceased though every leaf and blade was loaded with trembling glittering drops ruth went down to the circular dale into which the brown foaming mountain river fell and made a deep pool and after resting there for a while ran on between broken rocks down to the valley below the waterfall was magnificent as she had anticipated she longed to extend her walk to the other side of the street so she sought the stepping stones the usual crossing place which were overshadowed by trees a few yards from the pool the waters ran high and rapidly as busy as life between the pieces of grey rock but ruth had no fear and went lightly and steadily on about the middle however there was a great gap either one of the stones was so covered with water as to be invisible or it had been washed lower down at any rate the spring from stone to stone was long and ruth hesitated for a moment before taking it the sound of rushing waters was in her ears to the exclusion of every other noise her eyes were on the current running swiftly below her feet and thus she was startled to see a figure close before her on one of the stones and to hear a voice offering help she looked up and saw a man who was apparently long past middle life and of the stature of a dwarf a second glance accounted for the low height of the speaker for then she saw he was deformed as the consciousness of this infirmity came into her mind it must have told itself in her softened eyes for a faint flush of colour came into the pale face of the deformed gentleman as he repeated his words the water is very rapid will you take my hand perhaps i can help you ruth accepted the offer and with this assistance she was across in a moment he made way for her to precede him in the narrow wood path and then he silently followed her up the glen when they had passed out of the wood into the pasture land beyond ruth once more turned to mark him she was struck afresh with the mild beauty of the face though there was something in the countenance which told of the body's deformity something more and beyond the pallor of habitual ill health something of a quick spiritual light in the deep-set eyes a sensibility about the mouth but altogether though a peculiar it was a most attractive face will you allow me to accompany you if you are going around by cum do as i imagine you are the handrail is blown away from the little wooden bridge by the storm last night and the rush of waters below may make you dizzy and it is really dangerous to fall there the stream is so deep they walked on without much speech she wondered who her companion might be she should have known him if she had seen him among the strangers at the inn and yet he spoke english too well to be a welshman he knew the country and the path so perfectly he must be a resident so she tossed him from england to wales and back again in her imagination i only came here yesterday said he as a widening in the path permitted them to walk abreast last night i went to the higher waterfalls they are most splendid did you go out in all that rain asked ruth timidly oh yes rain never hinders me from walking indeed it gives a new beauty to such a country as this besides my time for my excursion is so short i cannot afford to waste a day 
"'Then you do not live here?' asked Ruth. "'No, my home is in a very different place. I live in a busy town, where at times it is difficult to feel the truth that there are in this loud, stunning tide of human care and crime, with whom the melodies abide of the everlasting chime, who carry music in their heart through dusky lane and crowded mart, plying their task with busier feet, because their secret souls a holy strain repeat. I have an annual holiday, which I generally spend in Wales, and often in this immediate neighbourhood. I do not wonder at your choice, replied Ruth. It is a beautiful country. It is indeed, and I have been inoculated by an old innkeeper at Conway with a love for its people and history and traditions. I have picked up enough of the language to understand many of their legends, and some are very fine and awe-inspiring, others very poetic and fanciful. Ruth was too shy to keep up the conversation by any remark of her own, although his gentle, pensive manner was very winning. "'For instance,' said he, touching a long, bud-laden stem of flux glove in the hedge-aid, at the bottom of which one or two crimson-specked flowers were bursting from their green sheaths. I dare say you don't know what makes this foxglove bend and sway so gracefully. You think it is blown by the wind, don't you? He looked at her with a grave smile, which did not enliven his thoughtful eyes, but gave an inexpressible sweetness to his face. I always thought it was the wind. What is it? asked Ruth innocently. Oh, the Welsh tell you that this flower is sacred to the fairies and that it has the power of recognizing them and all spiritual beings who pass by, and that it bows in deference to them as they waft along. Its Welsh name is Manig Elilin, the good people's glove, and hence, I imagine, our fox's glove or fox glove. It is a very pretty fancy, said Ruth, much interested, and wishing that he would go on, without expecting her to reply. But they were already at the wooden bridge. He led her across, and then, bowing his adieu, he had taken a different path even before Ruth had thanked him for his attention. It was an adventure to tell Mr. Bellingham, however, and it aroused and amused him till dinner-time came after which he sauntered forth with a cigar. "'Ruth,' said he when he returned, "'I've seen your little hunchback. He looks like Ricket with the tuft. He's not a gentleman, though. If it had not been for his deformity, I should not have made him out from your description. You called him a gentleman.' "'And don't you?' asked Ruth, surprised. "'Oh, no, he's regularly shabby and seedy in his appearance. Lodging, too, the ostler told me, over that horrible candle and cheese shop, the smell of which is insufferable twenty yards off. No gentleman could endure it. He must be a traveller or artist or something of that kind. Did you see his face? asked Ruth. No, but a man's back, his tout ensemble, has character enough in it to decide his rank. His face was very singular, quite beautiful, said she softly. But the subject did not interest Mr. Bellingham, and he let it drop. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 – Troubles Gather About Ruth The next day the weather was brave and glorious, a perfect bridal of the earth and sky and every one turned out of the inn to enjoy the fresh beauty of nature. Ruth was quite unconscious of being the object of remark, and in her light, rapid passings to and fro, had never looked at the doors and windows, where many watchers stood observing her and commenting upon her situation or her appearance. "'She's a very lovely creature,' said one gentleman, rising from the breakfast-table to catch a glimpse of her as she entered from her morning's ramble. 
not above sixteen i should think very modest and innocent looking in her white gown his wife busy administering to the wants of a fine little boy could only say without seeing the young girl's modest ways and gentle downcast countenance well i do think it's a shame such people should be allowed to come here to think of such wickedness under the same roof do come away my dear and don't flatter her by such notice the husband returned to the breakfast-table he smelt the broiled ham and eggs and he heard his wife's commands whether smelling or hearing had most to do in causing his obedience i cannot tell perhaps you can now harry go and see if nurse and baby are ready to go out with you you must lose no time this beautiful morning ruth found mr bellingham was not yet come down so she sallied out for an additional half-hour's ramble flitting about through the village trying to catch all the beautiful sunny peeps at the scenery between the cold stone houses which threw the radiant distance into aerial perspective far away she passed by the little shop and just issuing from it came the nurse and baby and little boy the baby sat in placid dignity in her nurse's arms with the face of queenly calm her fresh soft peachy complexion was really tempting and ruth who was always fond of children went up to coo and to smile at the little thing and after some peep-boing she was about to snatch a kiss when harry whose face had been reddening ever since the play began lifted up his sturdy little right arm and hit ruth a great blow on the face oh for shame sir said the nurse snatching back his hand how dare you do that to the lady who is so kind as to speak to sissy she's not a lady said he indignantly she's a bad naughty girl mamma said so she did and she shan't kiss our baby the nurse reddened in her turn she knew what he must have heard but it was awkward to bring it out standing face to face with the elegant young lady children pick up such notions ma'am said she at last apologetically to ruth who stood white and still with a new idea running through her mind it's no notion it's true nurse and i heard you say it yourself go away naughty woman said the boy in infantile vehemence of passion to ruth to the nurse's infinite relief ruth turned away humbly and meekly with bent head and slow uncertain steps but as she turned she saw the mild sad face of the deformed gentleman who was sitting at the open window above the shop he looked sadder and graver than ever and his eyes met her glance with an expression of deep sorrow and so condemned alike by youth and age she stole with timid step into the house mr bellingham was awaiting her in the sitting-room the glorious day restored all his buoyancy of spirits he talked gaily away without pausing for a reply while ruth made tea and tried to calm her heart which was yet beating with the agitation of the new ideas she had received from the occurrence of the morning luckily for her the only answer required for some time were monosyllables but those few words were uttered in so depressed and mournful a tone that at last they struck mr bellingham with surprise and displeasure as the condition of mind they unconsciously implied did not harmonize with his own ruth what is the matter this morning you really are very provoking yesterday when everything was gloomy and you might have been aware that i was out of spirits i heard nothing but expressions of delight to-day when every creature under heaven is rejoicing you look most deplorable and woebegone you really should learn to have a little sympathy the tears fell quickly down ruth's cheeks but she did not speak she could not put into words the sense she was just beginning to entertain of the estimation in which she was henceforward to be held she thought he would be as much grieved as she was at what had taken place that morning she fancied she should sink in his opinion if she told him how others regarded her 
besides it seemed ungenerous to dilate upon the suffering of which he was the cause i will not she thought embitter his life i will try and be cheerful i must not think of myself so much if i can but make him happy what need i care for chance speeches accordingly she made every effort possible to be as light-hearted as he was but somehow the moment she relaxed thoughts would intrude and wonders would force themselves upon her mind so that altogether she was not the gay and bewitching companion mr bellingham had previously found her they sauntered out for a walk the path they chose led to a wood on the side of a hill and they entered glad of the shade of the trees at first it appeared like any common grove but they soon came to a deep descent on the summit of which they stood looking down on the tree-tops which were softly waving far beneath their feet there was a path leading sharp down and they followed it the ledge of rock made it almost like going down steps and their walk grew into a bounding and their bounding into a run before they reached the lowest plain a green gloom reigned there and it was the still hour of noon the little birds were quiet in some leafy shade they went on a few yards and then they came to a circular pool overshadowed by the trees whose highest boughs had been beneath their feet a few minutes before the pond was hardly below the surface of the ground and there was nothing like a bank on any side a heron was standing there motionless but when he saw them he flapped his wings and slowly rose and soared above the green heights of the wood up into the very sky itself for at that depth the trees appeared to touch the round white clouds which brooded over the earth the speedwell grew in the shallowest water of the pool and all around its margin but the flowers were hardly seen at first so deep was the green shadow cast by the trees in the very middle of the pond the sky was mirrored clear and dark a blue which looked as if a black void lay behind oh there are water lilies said ruth her eye catching on the farther side i must go and get some no i will get them for you the ground is spongy all round there sit still ruth this heap of grass will make a capital seat he went round and she waited quietly for his return when he came back he took off her bonnet without speaking and began to place his flowers in her hair she was quite still while he arranged her coronet looking up in his face with loving eyes with a peaceful composure she knew that he was pleased from his manner which had the joyousness of a child playing with a new toy and she did not think twice of his occupation it was pleasant to forget everything except his pleasure when he had decked her out he said there ruth now you'll do come and look at yourself in the pond here where there are no weeds come she obeyed and could not help seeing her own loveliness it gave her a sense of satisfaction for an instant as the sight of any other beautiful object would have done but she never thought of associating it with herself she knew that she was beautiful but that seemed abstract and removed from herself her existence was in feeling and thinking and loving down in that green hollow they were quite in harmony her beauty was all that mr bellingham cared for and it was supreme it was all he recognized of her and he was proud of it she stood in her white dress against the trees which grew around her face was flushed into a brilliancy of colour which resembled that of a rose in june the great heavy white flowers drooped on either side of her beautiful head and if her brown hair was a little disordered the very disorder only seemed to add a grace she pleased him more by looking so lovely than by all her tender endeavours to fall in with his varying humour but when they left the wood and ruth had taken out her flowers 
and resumed her bonnet as they came near the inn, the simple thought of giving him pleasure was not enough to secure Ruth's peace. She came pensive and sad, and could not rally into gaiety. "'Really, Ruth,' said he that evening, "'you must not encourage yourself in this habit of falling into melancholy reveries without any cause. You have been sighing twenty times during the last half-hour. Do be a little cheerful. Remember, I have no companion but you in this out-of-the-way place.' "'I am very sorry,' said Ruth, her eyes filling with tears. And then she remembered that it was very dull for him to be alone with her, heavy-hearted as she had been all day. She said in a sweet, penitent tone, "'Would you be so kind as to teach me one of those games at cards you were speaking about yesterday? I would do my best to learn.' Her soft, murmuring voice won its way. They rang for the cards, and he soon forgot that there was such a thing as depression or gloom in the world. In the pleasure of teaching such a beautiful ignoramus the mysteries of card-playing. There, said he at last, that's enough for one lesson. Do you know, little goose, your blunders have made me laugh myself into one of the worst headaches I have had for years. He threw himself on the sofa, and in an instant she was by his side. Let me put my cool hands on your forehead, she begged. That used to do mamma good. He lay still, his face away from the light and not speaking. Presently he fell asleep. Ruth put out the candles and sat patiently by him for a long time, fancying he would awaken refreshed. The room grew cold in the night air, but Ruth dared not rouse him from what appeared to be a sound restoring slumber. She covered him with her shawl, which she had thrown over a chair on coming in from their twilight ramble. She had ample time to think, but she tried to banish thought. At last his breathing became quick and oppressed, and after listening to it for some minutes, with increasing affright, Ruth ventured to awaken him. He seemed stupefied and shivery. Ruth became more and more terrified. All the household were asleep except one servant girl, who was wearied out of what little English she had knowledge of in more waking hours and could only answer, "'Is, indeed, ma'am,' to any question put to her by Ruth. She sat by the bedside all night long. He moaned and tossed, but never spoke sensibly. It was a new form of illness to the miserable Ruth. Her yesterday's suffering went into the black distance of long past years. The present was all in all. When she heard people stirring, she went in search of Mrs. Morgan, whose shrewd, sharp manners, unsoftened by inward respect for the poor girl, had awed Ruth even when Mr. Bellingham was by to protect her. "'Mrs. Morgan,' she said, sitting down in the little parlour appropriated to the landlady, for she felt her strength suddenly desert her. "'Mrs. Morgan, I'm afraid Mr. Bellingham is very ill.' Here she burst into tears, but instantly checking herself. "'Oh, what must I do?' continued she. "'I don't think he has known anything all through the night, and he looks so strange and wild this morning.' She gazed into Mrs. Morgan's face, as if reading an oracle. "'Indeed, Miss, ma'am, and it's a very awkward thing, but don't cry. That can do no good. Deed it can't. I'll go and see the poor young man myself, and then I can judge if a doctor is wanting.' Ruth followed Mrs. Morgan upstairs. When they entered the sick-room, Mr. Bellingham was sitting up in bed, looking wildly about him, and as he saw them he exclaimed, "'Ruth, Ruth, come here. I won't be left alone.' And then he fell down exhausted on the pillow. Mrs. Morgan went up and spoke to him, but he did not answer or take any notice. "'I'll send for Mr. Jones, my dear, deed, and I will. We'll have him here in a couple of hours, please God.' "'Oh, can't he come sooner?' asked Ruth, wild with terror. "'Deed, no. He lives at Langlass when he's home, and that's seven mile away, and he may be gone around eight or nine mile on the other side Langlass.' but I'll send a boy on the pony directly. Saying this, Mrs. Morgan left Ruth alone. There was nothing to be done, for Mr. Bellingham had fallen into heavy sleep. 
sounds of daily life began bells rang breakfast services clattering up and down the passages and ruth sat on shivering by the bedside in that darkened room mrs morgan sent her breakfast upstairs by a chambermaid but ruth motioned it away in her sick agony and the girl had no right to urge her to partake of it that alone broke the monotony of the long morning she heard the sound of merry parties setting out on excursions on horseback or in carriages and once stiff and wearied she stole to the window and looked out on one side of the blind but the day looked bright and discordant to her aching anxious heart the gloom of the darkened room was better and more befitting it was some hours after he was summoned before the doctor made his appearance he questioned his patient and receiving no coherent answer he asked ruth concerning the symptoms but when she questioned him in turn he only shook his head and looked grave he made a sign to mrs morgan to follow him out of the room and they went down to her parlour leaving ruth in a depth of despair lower than she could have thought it possible there remained for her to experience an hour before i'm afraid this is a bad case said mr jones to mrs morgan in welsh a brain fever has evidently set in poor young gentleman poor young man he looked the very picture of health that very appearance of robustness will in all probability make his disorder more violent however we must hope for the best mrs morgan who is to attend upon him he will require careful nursing is that young lady his sister she looks too young to be his wife no indeed gentlemen like you must know mr jones that we can't always look too closely into the ways of young men who come into our houses not but what i am sorry for her for she's an innocent inoffensive young creature i always think it right for my own morals to put a little scorn into my manners when such as her come to stay here but indeed she's so gentle i found it hard work to show the proper contempt she would have gone on to her inattentive listener if she had not heard a low tap at the door which recalled her from her morality and mr jones from his consideration of the necessary prescriptions come in said mrs morgan sharply and ruth came in she was white and trembling but she stood in that dignity which strong feeling kept down by self-command always imparts i wish you sir to be so kind as to tell me clearly and distinctly what i must do for mr bellingham every direction you give me shall be most carefully attended to you spoke about leeches i can put them on and see about them tell me everything sir that you wish to have done her manner was calm and serious and her countenance and deportment showed that the occasion was calling out strength sufficient to meet it mr jones spoke with a deference which he had not thought of using upstairs even while he supposed her to be the sister of the invalid ruth listened gravely she repeated some of the injunctions in order that she might be sure that she fully comprehended them and then bowing left the room she is no common person said mr jones still she is too young to have the responsibility of such a serious case have you any idea where his friends live mrs morgan indeed and i have his mother as haughty a lady as you would wish to see came travelling through wales last year she stopped here and i warrant you nothing was good enough for her she was real quality she left some clothes and books behind her for the maid was almost as fine as the mistress and little thought of seeing after her lady's clothes having a taste for going scenery along with her, the man-servant and we had several letters from her i have them locked in the drawers in the bar where i keep such things well i should recommend your writing to the lady and telling her her son's state it would be a favour mr jones if you would just write it yourself english writing comes so strange to my pen the letter was written and in order to save time mr jones took it to the langless post office end of chapter six
Chapter Seven: The Crisis, Watching and Waiting. Ruth put away every thought of the past or future, everything that could unfit her for the duties of the present. Exceeding love supplied the place of experience. She never left the room after the first day. She forced herself to eat because his service needed her strength. She did not indulge in any tears because the weeping she longed for would make her less able to attend upon him. She watched and waited and prayed, prayed with an utter forgetfulness of self only with a consciousness that God was all-powerful, and that he whom she loved so much needed the aid of the Mighty One. Day and night, the summer night, seemed merged into one. She lost count of time in the hushed and darkened room. One morning Mrs. Morgan beckoned her out, and she stole on tiptoe into the dazzling gallery, on one side of which the bedrooms opened. "'She's come,' whispered Mrs. Morgan, looking very much excited, and forgetting that Ruth had never heard that Mrs. Bellingham had been summoned. "'Who is come?' asked Ruth. The idea of Mrs. Mason flashed through her mind, but with a more terrible, because a more vague, dread, she heard it was his mother. The mother of whom he had always spoken as a person whose opinion was to be regarded more than that of any other individual. "'What must I do? Will she be angry with me?' said she, relapsing into her childlike dependence on others, and feeling that even Mrs. Morgan was someone to stand between her and Mrs. Bellingham. Mrs. Morgan herself was a little perplexed, her morality was rather shocked at the idea of a proper real lady like Mrs. Bellingham discovering that she had winked at the connection between her son and Ruth. She was quite inclined to encourage Ruth in her inclination to shrink out of Mrs. Bellingham's observation, an inclination which arose from no definite consciousness of having done wrong but principally from the representations she had always heard of the lady's awfulness. Mrs. Bellingham swept into her son's room as if she were unconscious what poor young creature had lately haunted it, while Ruth hurried into some unoccupied bedroom, and, alone there, she felt her self-restraint suddenly give way, and burst into the saddest, most utterly wretched weeping she had ever known. She was worn out with watching and exhausted by passionate crying, and she lay down on the bed and fell asleep. The day passed on. She slumbered unnoticed and unregarded. She awoke late in the evening with a sense of having done wrong in sleeping so long. The strain upon her responsibility had not yet left her. Twilight was closing fast around. She waited until it had become night, and then she stole down to Mrs. Morgan's parlour. "'If you please, may I come in?' asked she. Jenny Morgan was doing up the hieroglyphics which she called her accounts. She answered sharp enough, but it was a permission to enter, and Ruth was thankful for it. "'Will you tell me how he is? Do you think I may go back to him?' No, indeed, that you may not. Nest, who has made his room tidy these many days, is not fit to go in now. Mrs. Bellingham has brought her own maid, and the family nurse, and Mr. Bellingham's man, such a tribe of servants, and no end to packages, water-beds coming but by the carrier, and a doctor from London coming down to-morrow, as if feather-beds and Mr. Jones was not good enough." why she won't let a soul of us into the room there's no chance for you ruth sighed how is he she inquired after a pause how can i tell indeed when i am not allowed to go near him mr jones said to-night was a turning point but i doubt it for it is four days since he was taken ill and who ever heard of a sick person taking a turn on an even number of days it is always on the third or the fifth or the seventh and so on he'll not turn till to-morrow night take my word for it 
and their fine London doctor will get all the credit, and honest Mr. Jones will be thrown aside. I don't think he will get better myself, though Gelert does not howl for nothing. My patience, what's the matter with the girl? Lord, child, you're never going to faint. And be ill on my hands. Her sharp voice recalled Ruth from the sick unconsciousness that had been creeping over her as she listened to the latter part of this speech. She sat down and could not speak. The room whirled round and round. Her white feebleness touched Mrs. Morgan's heart. "'You've had tea, I guess. Indeed, and the girls are very careless.' She rang the bell with energy and seconded her her pull by going to the door and shouting out sharp directions in Welsh to Nest and Gwen and the three or four other rough, kind, slatternly servants. They brought her tea, which was comfortable according to the idea of comfort prevalent in that rude, hospitable place. There was plenty to eat, too much, indeed, for it revolted the appetite it was intended to provoke but the hardiness with which the kind rosy waiter pressed her to eat, and the scolding Mrs. Morgan gave her when she found the buttered toast untouched, toast on which she herself had desired that the butter might not be spared, did Ruth more good than the tea. She began to hope, and to long for the morning when hope might have become certainty. It was all in vain that she was told that the room she had been in all day was at her service. She did not say a word, but she was not going to bed that night of all nights in the year when life or death hung trembling in the balance. She went into the bedroom till the bustling house was still, and heard busy feet passing to and fro into the room she might not enter, and voices imperious, though hushed down to a whisper, ask for innumerable things. Then there was silence, and when she thought that all were dead asleep except the watchers, she stole out into the gallery. On the other side were two windows, cut into the thick stone wall, and flower-pots were placed on the shelves thus formed, where great untrimmed straggling geraniums grew and strove to reach the light. The window near Mr. Bellingham's door was open. The soft, warm-scented night air came sighing in in faint gusts, and then was still. It was summer. There was no black darkness in the twenty-four hours. Only the light grew dusky, and color disappeared from objects, of which the shape and form remained distinct. A soft, gray oblong of barred light fell on the flat wall opposite to the windows, and deeper gray shadows marked out the tracery of the plants, more graceful thus than in reality. Ruth crouched where no light fell. She sat on the ground close by the door. Her whole existence was absorbed in listening. All was still. It was only her heart beating with the strong, heavy, regular sound of a hammer. She wished she could stop its rushing, incessant clang. She heard a rustle of a silken gown, and knew it ought not to have been worn in a sick room, for her senses seemed to have passed into the keeping of the invalid, and to feel only as he felt. The noise was probably occasioned by some change of posture in the watcher inside, for it was once more dead still. The soft wind outside sank with a low, long, distant moan among the windings of the hills, and lost itself there, and came no more again. But Ruth's heart beat loud. She rose with as little noise as if she were a vision, and crept to the open window to try and lose the nervous listening for the ever-recurring sound. Out beyond, under the calm sky, veiled with a mist rather than with a cloud, rose the high, dark outlines of the mountains, shutting in that village as if it lay in a nest. They stood, like giants, solemnly watching for the end of earth and time. Here and there a black round shadow reminded Ruth of some cum or hollow 
where she and her lover had rambled in sun and in gladness she then thought the land enchanted into everlasting brightness and happiness she fancied then that into a region as lovely no bale or woe could enter but would be charmed away and disappear before the sight of the glorious guardian mountains now she knew the truth that earth has no barrier which avails against agony it comes lightning-like down from heaven and into the mountain house and into the town garret and into the palace and into the cottage the garden lay close under the house a bright spot enough by day for in that soil whatever was planted grew and blossomed in spite of neglect the white roses glimmered out in the dusk all the night through the red were lost in shadow between the low boundary of the garden and the hills swept one or two green meadows ruth looked into the grey darkness till she traced each separate wave of outline then she heard a little restless bird chirp out its wakefulness from a nest in the ivy round the walls of the house but the mother bird spread her soft feathers and hushed it into silence presently however many little birds began to scent the coming dawn and rustled among the leaves and chirruped loud and clear just above the horizon too the mist became a silvery gray cloud hanging on the edge of the world presently it turned shimmering white and then in an instant in it flushed into rose and the mountain top sprang into heaven and bathed in the presence of the shadow of god with a bound the sun of a molten fiery red came over above the horizon and immediately thousands of little birds sang out for joy and a soft chorus of mysterious glad murmurs came forth from the earth the low whispering wind left its hiding-place among the clefts and hollows of the hills and wandered among the rustling herbs and trees waking the flower-buds to the life of another day ruth gave a sigh of relief that the night was over and gone for she knew that soon suspense would be ended and the verdict known whether for life or for death she grew faint and sick with anxiety it almost seemed as if she must go into the room and learn the truth then she heard movements but they were not sh sharp nor rapid as if prompted by any emergency then again it was still she sat curled up upon the floor with her head thrown back against the wall and her hands clasped round her knees she had yet to wait meanwhile the invalid was slowly rousing himself from a long deep sound health-giving sleep his mother had sat by him the night through and was now daring to change her position for the first time she was even venturing to give directions in a low voice to the old nurse who had dozed away in an armchair ready to obey any summons of her mistress mrs bellingham went on tiptoe toward the door and chiding herself because her stiff weary limbs made some slight noise she had an irrepressible longing for a few minutes change of scene after her night of watching she felt that the crisis was over and the relief to her mind made her conscious of every bodily feeling and irritation which had passed unheeded as long as she had been in suspense she slowly opened the door ruth sprang upright at the first sound of the creaking handle her very lips were stiff and unpliable with the force of the blood which rushed to her head it seemed as if she could not form words she stood right before mrs bellingham how is he madam mrs bellingham was for a moment surprised at the white apparition which seemed to rise out of the ground but her quick proud mind understood it all in an instant this was the girl then whose profligacy had led her son astray had raised up barriers in the way of her favourite scheme of his marriage with miss duncombe nay this was the real cause of his illness his mortal danger at the present time 
and of her bitter keen anxiety. If, under any circumstances, Mrs. Bellingham could have been guilty of the ill-breeding of not answering a question, it was now. And for a moment she was tempted to pass on in silence. Ruth could not wait. She spoke again. "'For the love of God, madam, speak. How is he? Will he live?' If she did not answer her, she thought the creature was desperate enough to force her way into his room. So she spoke. "'He has slept well. He is better.' "'Oh, my God, I thank thee,' murmured Ruth, sinking back against the wall. It was too much to hear this wretched girl thanking God for her son's life, as if, in fact, she had any lot or part in him, and to dare to speak to the Almighty on her son's behalf. Mrs. Bellingham looked at her with cold, contemptuous eyes, whose glances were like ice-bolts, and made Ruth shiver up away from them. "'Young woman, if you have any propriety or decency left, I trust that you will not dare to force yourself into his room.' She stood for a moment as if awaiting an answer, and half expecting it to be a defiance. But she did not understand Ruth. She did not imagine the faithful trustfulness of her heart. Ruth believed that, if Mr. Bellingham were alive and likely to live, all was well. When he wanted her, he would send for her, ask for her, yearn for her, till every one would yield before his steadfast will. At present she imagined that he was probably too weak to care or know who was about him, and though it would have been an infinite delight to her to hover and brood around him, yet it was of him she thought, and not of herself. She gently drew herself to one side to make way for Mrs. Bellingham to pass. By and by Mrs. Morgan came up. Ruth was still near the door, from which it seemed as if she could not tear herself away. "'Indeed, miss, and you must not hang about the door in this way. It is not pretty manners. Mrs. Bellingham has been speaking very sharp and cross about it, and I shall lose the character of my inn if people take to talking as she does. Did I not give you a room last night to keep in, and never to be seen or heard of? And did I not tell you what a particular lady Mrs. Bellingham was?' but you must come out here right in her way. Indeed, it was not pretty, nor grateful to me, Jenny Morgan, and that I must say. Ruth turned away like a chidden child. Mrs. Morgan followed her to her room, scolding as she went, and then, having cleared her heart after her want by uttering hasty words, her real kindness made her add in a softened tone, you step up here like a good girl. I'll send you your breakfast by and by, and let you know from time to time how he is. And you can go out for a walk, you know. But if you do, I'll take it as a favour if you'll go out by the side door. It will, maybe, save scandal. All that day long, Ruth kept herself cl close prisoner in the room to which Mrs. Morgan accorded her. All that day and many succeeding days. But at nights, when the house was still, and even the little brown mice had gathered up the crumbs and darted back again to their holes, Ruth stole out and crept to his door to catch, if she could, the sound of his beloved voice. She could tell by its tones how he felt, and how he was getting on, as well as any of the watchers in the room. She yearned and pined to see him once more, but she had reasoned herself down into something like patience when he was well enough to leave his room, when he had not always one of the nurses with him, then he would send for her, and she would tell him how very patient she had been for his dear sake. But it was long to wait, even with this thought of the manner in which the waiting would end. Poor Ruth! Her faith was only building up vain castles in the air. They towered up into heaven, it is true but, after all, they were but visions. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 Mrs. Bellingham Does the Thing Handsomely 
if mr bellingham did not get rapidly well it was more owing to the morbid querulous fancy attendant on great weakness than from any unfavourable medical symptom but he turned away with peevish loathing from the very sight of food prepared in the slovenly manner which had almost disgusted him when he was well it was of no use telling him that simpson his mother's maid had superintended the preparation at every point he offended her by detecting something offensive and to be avoided in her daintiest messes and made mrs morgan mutter many a hasty speech which however mrs bellingham thought it better not to hear until her son should be strong enough to travel i think you are better to-day said she as his man wheeled his sofa to the bedroom window we shall get you downstairs to-morrow if you were to get away from this abominable place i could go down to-day but i believe i'm to be kept prisoner here for ever i shall never get well here i'm sure he sank back on his sofa in impatient despair the surgeon was announced and eagerly questioned by mrs bellingham as to the possibility of her son's removal and he having heard the same anxiety for the same end expressed by mrs morgan in the regions below threw no great obstacles in the way after the doctor had taken his departure mrs bellingham cleared her throat several times mr bellingham knew the prelude of old and winced with nervous annoyance henry there is something i must speak to you about an unpleasant subject certainly but one which has been forced upon me by the very girl herself you must be aware to what i refer without giving me the pain of explaining myself mr bellingham turned himself sharply round to the wall and prepared himself for a lecture by concealing his face from her notice but she herself was in too nervous a state to be capable of observation of course she continued it was my wish to be as blind to the whole affair as possible though you can't imagine how mrs mason has blazoned it abroad all fordham rings with it but of course it could not be pleasant or indeed i may say correct for me to be aware that a person of such improper character was under the same i beg your pardon dear henry what do you say ruth is no improper character mother you do her injustice my dear boy you don't mean to uphold her as a paragon of virtue no mother but i let her wrong i we will let all discussions into the cause or duration of her present character drop if you please said mrs bellingham with the sort of dignified authority which retained a certain power over her son a power which originated in childhood and which he only defied when he was roused into passion he was too weak in body to oppose himself to her and fight the ground inch by inch as i have implied i do not wish to ascertain your share of blame from what i saw of her one morning i am convinced of her forward intrusive manners utterly without shame or even common modesty what are you referring to asked mr bellingham sharply why when you were at the worst and i had been watching you all night and had just gone out in the morning for a breath of fresh air this girl pushed herself before me and insisted upon speaking to me i really had to send mrs morgan to her before i could return to your room a more impudent hardened manner i never saw ruth was neither impudent nor hardened she was ignorant enough and might offend from knowing no better he was getting weary of the discussion and wished it had never had begun from the time he had become conscious of his mother's presence he had felt the dilemma he was in in regard to ruth and various plans had directly crossed his brain but it had been so troublesome to weigh and consider them all properly that they had been put aside to be settled when he grew stronger but this difficulty in which he was placed by his connection with ruth associated the idea of her in his mind with annoyance and angry regret at the whole affair he wished in the languid way he wished for and felt everything not immediately relating to his daily comfort 
that he had never seen her. It was a most awkward, a most unfortunate affair. Notwithstanding this annoyance connected with an arising out of Ruth, he would not submit to hear her abused, and something in his manner impressed this on his mother, for she immediately changed her mode of attack. We may as well drop all dispute as to the young woman's manners, but I suppose you do not mean to defend your connection with her. I suppose you are not so lost to all sense of propriety as to imagine it fit or desirable that your mother and this degraded girl should remain under the same roof, liable to meet at any hour of the day. She waited for an answer, but no answer came. I ask you a simple question. Is it, or is it not, desirable? I suppose it is not, he replied gloomily. And I suppose, from your manner, that you think the difficulty would be best solved by my taking my departure and leaving you with your vicious companion. Again no answer, but inward and increasing annoyance, of which Mr. Bellingham considered Ruth the cause. At length he spoke. Mother, you are not helping me in my difficulty. I have no desire to banish you, nor to hurt you, after all your care for me. Ruth has not been so much to blame as you imagine, that I must say, but I do not wish to see her again. If you can tell me how to arrange it otherwise, without behaving unhandsomely, only spare me all this worry a while. I am so weak. I put myself in your hands. Dismiss her, as you wish it. But let it be done handsomely, and let me hear no more about it. I cannot bear it. Let me have a quiet life without being lectured while I am pent up here and unable to shake off unpleasant thoughts. My dear Henry, rely upon me. No more, mother. It's a bad business, and I can hardly avoid blaming myself in the matter. I don't want to dwell upon it. Don't be too severe in your self-reproaches while you are so feeble, dear Henry. It is right to repent, but I have no doubt in my own mind she led you wrong with her artifices. But, as you say, everything should be done handsomely. I confess I was deeply grieved when I first heard of the affair, but since I have seen the girl, well, I'll say no more about her, since I see it displeases you. But I am thankful to God that you see the error of your ways. She sat silent, thinking for a little while and then sent for her writing-case, and began to write. Her son became restless, and nervously irritated. Mother, he said, this affair worries me to death. I cannot shake off the thoughts of it. Leave it to me. I'll arrange it satisfactorily. Could we not leave to-night? I should not be so haunted by this annoyance in another place. I dread seeing her again, because I fear a scene and yet I believe I ought to see her, in order to explain. "'You must not think of such a thing, Henry,' said she, alarmed at the very idea. "'Sooner than that, we will leave in half an hour, and try to get to Pentrevolis to-night. It is not yet three, and the evenings are very long. Simpson should stay and finish the packing. She could go straight to London and meet us there. MacDonald and Nurse could go with us.' Can you bear twenty miles, do you think? Anything to get rid of his uneasiness. He felt that he was not behaving as he should do to Ruth, though the really right never entered his head. But it would extricate him from his present dilemma and save him many lectures. He knew that his mother, always liberal where money was concerned, would do the thing handsomely and it would always be easy to write and give Ruth what explanation he felt inclined, in a day or two. So he consented, and soon lost some of his uneasiness in watching the bustle of the preparation for their departure. All this time Ruth was quietly spending in her room, beguiling the waiting, weary hours with pictures of the meeting at the end. Her room looked to the back, and was in a side wing away from the principal state apartments. Consequently, she was not roused to suspicion by any of the commotion. But, indeed, if she had heard the banging of doors, the sharp directions, the carriage wheels, she would still not have suspected the truth. Her own love was too faithful. 
it was four o'clock and past when some one knocked at her door and on entering gave her a note which mrs bellingham had left that lady had found some difficulty in wording it so as to satisfy herself but it was as follows my son on recovering from his illness is i thank god happily conscious of the sinful way in which he has been living with you by his earnest desire and in order to avoid seeing you again we are on the point of leaving this place but before i go i wish to exhort you to repentance and to remind you that you will not have your own guilt alone upon your head but that of any young man whom you may succeed in entrapping into vice i shall pray that you may turn to an honest life and i strongly recommend you if indeed you are not dead in trespasses and sins to enter some penitentiary in accordance with my son's wishes i forward you in this envelope a bank-note of fifty pounds margaret bellingham was this the end of all had he indeed gone she started up and asked this last question of the servant who half guessing at the purport of the note had lingered about the room curious to see the effect produced is indeed miss the carriage drove from the door as i came upstairs you'll see it now on the ispity road if you'll please to come to the window of number twenty four ruth started up and followed the chambermaid ay there it was slowly winding up the steep white road on which it seemed to move at a snail's pace she might overtake him she might she might speak one farewell word to him print his face on her heart with a last look nay when he saw her he might retract and not utterly for ever leave her thus she thought and she flew back to her room and snatching up her bonnet ran tying the strings with her trembling hands as she went down the stairs out at the nearest door little heeding the angry words of mrs morgan for the hostess more irritated at mrs bellingham's severe upbraiding at parting than mollified by her ample payment was offended by the circumstances of ruth in her wild haste passing through the prohibited front door but ruth was away before mrs morgan had finished her speech out and away scudding along the road thought lost in the breathless rapidity of her motion though her heart and head beat almost to bursting what did it signify if she could but overtake the carriage it was a nightmare constantly evading the most passionate wishes and endeavours and constantly gaining ground every time it was visible it was in fact more distant but ruth would not believe it if she could but gain the summit of that weary everlasting hill she believed that she could run again and would soon be nigh upon the carriage as she ran she prayed with wild eagerness she prayed that she might see his face once more even if she died on the spot before him it was one of those prayers which god is too merciful to grant but despairing and wild as it was ruth put her soul into it and prayed it again and yet again wave above wave of the ever-rising hills were gained were crossed and at last ruth struggled up to the very top and stood on the bare table of moor brown and purple stretching far away till it was lost in the haze of the summer afternoon the white road was all flat before her but the carriage she sought and the figure she sought had disappeared there was no human being there a few wild black-faced mountain sheep quietly grazing near the road as if it were long since they had been disturbed by the passing of any vehicle was all the life she saw on the bleak moorland she threw herself down on the ling by the side of the road in despair her only hope was to die and she believed she was dying she could not think she could not believe anything surely life was a horrible dream and god would mercifully awaken her from it she had no penitence no consciousness of error or offence no knowledge of any one circumstance but that he was gone 
yet afterwards long afterwards she remembered the exact motion of a bright green beetle busily meandering among the wild thyme near her and she recalled the musical balanced wavering drop of a skylark into her nest near the heather bed where she lay the sun was sinking low the hot air had ceased to quiver near the hotter earth when she bethought her once more of the note which she had impatiently thrown down before half mastering its contents oh perhaps she thought i have been too hasty there may be some words of explanation from him on the other side of the page to which in my blind anguish i never turned i will go and find it she lifted herself heavily and stiffly from the crushed heather she stood dizzy and confused with her change of posture and was so unable to move at first that her walk was but slow and tottering but by and by she was tasked and goaded by thoughts which forced her into rapid motion as if by it she could escape from her agony she came down on the level ground just as many gay or peaceful groups were sauntering leisurely home with hearts at ease with low laughs and quiet smiles and many an exclamation at the beauty of the summer evening ever since her adventure with the little boy and his sister ruth had habitually avoided encountering these happy innocents may i call them these happy fellow mortals and even now the habit grounded on sorrowful humiliation had power over her she paused and then on looking back she saw more people who had come into the main road from a side path she opened a gate into a pasture field and crept up to the hedge bank until all should have passed by and she could steal into the inn unseen she sat down on the sloping turf by the roots of an old hawthorn tree which grew in the hedge she was still tearless with hot burning eyes she heard the merry walkers pass by she heard the footsteps of the village children as they ran along to their evening play she saw the small black cows come into the fields after being milked and life seemed yet abroad when would the world be still and dark and fit for such a deserted desolate creature as she was even in her hiding place she was not long at peace the little children with their curious eyes peering here and there had peeped through the hedge and through the gate and now they gathered from all the four corners of the hamlet and crowded round the gate and one more adventurous then the rest had run into the field to cry give me a haypenny which set the example to every little one emulous of his boldness and there where she sat low on the ground and longing for the sure hiding place earth gives to the weary the children kept running in and pushing one another forwards and laughing poor things their time had not come for understanding what sorrow is ruth would have begged them to leave her alone and not madden her utterly but they knew no english save the one eternal give me a haypenny she felt in her heart that there was no pity anywhere suddenly while she doubted god a shadow fell across her garments on which her miserable eyes were bent she looked up the deformed gentleman she had twice before seen stood there he had been attracted by the noisy little crowd and had questioned them in welsh but not understanding enough of the language to comprehend their answers he had obeyed their signs and entered the gate to which they pointed there he saw the young girl whom he had noticed at first for her innocent beauty and the second time for the idea he had gained respecting her situation there he saw her crouched up like some hunted creature with a wild scared look of despair which almost made her lovely face seem fierce he saw her dress soiled and dim her bonnet crushed and battered with her tossings to and fro on the moorland bed he saw the poor lost wanderer and when he saw her he had compassion on her there was some look of heavenly pity in his eyes as gravely and sadly they met her upturned gaze which touched her stony heart 
still looking at him as if drawing some good influence from him she said low and mournfully he has left me sir he has indeed he has gone and left me before he could speak a word to comfort her she had burst into the wildest dreariest crying ever mortal cried the settled form of the event when put into words went sharp to her heart her moans and sobs wrung his soul but as no speech of his could be heard if he had been able to decide what best to say he stood by her in apparent calmness while she wretched wailed and uttered her woe but when she lay worn out and stupefied into silence she heard him say to himself in a low voice oh my god for christ's sake pity her ruth lifted up her eyes and looked at him with a dim perception of the meaning of his words she regarded him fixedly in a dreamy way as if they struck some chord in her heart and she were listening to its echo and so it was his pitiful look or his words reminded her of the childish days when she knelt at her mother's knee and she was only conscious of a straining longing desire to recall it all he let her take her time partly because he was powerfully affected himself by all the circumstances and by the sad pale face upturned to his and partly by an instinctive consciousness that the softest patience was required but suddenly she startled him as she herself was startled into a keen sense of the suffering agony of the present she sprang up and pushed him aside and went rapidly towards the gate of the field he could not move as quickly as most men but he put forth his utmost speed he followed across the road on to the rocky common but as he went along with his uncertain gait in the dusk gloaming he stumbled and fell over some sharp projecting stone the acute pain which shot up his back forced a sharp cry from him and when bird and beast are hushed into rest and the stillness of night is over all a high-pitched sound like the voice of pain is carried far in the quiet air ruth speeding on in her despair heard the sharp utterance and stopped suddenly short it did what no remonstrance could have done it called her out of herself the tender nature was in her still in that hour when all good angels seemed to have abandoned her in the old days she could never bear to hear or see bodily suffering in any of god's meanest creatures without trying to succour them and now in her rush to the awful death of the suicide she stayed her wild steps and turned to find from whom that sharp sound of anguish had issued he lay among the white stones too faint with pain to move but with an agony in his mind far keener than any bodily pain as he thought that by his unfortunate fall he had lost all chance of saving her he was almost overpowered by his intense thankfulness when he saw her white figure pause and stand listening and turn again with slow footsteps as if searching for some lost thing he could hardly speak but he made a sound which though his heart was inexpressibly glad was like a groan she came quickly towards him i am hurt said he do not leave me his disabled and tender frame was overcome by the accident and the previous emotions and he fainted away ruth flew to the little mountain stream the dashing sound of whose waters had been tempting her but a moment before to seek forgetfulness in the deep pool into which they fell she made a basin of her joined hands and carried enough of the cold fresh water back to dash into his face and restore him to consciousness while he still kept silence uncertain what to say best fitted to induce her to listen to him she said softly are you better sir are you very much hurt not very much i am better any quick movement is apt to cause me a sudden loss of power in my back and i believe i stumbled over some of these projecting stones it will soon go off and you will help me to go home i am sure oh yes 
can you go now i am afraid of your lying too long on this heather there is a heavy dew he was so anxious to comply with her wish and not weary out her thought for him and so turn her back upon herself that he tried to rise the pain was acute and this she saw don't hurry yourself sir i can wait then came across her mind the recollection of the business that was thus deferred but the few homely words which had been exchanged between them seemed to have awakened her from her madness she sat down by him and covering her face with her hands cried mournfully and unceasingly she forgot his presence and yet she had a consciousness that some one looked for her kind offices that she was wanted in the world and must not rush hastily out of it the consciousness did not take this definite form it did not become a thought but it kept her still and it was gradually soothing her can you help me to rise now said he after a while she did not speak but she helped him up and then he took her arm and she led him tenderly through all the little velvet paths where the turf grew short and soft between the rugged stones once more on the highway they slowly passed along in the moonlight he guided her by a slight motion of the arm through the more unfrequented lanes to his lodgings at the shop for he thought for her and conceived the pain she would have in seeing the lighted windows of the inn he leaned more heavily on her arm as they awaited the opening of the door come in said he not relaxing his hold and yet dreading to tighten it lest she should defy restraint and once more rush away they went slowly into the little parlour behind the shop the bonny looking hostess mrs hughes by name made haste to light the candle and then they saw each other face to face the deformed gentleman looked very pale but ruth looked as if the shadow of death was upon her End of chapter 8chapter nine the storm spirit subdued mrs hughes bustled about with many a sympathetic exclamation now in pretty broken english now in more fluent welsh which sounded as soft as russian or italian in her musical voice mr benson for that was the name of the hunchback lay on the sofa thinking while the tender mrs hughes made every arrangement for his relief from pain he had lodged with her for three successive years and she knew and loved him ruth stood in the little bow window looking out across the moon and over the deep blue heavens large torn irregular shaped clouds went hurrying as if summoned by some storm spirit the work they were commanded to do was not here the mighty gathering place lay eastward immeasurable leagues and on they went chasing each other over the silent earth now black now silver white at one transparent edge now with the moon shining like hope through their darkest centre now again with a silver lining and now utterly black they sailed lower in the lift and disappeared behind the immovable mountains they were rushing in the very direction in which ruth had striven and struggled to go that afternoon they in their wild career would soon pass over the very spot where he her world's he was lying sleeping or perhaps not sleeping perhaps thinking of her the storm was in her mind and rent and tore her purposes into forms as wild and irregular as the heavenly shapes she was looking at if like them she could pass the barrier horizon in the night she might overtake him mr benson saw her look and read it partially he saw her longing gaze outwards upon the free broad world and thought that the siren waters whose deadly music yet rang in his ears were again tempting her he called her to him praying that his feeble voice might have power 
my dear young lady i have much to say to you and god has taken my strength from me now when i most need oh i sin to speak so but for his sake i implore you to be patient here if only till to-morrow morning he looked at her but her face was immovable and she did not speak she could not give up her hope her chance her liberty till to-morrow god help me said he mournfully my words do not touch her and still holding her hand he sank back on the pillows indeed it was true that his words did not vibrate in her atmosphere the storm spirit raged there and filled her heart with the thought that she was an outcast and the holy words for his sake were answered by the demon who held possession with a blasphemous defiance of the merciful god what have i to do with thee he thought of every softening influence of religion which over his own disciplined heart had power but put them aside as useless then the still small voice whispered and he spake in your mother's name whether she be dead or alive i command you to stay here until i am able to speak to you she knelt down at the foot of the sofa and shook it with her sobs her heart was touched and he hardly dared to speak again at length he said i know you will not go you could not for her sake you will not will you no whispered ruth and then there was a great blank in her heart she had given up her chance she was calm in the utter absence of all hope and now you will do what i tell you said he gently but unconsciously to himself in the tone of one who has found the hidden spell by which to rule spirits she slowly said yes but she was subdued he called mrs hughes she came from her adjoining shop you have a bedroom within yours where your daughter used to sleep i think i am sure you will oblige me and i shall consider it as a great favour if you will allow this young lady to sleep there to-night will you take her there now go my dear i have full trust in your promise not to leave until i can speak to you his voice died away to silence but as ruth rose from her knees at his bidding she looked at his face through her tears her lips were moving in earnest unspoken prayer and she knew it was for her that night although his pain was relieved by rest he could not sleep and as in fever the coming events kept unrolling themselves before him in every changing and fantastic form he met ruth in all possible places and ways and addressed her in every manner he could imagine most calculated to move and affect her to penitence and virtue toward morning he fell asleep but the same thoughts haunted his dreams he spoke but his voice refused to utter aloud and she fled relentless to the deep black pool but god works in his own way the visions melted into deep unconscious sleep he was awakened by a knock at the door which seemed a repetition of what he had heard in his last sleeping moments it was mrs hughes she stood at the first word of permission within the room please sir i think the young lady is very ill indeed sir perhaps you would come to her how is she ill said he much alarmed quite quiet like sir but i think she is dying that's all indeed sir go away i will be with you directly he replied his heart sinking within him in a very short time he was standing with mrs hughes by ruth's bedside she lay as still as if she were dead her eyes shut her wan face numbed into a fixed anguish of expression she did not speak when they spoke though after a while they thought she strove to do so but all power of motion and utterance had left her she was dressed in everything except her bonnet as she had been the day before although sweet thoughtful mrs hughes had provided her with night-gear which lay on the little chest of drawers that served as a dressing-table 
Mr. Benson lifted up her arm to feel her feeble, fluttering pulse, and when he let go her hand, it fell upon the bed in a dull, heavy way, as if she were already dead. "'You gave her some food?' said he anxiously to Mrs. Hughes. "'Indeed, and I offered her the best in the house, but she shook her poor pretty head, and only asked if I would please get her a cup of water. I brought her some milk, though, indeed, I think she'd rather have had the water, but not to seem sour and cross, she took some milk.' By this time Mrs. Hughes was fairly crying. "'When does the doctor come up here?' "'Indeed, sir, and he's up nearly every day now. The inn is so full.' "'I'll go for him. And can you manage to undress her and lay her in bed? Open the window, too, and let in the air. If her feet are cold, put bottles of hot water to them.' It was a proof of the true love, which was the nature of both, that it never crossed their minds to regret that this poor young creature had been thus thrown upon their hands. On the contrary, Mrs. Hughes called it a blessing. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten: A Note and the Answer At the inn everything was life and bustle. Mr. Benson had to wait long in Mrs. Morgan's little parlour before she could come to him, and he kept growing more and more impatient. At last she made her appearance and heard his story. People may talk, as they will, about the little respect that is paid to virtue, unaccompanied by the outward accidents of wealth or station, but I rather think it will be found that, in the long run, true and simple virtue always has its proportionate reward in the respect and reverence of every one whose esteem is worth having. To be sure, it is not rewarded after the way of the world, as mere worldly possessions are, with a low obeisance and lip service, but all the better and more noble qualities in the hearts of others make ready and go forth to meet it on its approach, provided only it be pure, simple, and unconscious of its own existence. Mr. Benson had little thought for outward tokens of respect just then, nor had Mrs. Morgan much time to spare, but she smoothed her ruffled brow and calmed her bustling manner as soon as ever she saw who it was that awaited her, for Mr. Benson was well known in the village where he had taken up his summer holiday among the mountains year after year, always a resident at the shop and seldom spending a shilling at the inn. Mrs. Morgan listened patiently for her. Mr. Jones will come this afternoon, but it is a shame you should be troubled with such as her. I had but little time yesterday, but I guessed there was something wrong, and Gwen has just been telling me her bed has not been slept in. They were in a pretty hurry to be gone yesterday, for all that the gentleman was not fit to travel. To my way of thinking, indeed, William Wynne, the postboy, said he was weary enough before he got to the end of that Ipsity road, and he thought they would have to rest there a day or two before they could go further than Pen Trevolus. Indeed, and anyhow, the servant is to follow them with the baggage this very morning. And now I remember, William Wynne said they would wait for her. You'd better write a note, Mr. Benson, and tell them her state. It was sound, though unpalatable, advice. It came from one accustomed to bring excellent, if unrefined, sense to bear quickly upon any emergency, and to decide rapidly. She was, in truth, so little accustomed to have her authority questioned, that, before Mr. Benson had made up his mind, she had produced paper pens and ink from the drawer in her bureau, placed them before him, and was going to leave the room. Leave the note on this shelf, and trust me that it goes by the maid. The boy that drives her there in the car shall bring you an answer back. She was gone before he could rally his scattered senses enough to remember that he had not the least idea of the name of the person to whom he was to write. 
the quiet leisure and peace of his little study at home favoured his habit of reverie and long deliberation just as her position as mistress of an inn obliged her to quick decisive ways her advice though good in some points was unpalatable in others it was true that ruth's condition ought to be known by those who were her friends but were these people to whom he was going to write friends he knew there was a rich mother and a handsome elegant son and he had also some idea of the circumstances which might a little extenuate their mode of quitting ruth he had wide enough sympathy to understand that it must have been a most painful position in which the mother had been placed on finding herself under the same roof with a girl who was living with her son as ruth was and yet he did not like to apply to her to write to the son was still more out of the question as it seemed like asking him to return but through one or the other lay the only clue to her friends who certainly ought to be made acquainted with her position at length he wrote madam i write to tell you of the condition of the poor young woman here came a long pause of deliberation who accompanied your son on his arrival here and who was left behind on your departing yesterday she is lying as it appears to me in a very dangerous state at my lodgings and if i may suggest it would be kind to allow your maid to return and attend upon her until she is sufficiently recovered to be restored to her friends if indeed they could not come to take charge of her themselves i remain madam your obedient servant thurston benson the note was very unsatisfactory after all his consideration but it was the best he could do he made inquiry of a passing servant as to the lady's name directed the note and placed it on the indicated shelf he then returned to his lodgings to await the doctor's coming and the postboy's return there was no alteration in ruth she was as one stunned into unconsciousness she did not move her posture she hardly breathed from time to time mrs hughes wetted her mouth with some liquid and there was a little mechanical motion of the lips that was the only sign of life she gave the doctor came and shook his head a thorough prostration of strength occasioned by some great shock on the nerves and prescribed care and quiet and mysterious medicines but acknowledged that the result was doubtful very doubtful after his departure mr benson took his welsh grammar and tried again to master the ever-puzzling rules for the mutations of letters but it was of no use for his thoughts were absorbed by the life-and-death condition of the young creature who was lately bounding and joyous the maid and the luggage the car and the driver had arrived before noon at their journey's end and the note had been delivered it annoyed mrs bellingham exceedingly it was the worst of these kind of connections there was no calculating the consequences they were never ending all sorts of claims seemed to be established and all sorts of people to step into their settlement the idea of sending her maid why simpson would not go if she asked her she soliloquized thus while reading the letter and then suddenly turning round to the favourite attendant who had been listening to her mistress's remarks with no in inattentive ear she asked simpson would you go and nurse this creature as this she looked at the signature mr benson whoever he is proposes me no indeed ma'am said the maid drawing herself up stiff in her virtue i'm sure ma'am you would not expect it of me i could never have the face to dress a lady of character again well well don't be alarmed i cannot spare you by the way just attend to the strings of my dress the chambermaid here pulled them into knots and broke them terribly last night it is awkward though very said she relapsing into a musing fit over the condition of ruth if you'll allow me ma'am i think i might say something that would alter the case 
I believe, ma'am, you put a bank-note into the letter to the young woman yesterday? Mrs. Bellingham bowed acquiescence, and the maid went on. Because, ma'am, when the little deformed ma'am wrote that note, he's Mr. Benson, ma'am. I have reason to believe neither he nor Mrs. Morgan knew of any provision being made for the young woman. Me and the chambermaid found your letter and the banknote lying quite promiscuous, like waste paper, on the floor of her room, for I believe she rushed out like mad after you left. That, as you say, alters the case. This letter, then, is principally a sort of delicate hint that some provision ought to have been made, which is true enough, only it has been attended to already. What became of the money? Law, ma'am, do you ask? Of course, as soon as I saw it, I picked it up and took it to Mrs. Morgan, in trust for the young person. Oh, that's right. What friends has she? Did you ever hear from Mason? Perhaps they ought to know where she is. Mrs. Mason did tell me, ma'am, she was an orphan, with a guardian, who was no ways akin, and who washed his hands of her when she ran off. But Mrs. Mason was sadly put out, and went into hysterics, for fear you would think she had not seen after her enough, and that she might lose your custom. She said it was no fault of hers, for the girl was always a forward creature, boasting of her beauty, and saying how pretty she was, and striving to get where her good looks could be seen and admired. One night in particular, ma'am, at a county ball, and how Mrs. Mason had found out she used to meet Mr. Bellingham at an old woman's house, who was a regular old witch, ma'am, and lives in the lowest part of the town, where all the bad characters haunt. There, that's enough, said Mrs. Bellingham sharply, for the maid's chattering had outrun her tact, and in her anxiety to vindicate the character of her friend Mrs. Mason by blackening that of Ruth, she had forgotten that she had a little implicated her mistress's son, whom his proud mother did not like to imagine as ever passing through a low and degraded part of the town. If she has no friends, and is the creature you describe, which is confirmed by my own observation, the best place for her is, as I said before, the penitentiary. Her fifty pounds will keep her a week or so, if she is really unable to travel and pay for her journey, and if on her return to Fordham she will let me know, I will undertake to obtain her admission immediately. I'm sure it's well for her she has to do with a lady who will take any interest in her after what has happened. Mrs. Bellingham called for her writing desk and wrote a few hasty lines to be sent by the postboy who was on the point of starting. Mrs. Bellingham presents her compliments to her unknown correspondent, Mr. Benson, and begs to inform him of a circumstance of which she believes he was ignorant when he wrote the letter with which she has been favoured, namely, that provision to the amount of fifty pounds was left for the unfortunate person who is the subject of Mr. Benson's letter. This sum is in the hands of Mrs. Morgan, as well as a note from Mrs. Bellingham to the miserable girl, in which she proposes to procure her admission into the Fordham Penitentiary, the best place for such a character, as by this profligate action she has forfeited the only friend remaining to her in the world. This proposition Mrs. Bellingham repeats, and they are the young woman's best friends who most urge her to comply with the course now pointed out. Take care, Mr. Bellingham, hears nothing of this Mr. Benson's note, said Mrs. Bellingham, as she delivered the answer to her maid. He is so sensitive just now that it would annoy him sadly, I am sure. End of chapter 10 Chapter Eleven Thurston and Faith Benson. You have now seen the note which was delivered into Mr. Benson's hands as the cool shades of evening stole over the glowing summer sky. When he had read it, 
he again prepared to write a few hasty lines before the post went out the postboy was even now sounding his horn through the village as a signal for letters to be ready and it was well that mr benson in his long morning's meditation had decided upon the course to be pursued in case of such an answer as that which he had received from mrs bellingham his present note was as follows dear faith you must come to this place directly where i earnestly desire you and your advice i am well myself so do not be alarmed i have no time for explanation but i am sure you will not refuse me let me trust that i shall see you on saturday at the latest you know the mode by which i came it is the best both for expedition and cheapness dear faith do not fail me your affectionate brother thurston benson p s i am afraid the money i left may be running short do not let this stop you take my facciolati to johnson's he will advance upon it it is the third row bottom shelf only come when this letter was dispatched he had done all he could and the next two days passed like a long monotonous dream of watching thought and care undisturbed by any event hardly by the change from day to night which now the harvest moon was at her full was scarcely perceptible on saturday morning the answer came dearest thurston your incomprehensible summons has just reached me and i obey there proving my right to my name of faith i shall be with you almost as soon as this letter i cannot help feeling anxious as well as curious i have money enough and it is well i have for sally who guards your room like a dragon would rather see me walk the whole way than have any of your things disturbed your affectionate sister it was a great relief to mr benson to think that his sister would so soon be with him he had been accustomed from childhood to rely on her prompt judgment and excellent sense and to her care he felt that ruth ought to be consigned as it was too much to go on taxing good mrs hughes with night watching and sick nursing with all her other claims on her time he asked her once more to sit by ruth while he went to meet his sister the coach passed by the foot of the steep ascent which led up to landu he took a boy to carry his sister's luggage when they arrived they were too soon at the bottom of the hill and the boy began to make ducks and drakes in the shallowest part of the stream which there flowed glassy and smooth while mr benson sat down on a great stone under the shadow of an alder bush which grew where the green flat meadows skirted the water it was delightful to be once more in the open air and away from the scenes and thoughts which had been pressing on him for the last three days there was a new beauty in everything from the blue mountains which glimmered in the distant sunlight down to the flat rich peaceful vale with its calm round shadows where he sat the very margin of white pebbles which lay on the banks of the stream had a sort of cleanly beauty about it he felt calmer and more at ease than he had done for some days and yet when he began to think it was rather a strange story which he had to tell his sister in order to account for his urgent summons here was he sole friend and guardian of a poor sick girl whose very name he did not know about whom all that he did know was that she had been the mistress of a man who had deserted her and that she feared he believed she had contemplated suicide the offence too was one for which his sister good and kind as she was had little compassion well he must appeal to her love for him which was a very unsatisfactory mode of proceeding as he would far rather have had her interest in the girl founded on reason or some less personal basis than showing it merely because her brother wished it 
the coach came slowly rumbling over the stony road his sister was outside but got down in a brisk active way and greeted her brother heartily and affectionately she was considerably taller than he was and must have been very handsome her black hair was parted plainly over her forehead and her dark expressive eyes and straight nose still retained the beauty of her youth i do not know whether she was older than her brother but probably owing to his infirmity requiring her care she had something of a mother's manner toward him thurston you are looking pale i do not believe you are well whatever you may say have you had the old pain in your back no a little never mind that dearest faith sit down here while i send the boy up with your box and then with some little desire to show his sister how well he was acquainted with the language he blundered out his directions in a very grammatical welsh so grammatical in fact and so badly pronounced that the boy scratching his head made answer dim sesonic so he had to repeat it in english well now thurston here i sit as you bid me but don't try me too long tell me why you sent for me now came the difficulty and oh for a seraph's tongue and a seraph's power of representation but there was no seraph at hand only the soft running waters singing a quiet tune and predisposing miss benson to listen with a soothed spirit to any tale not immediately involving her brother's welfare which had been the cause of her seeing that lovely veil it is an awkward story to tell faith but there is a young woman lying ill at my lodgings whom i wanted you to nurse he thought he saw a shadow on his sister's face and detected a slight change in her voice as she spoke nothing very romantic i hope thurston remember i cannot stand much romance i always distrust it i don't know what you mean by romance the story is real enough and not out of the common way i'm afraid he paused he did not get over the difficulty well tell it me at once thurston i am afraid you have let someone or perhaps only your own imagination impose upon you but don't try my patience too much you know i've no great stock then i'll tell you the young girl was brought to the inn here by a gentleman who has left her she is very ill and has no one to see after her miss benson had some masculine tricks and one was whistling a long low whistle when surprised or displeased she had often found it a useful vent for feelings and she whistled now her brother would rather she had spoken have you sent for her friends she asked at last she has none another pause and another whistle but rather softer and more wavering than the last how is she ill pretty nearly as quiet as if she were dead she does not speak or move or even sigh it would be better for her to die at once i think faith that one word put them right it was spoken in the tone which had authority over her it was so full of grieved surprise and mournful upbraiding she was accustomed to exercise a sway over him owing to her greater decision of character and probably if everything were traced to its cause to her superior vigour of constitution but at times she was humbled before his pure childlike nature and felt where she was inferior she was too good and true to conceal this feeling or to resent its being forced upon her after a time she said thurston dear let us go to her she helped him with tender care and gave him her arm up the long and tedious hill but when they approached the village without speaking a word on the subject they changed their position and she leant apparently on him he stretched himself up into as vigorous a gait as he could when they drew near to the abodes of men on the way they had spoken but little 
he had asked after various members of his congregation for he was a dissenting minister in a country town and she had answered but they neither of them spoke of ruth though their minds were full of her mrs hughes had tea ready for the traveller on her arrival mr benson chafed a little internally at the leisurely way in which his sisters sipped and sipped and paused to tell him some trifling particular respecting home affairs which she had forgotten before mr bradshaw has refused to let the children associate with the dixons any longer because one evening they played at acting charades indeed a little more bread and butter faith thank you this welsh air does make one hungry mrs bradshaw is paying poor old maggie's rent to save her from being sent into the workhouse that's right won't you have another cup of tea i have had two however i think i'll take another mr benson could not refrain from a little sigh as he poured it out he thought he had never seen his sister so deliberately hungry and thirsty before. He did not guess that she was feeling the meal rather a respite from a distasteful interview, which she was aware was awaiting her at its conclusion. But all things come to an end, and so did Miss Benson's tea. Now will you go and see her? Yes. And so they went mrs hughes had pinned up a piece of green calico by way of a venetian blind to shut out the afternoon sun and in the light thus shaded lay ruth still and wan and white even with her brother's account of ruth's state such death-like quietness startled miss benson startled her into pity for the poor lovely creature who lay thus stricken and felled when she saw her she could no longer imagine her to be an impostor or a hardened sinner such prostration of woe belonged to neither mr benson looked more at his sister's face than at ruth's he read her countenance as a book mrs hughes stood by crying mr benson touched his sister and they left the room together do you think she will live asked he I cannot tell, said Miss Benson, in a softened voice, but how young she looks, quite a child, poor creature. When will the doctor come? Thurston, tell me all about her. You have never told me the particulars. Mr. Benson might have said she had never cared to hear them before, and had rather avoided the subject, but he was too happy to see this awakening of interest in his sister's warm heart to say anything in the least reproachful. He told her the story as well as he could, and, as he felt it deeply, he told it with heart's eloquence. And, as he ended, and looked at her, there were tears in the eyes of both. "'And what does the doctor say?' asked she, after a pause. "'He insists upon quiet. He orders medicines and strong broth. I cannot tell you all. Mrs. Hughes can. She has been so truly good. Doing good, hoping for nothing again. She looks very sweet and gentle. I shall sit up to-night and watch her myself, and I shall send you and Mrs. Hughes early to bed, for you have both a worn look about you I don't like. Are you sure the effect of that fall has gone off? Do you feel anything of it in your back still? after all i owe her something for turning back to your help are you sure she was going to drown herself i cannot be sure for i have not questioned her she has not been in a state to be questioned but i have no doubt whatever about it but you must not think of sitting up after your journey faith answer me thurston do you feel any bad effect from that fall no hardly any don't sit up faith to-night thurston it's no good talking for i shall and if you go on opposing me i dare say i shall attack your back and put a blister on it do tell me what that hardly any means besides to set you quite at ease you know i have never seen mountains before and they fill me and oppress me so much that i could not sleep 
I must keep awake this first night, and see that they don't fall on the earth and overwhelm it. And now answer my questions about yourself. Miss Benson had the power, which some people have, of carrying her wishes through to their fulfillment. Her will was strong, her sense was excellent, and people yielded to her. They did not know why. Before ten o'clock she reigned sole power and potentate in Ruth's little chamber. Nothing could have been better devised for giving her an interest in the invalid. The very dependence of one so helpless upon her care inclined her heart towards her. She thought she perceived a slight improvement in the symptoms during the night, and she was a little pleased that this progress should have been made while she reigned monarch of the sick-room. Yes, certainly there was an improvement. There was more consciousness in the look of the eyes, although the whole countenance still retained its painful traces of acute suffering, manifested in an anxious, startled, uneasy aspect. It was broad morning light, though barely five o'clock, when Miss Benson caught the light of Ruth's lips moving, as if in speech. Miss Benson stooped down to listen. "'Who are you?' asked Ruth, in the faintest of whispers. "'Miss Benson, Mr. Benson's sister,' she replied. The words conveyed no knowledge to Ruth. On the contrary, weak as a babe, in mind and body as she was, her lips began to quiver and her eyes to show a terror similar to that of any little child who wakens in the presence of a stranger and sees no dear familiar face of mother or nurse to reassure its trembling heart. Miss Benson took her hand in hers, and began to stroke it, caressingly. "'Don't be afraid, dear. I'm a friend come to take care of you. Would you like some tea now, my love?' The very utterance of these gentle words was unlocking Miss Benson's heart. Her brother was surprised to see her so full of interest when he came to inquire later on in the morning. It required Mrs. Hughes's persuasions, as well as his own, to induce her to go to bed for an hour or two after breakfast, and before she went she made them promise that she should be called when the doctor came. He did not come until late in the afternoon. The invalid was rallying fast, though rallying to a consciousness of sorrow, as was evinced by the tears which came slowly rolling down her pale sad cheeks, tears which she had not the power to wipe away. Mr. Benson had remained in the house all day to hear the doctor's opinion, and now that he was relieved from the charge of Ruth by his sister's presence, he had more time to dwell upon the circumstances of her case, so far as they were known to him. He remembered his first sight of her, her lithe figure swaying to and fro as she balanced herself on the slippery stones, half smiling at her own dilemma with a bright happy light in the eyes that seemed like a reflection from the glancing waters sparkling below. Then he recalled the change affrighted look of those eyes as they met his, after the child's rebuff of her advances, how that little incident filled up the tale at which Mrs. Hughes had hinted, in a kind of sorrowful way, as if loath, as a Christian should be, to believe evil. Then that fearful evening, when he had only just saved her from committing suicide, and that nightmare sleep, and now lost, forsaken, and but just delivered from the jaws of death, she lay dependent for everything on his sister and him, utter strangers a few weeks ago. Where was her lover? Could he be easy and happy? Could he grow into perfect health with these great sins pressing on his conscience, with a strong and hard pain? Or had he a conscience? Into whole labyrinths of social ethics Mr. Benson's thoughts wandered, when his sister entered suddenly and abruptly. "'What does the doctor say? Is she better?' "'Oh, yes, she's better,' answered Miss Benson, sharp and short. Her brother looked at her in dismay. She bumped down into a chair in a cross, dis disconcerted manner, 
they were both silent for a few minutes only miss benson whistled and clucked alternately what is the matter faith you say she is better why thurston there is something so shocking the matter that i cannot tell you mr benson changed colour with fright all things possible and impossible crossed his mind but the right one i said all things possible i made a mistake he never believed ruth to be more guilty than she seemed faith i wish you would tell me and not bewilder me with those noises of yours said he nervously i beg your pardon but something so shocking has just been discovered i don't know how to word it she will have a child the doctor says so she was allowed to make noises unnoticed for a few minutes her brother did not speak at last she wanted his sympathy isn't it shocking thurston you might have knocked me down with a straw when he told me does she know yes and i am not sure that that isn't the worst part of all how what do you mean oh i was just beginning to have a good opinion of her but i am afraid she is very depraved after the doctor was gone she pulled the bed curtain aside and looked as if she wanted to speak to me i can't think how she heard for we were close to the window and spoke very low well i went to her though i really had taken quite a turn against her and she whispered quite eagerly did he say i should have a baby of course i could not keep it from her but i thought it my duty to look as cold and severe as i could she did not seem to understand how it ought to be viewed but took it just as if she had a right to have a baby she said oh my god i thank thee oh i will be so good i had no patience with her then so i left the room who is with her mrs hughes she is not seeing the thing in a moral light as i should have expected mr benson was silent again after some time he began faith i don't see this affair quite as you do i believe i am right you surprise me brother i don't understand you wait a while i want to make my feelings very clear to you but i don't know where to begin or how to express myself it is indeed an extraordinary subject for us to have to talk about but if once i get clear of this girl i'll wash my hands of all such cases again her brother was not attending to her he was reducing his own ideas to form faith do you know i rejoice in this child's advent may god forgive you thurston if you know what you are saying but surely it is a temptation dear thurston i do not think it is a delusion the sin appears to me to be quite distinct from its consequences sophistry and a temptation said miss benson decidedly no it is not said her brother with equal decision in the eye of god she is exactly the same as if the life she had led had left no trace behind we knew her errors before faith yes but not this disgrace this badge of her shame faith faith let me beg of you not to speak so of the little innocent babe who may be god's messenger to lead her back to him think again of her first words the burst of nature from her heart did she not turn to god and enter into a covenant with him i will be so good why it draws her out of herself if her life has hitherto been self-seeking and wickedly thoughtless here is the very instrument to make her forget herself and be thoughtful for another teach her and god will teach her if man does not come between to reverence her child and this reverence will shut out sin will be purification he was very much excited he was even surprised at his own excitement 
but his thoughts and meditations through the long afternoon had prepared his mind for this manner of viewing the subject. "'These are quite new ideas to me,' said Miss Benson coldly. "'I think you, Thurston, are the first person I ever heard rejoicing over the birth of an illegitimate child. It appears to me I must own rather questionable morality. I do not rejoice. I have been all this afternoon mourning over the sin which has blighted this young creature. I have been dreading lest, as she recovered consciousness, there should be a return of her despair. I have been thinking of every holy word, every promise to the penitent, of the tenderness which led the Madeline aright. I have been feeling severely and reproachfully the timidity which has hitherto made me blink all encounter with evils of this particular kind. O oh, faith, once for all, do not accuse me of questionable morality, when I am trying more than ever I did in my life to act as my blessed Lord would have done. He was very much agitated. His sister hesitated and then she spoke more softly than before. But Thurston, everything might have been done to lead her right, as you call it, without this child, this miserable offspring of sin. The world has, indeed, made such children miserable, innocent as they are, but I doubt if this be according to the will of God, unless it is his punishment for the parent's guilt, and even then, the world's way of treatment is too apt to harden the mother's natural love into something like hatred. Shame and the terror of friends' displeasure turn her mad, defile her holiest instincts, and, as for the fathers, God forgive them, I cannot at least, not just now. Miss Benson thought on what her brother said. At length she asked, Thurston, remember I'm not convinced. How would you have this girl treated according to your theory? It will require some time and much Christian love to find out the best way. I know I'm not very wise, but the way I think it would be right to act in would be this. He thought for some time before he spoke, and then said, She has incurred a responsibility, that we both acknowledge. She is about to become a mother and have the direction and guidance of a little tender life. I fancy such responsibility must be serious and solemn enough without making it into a heavy and oppressive burden, so that human nature recalls from bearing it. While we do all we can to strengthen her sense of responsibility, I would likewise do all we can to make her feel that it is responsibility for what may become a blessing. "'Whether the children are legitimate or illegitimate?' asked Miss Benson dryly. "'Yes,' said her brother firmly. "'The more I think, the more I believe I am right. "'No one,' said he, blushing faintly as he spoke, "'can have a greater recoil from profligacy than I have. "'You yourself have not greater sorrow over this young creature's sin than I have.' The difference is this. You confuse the consequence with the sin. I don't understand metaphysics. I am not aware that I am talking metaphysics. I can imagine that, if the present occasion be taken rightly and used well, all that is good in her may be raised to a height unmeasured but by God. For while all that is evil and dark may, by his blessing, fade and disappear in the pure light of her child's presence. O oh, Father, listen to my prayer that her redemption may date from this time. Help us to speak to her in the loving spirit of thy holy Son. The tears were full in his eyes. He almost trembled in his earnestness. He was faint with the strong power of his own conviction, and with his inability to move his sister but she was shaken. She sat very still for a quarter of an hour or more while he leaned back, exhausted by his own feelings. "'The poor child,' said she at length, "'the poor, poor child, 
what it will have to struggle through and endure. Do you remember Thomas Wilkins and the way he threw the registry of his birth and baptism back in your face? Why, he would not have this situation. He went to sea and was drowned, rather than present the record of his shame. I do remember it all. It has often haunted me. She must strengthen her child to look to God, rather than to man's opinion. It will be the discipline, the penance she has incurred. She must teach it to be, humanly speaking, self-dependent. But after all, said Miss Benson, for she had known and esteemed poor Thomas Wilkins, and had mourned over his untimely death, and the recollection thereof softened her. After all, it might be concealed. The very child need never know its illegitimacy. How? asked her brother. Why, we know so little about her yet, but in that letter it said she had no friends. Now, could she not go into quite a fresh place and be passed off as a widow? Ah, tempter, unconscious tempter! Here was a way of evading the trials for the poor little unborn child of which Mr. Benson had never thought. It was the decision, the pivot, on which the fate of years moved, and he turned it the wrong way. But it was not for his own sake. For himself he was brave enough to tell the truth. For the little helpless baby about to enter a cruel biting world, he was tempted to evade the difficulty. He forgot what he had just said of the discipline and the penance to the mother consisting in strengthening her child to meet, trustfully and bravely, the consequences of her own weakness. He remembered more clearly the wild fierceness, the cane-like look of Thomas Wilkins, as the obnoxious word in the baptismal registry told him that he must go forth branded into the world with his hand against every man's and every man's against him. How could it be managed, Faith? Nay, I must know much more, which she alone can tell us, before I can see how it is to be managed. It is certainly the best plan. Perhaps it is, said her brother thoughtfully, but no longer clearly or decidedly, and so the conversation dropped. Ruth moved the bed-curtain aside in her soft manner when Miss Benson re-entered the room. She did not speak, but she looked at her as if she wished her to come near. Miss Benson went and stood by her. Ruth took her hand in hers and kissed it, as if fatigued even by this slight movement, she fell asleep. Miss Benson took up her work and thought over her brother's speeches. She was not convinced, but she was softened and bewildered. End of chapter 11Chapter 12 Losing Sight of the Welsh Mountains Miss Benson continued in an undecided state of mind for the two next days, but on the third, as they sat at breakfast, she began to speak to her brother. That young creature's name is Ruth Hilton. Indeed, how did you find it out? From herself, of course. She is much stronger. I slept with her last night, and I was aware she was awake long before I liked to speak. But at last I began. I don't know what I said or how it went on, but I think it was a little relief to her to tell me something about herself. She sobbed and cried to herself. I think she is asleep now. Tell me what she said about herself. Oh, it was really very little. It was evidently a most painful subject. She is an orphan without brother or sister, and with a guardian, whom, I think, she said, she never saw but once. He apprenticed her, after her father's death, to a dressmaker. This Mr. Bellingham got acquainted with her, and they used to meet on Sunday afternoons. One day they were late, lingering on the road. 
when the dressmaker came up by accident. She seems to have been very angry, and not unnaturally so. The girl took fright at her threats, and the lover persuaded her to go off with him to London, there and then. Last May, I think, it was. That's all. Did she express any sorrow for her error? No, not in words, but her voice was broken with sobs, though she tried to make it steady. After a while she began to talk about her baby, but shyly, and with much hesitation. She asked me how much I thought she could earn as a dressmaker, by working very, very hard, and that brought us round to her child. I thought of what you had said, Thurston, and I tried to speak to her as you wished me. I am not sure if it was right. I am doubtful in my own mind still. Don't be doubtful. Faith, dear Faith, I thank you for your kindness. There is really nothing to thank me for. It is almost impossible to help being kind to her. There is something so meek and gentle about her, so patient and so grateful. What does she think of doing? Poor child, she thinks of taking lodgings, very cheap ones, she says. There she means to work night and day to earn enough for her child. For she said to me, with such pretty earnestness, It must never know want. Whatever I do, I have deserved suffering, but it will be such a little innocent darling. Her utmost earnings would not be more than seven or eight shillings a week, I am afraid. And then she is so young and so pretty. There is that fifty pounds Mrs. Morgan brought me, and those two letters. Does she know about them yet? No, I did not like to tell her till she is a little stronger. Oh, Thurston, I wish there was not this prospect of a child. I cannot help it. I do. I could see a way in which we might help her, if it were not for that. How do you mean? Oh, it's no use thinking of it as it is, or else we might have taken her home with us and kept her till she had got a little dressmaking in the congregation. But for this meddlesome child, that spoils everything. You must let me grumble to you, Thurston. I was very good to her, and spoke as tenderly and respectfully of the little thing as if it were the Queen's, and born in lawful matrimony. That's right, my dear Faith. Grumble away to me, if you like. I'll forgive you for the kind thought of taking her home with us. But do you think her situation is an insuperable objection? Why, Thurston, it's so insuperable. It puts it quite out of the question. How? That's only repeating your objection. Why is it out of the question? If there had been no child coming, we might have called her by her right name. Miss Hilton, that's one thing. Then another is the baby in our house? Why, Sally would go distraught. Never mind, Sally, if she were an orphan relation of our own, left widowed, said he, pausing as if in doubt. You yourself suggested she should be considered as a widow for the child's sake. I am only taking up your ideas, dear Faith. I respect you for thinking of taking her home. It is just what we ought to do. Thank you for reminding me of my duty." Nay, it was only a passing thought. Think of Mr. Bradshaw. Oh, I tremble at the thought of his grim displeasure. We must think of a higher than Mr. Bradshaw. I own I should be a very coward if he knew. He is so severe, so inflexible. But after all, he sees so little of us. He never comes to tea, you know, but is always engaged when Mrs. Bradshaw comes. I don't think he knows of what our household consists. Not know Sally? Oh, yes, but he does. He asked Mrs. Bradshaw one day if she knew what wages we gave her, and said we might get a far more efficient and younger servant for the money. And, speaking about money, think what our expenses would be if we took her home for the next six months. That consideration was a puzzling one and both sat silent and perplexed for a time. Miss Benson was as sorrowful as her brother, for she was becoming as anxious as he was to find it possible that her plan could be carried out. "'There's the fifty pounds,' 
said he, with a sigh of reluctance at the idea. "'Yes, there's the fifty pounds,' echoed his sister, with the same sadness in her tone. "'I suppose it is hers.' "'I suppose it is, and being so, we must not think who gave it to her. It will defray her expenses. I am very sorry, but I think we must take it. It would never do to apply to him under the present circumstances, said Miss Benson, in a hesitating manner. No, that we won't, said her brother decisively. If she consents to let us take care of her, we will never let her stoop to request anything from him, even for his child. She can live on bread and water. We can all live on bread and water, rather than that. Then I will speak to her and propose the plan. Oh, Thurston, from a child you could persuade me to anything. I hope I am doing right. However much I oppose you at first, I am sure to yield soon, almost in proportion to my violence at first. I think I am very weak. No, not in this instance. We are both right. I in the way in which the child ought to be viewed. You, dear good faith, for thinking of taking her home with us. God bless you, dear, for it. When Ruth began to sit up, and the strange, new, delicious prospect of becoming a mother seemed to give her some mysterious source of strength, so that her recovery was rapid and swift from that time, Miss Benson brought her the letters and the bank note. "'Do you recollect receiving this letter, Ruth?' asked she, with grave gentleness. Ruth changed colour and took it and read it again, without making any reply to Miss Benson. Then she sighed and thought a while, and then took up and read the second note, the note which Mrs. Bellingham had sent to Mr. Benson in answer to his. After that she took up the bank-note and turned it round and round, but not as if she saw it. Miss Benson noticed that her fingers trembled sadly, and that her lips were quivering for some time before she spoke. "'If you please, Miss Benson, I should like to return this money. Why, my dear? I have a strong feeling against taking it. While he said she, deeply blushing and letting her large white lids drop down and veil her eyes, loved me. He gave me many things, my watch. Oh, many things, and I took them from him gladly and thankfully, because he loved me, for I would have given him anything, and I thought of them as signs of love. But this money pains my heart. He has left off loving me, and has gone away. This money seems... Oh, Miss Benson, it seems as if he could comfort me for being forsaken by money. And at that word the tears, so long kept back and repressed, forced their way like rain. She checked herself, however, in the violence of her emotion, for she thought of her child. So, will you take the trouble of sending it back to Mrs. Bellingham? that i will my dear i am glad of it that i am they don't deserve to have the power of giving they don't deserve that you should take it miss benson went and enclosed it up there and then simply writing these words in the envelope from ruth hilton and now we wash our hands of these bellinghams said she triumphantly but ruth looked tearful and sad not about returning the note, but from the conviction that the reason she had given for the ground of her determination was true. He no longer loved her. To cheer her, Miss Benson began to speak of the future. Miss Benson was one of those people who, the more she spoke of a plan in its details, and the more she realized it in her own mind, the more firmly she became a partisan of the project. Thus she grew warm and happy in the idea of taking Ruth home. But Ruth remained depressed and languid under the conviction that he no longer loved her. No home, no future, but the thought of her child could wean her from this sorrow. Miss Benson was a little piqued, and this pique 
showed itself afterwards in talking to her brother of the morning's proceedings in the sick chamber. I admired her at the time for sending away her fifty pounds so proudly, but I think she has a cold heart. She hardly thanked me at all for my proposal of taking her home with us. Her thoughts are full of other things just now, and people have such different ways of showing feeling, some by silence, some by words. At any rate, it is unwise to expect gratitude. What do you expect? Not indifference or ingratitude. It is better not to expect or calculate consequences. The longer I live, the more fully I see that. Let us try simply to do right actions, without thinking of the feelings they are to call out in others. We know that no holy or self-denying effort can fall to the ground vain and useless. But the sweep of eternity is large, and God alone knows when the effect is to be produced. We are trying to do right now, and to feel right. Don't let us perplex ourselves with endeavouring to map out how she should feel, or how she should show her feelings. That's all very fine, and I dare say very true, said Miss Benson, a little chagrined. But a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, and I would rather have one good hearty thank you now for all I have been planning to do for her, than the grand effects you promise me in the sweep of eternity. Don't be grave and sorrowful, Thurston, or I shall go out of the room. I can stand Sally's scoldings, but I can't bear your look of quiet depression whenever I am a little hasty or impatient. I had rather you would give me a good box on the ear. And I would often rather you would speak, if ever so hastily, instead of whistling. So, if I box your ears when I am vexed with you, will you promise to scold me when you are put out of the way, instead of whistling? Very well, that's a bargain. You box, and I scold. But seriously, I began to calculate our money when she so cavalierly sent off the fifty-pound note. I can't help admiring her for it and I am very much afraid we shall not have enough to pay the doctor's bill and take her home with us. She must go inside the coach, whatever we do, said Mr. Benson decidedly. Who's there? Come in. Oh, Mrs. Hughes, sit down. Indeed, sir, and I cannot stay, but the young lady has just made me find up her watch for her and asked me to get it sold to pay the doctor and the little things she has had since she came, and please, sir, indeed, I don't know where to sell it nearer than Carnarvon. That is good of her, said Miss Benson, her sense of justice satisfied, and, remembering the way in which Ruth had spoken of the watch, she felt what a sacrifice it must have been to resolve to part with it. And her goodness just helps us out of our dilemma, said her brother, who was unaware of the feelings with which Ruth regarded her watch, or, perhaps, he might have parted with his faciolati. Mrs. Hughes patiently awaited their leisure for answering her practical question. Where could the watch be sold? Suddenly her face brightened. Mr. Jones, the doctor, is just going to be married. Perhaps he would like nothing better than to give this pretty watch to his bride. Indeed, I think it very likely, and he'll pay money for it, as well as letting alone his bill. I'll ask him, sir, at any rate. Mr. Jones was only too glad to obtain possession of so elegant a present at so cheap a rate. He even, as Mrs. Hughes had foretold, paid money for it, more than was required to defray the expenses of Ruth's accommodation, as most of the articles of food she had had were paid for at the time by Mr. or Miss Benson, but they strictly forbade Mrs. Hughes to tell Ruth of this. "'Would you object to buying you a black gown?' said Miss Benson to her, the day after the sale of the watch. She hesitated a little, and then went on. "'My brother and I think it would be better to call you, as if in fact you were, a widow. It will save much awkwardness.' and it will spare your child much 
mortification she was going to have added but that word did not exactly do but at the mention of her child ruth started and turned ruby red as she always did when the allusion was made to it oh yes certainly thank you much for thinking of it indeed said she very low as if to herself i don't know how to thank you for all you are doing but i do love you and i will pray for you if i may if you may ruth repeated miss benson in a tone of surprise yes if i may if you will let me pray for you certainly my dear my dear ruth you don't know how often i sin i do so wrong with my few temptations we are both of us great sinners in the eyes of the most holy let us pray for each other don't speak so again my dear at least not to me miss benson was actually crying she had always looked upon herself as so inferior to her brother in real goodness had seen such heights above her that she was distressed by ruth's humility after a short time she resumed the subject then i may get you a black gown and we may call you mrs hilton no not mrs hilton said ruth hastily miss benson who had hitherto kept her eyes averted from ruth's face from a motive of kindly delicacy now looked at her with surprise why not asked she it was my mother's name said ruth in a low voice i had better not be called by it then let us call you by my mother's name said miss benson tenderly she would have but i'll talk to you about my mother some other time let me call you mrs denby it will do very well people will think you are a distant relation when she told mr benson of this choice of name he was rather sorry it was like his sister's impulsive kindness impulsive in everything and he could imagine how ruth's humility had touched her he was sorry but he said nothing and now the letter was written home announcing the probable arrival of the brother and sister on a certain day with a distant relation early left a widow as miss benson expressed it she desired the spare room might be prepared and made every provision she could think of for ruth's comfort for ruth still remained feeble and weak when the black gown at which she had stitched away incessantly was finished when nothing remained but to rest for the next day's journey ruth could not sit still she wandered from window to window learning off each rock and tree by heart each had its tale which it was agony to remember but which it would have been worse agony to forget the sound of running waters she had heard that quiet evening was in her ears as she lay on her deathbed so well had she learnt their tune and now all was over she had driven in to landu sitting by her lover's side living in the bright present and strangely forgetful of the past or the future she had dreamed out her dream and she had awakened from the vision of love she walked slowly and sadly down the long hill her tears fast falling but as quickly wiped away while she strove to make steady the low quivering voice which was often called upon to answer some remark of miss benson's they had to wait for the coach ruth buried her face in some flowers which mrs hughes had given her on parting and was startled when the mail drew up with a sudden pull which almost threw the horses on their haunches she was placed inside and the coach had set off again before she was fully aware that mr and miss benson were travelling on the outside but it was a relief to feel she might now cry without exciting their notice the shadow of a heavy thundercloud was on the valley but the little upland village church that showed the spot in which so much of her life was passed stood out clear in the sunshine she grudged the tears that blinded her as she gazed there was one passenger who tried after a while to comfort her 
don't cry miss said the kind-hearted woman you're parting from friends maybe well that's bad enough but when you come to my age you'll think none of it why i've three sons and they're soldiers and sailors all of them here there and everywhere one is in america beyond the seas another is in china making tea and another is at gibraltar three miles from spain and yet you see i can laugh and eat and enjoy myself i sometimes think i'll try and fret a bit just to make myself a better figure but lord it's no use it's against my nature so i laugh and grow fat again i'd be quite thankful for a fit of anxiety as would make me feel easy in my clothes which them manty makers will make so tight i'm fairly throttled ruth durst cry no more it was no relief now she was watched and noticed and plied with a sandwich or a gingerbread each time she looked sad she lay back with her eyes shut as if asleep and went on and on the sun never seeming to move from his high place in the sky nor the bright hot day to show the least sign of waning every now and then miss benson scrambled down and made kind inquiries of the pale weary ruth and once they changed coaches and the fat old lady left her with a hearty shake of the hand it is not much farther now said miss benson apologetically to ruth see we are losing sight of the welsh mountains we have about eighteen miles of plain and then we come to the moors and the rising ground amidst which eccleston lies i wish we were there for my brother is sadly tired the first wonder in ruth's mind was why then if mr benson was so tired did they not stop where they were for the night for she knew little of the expenses of a night at an inn the next thought was to beg that mr benson would take her place inside the coach and allow her to mount up by miss benson she proposed this and miss benson was evidently pleased well if you're not tired it would be a rest and a change for him to be sure and if you were by me i could show you the first sight of eccleston if we reach there before it is quite dark so mr benson got down and changed places with ruth she hardly yet understood the numerous small economies which he and his sister had to practice the little daily self-denials all endured so cheerfully and simply that they had almost ceased to require an effort and it had become natural to them to think of others before themselves ruth had not understood that it was for economy that their places had been taken on the outside of the coach while hers as an invalid requiring rest was to be the inside and that the biscuits which supplied the place of a dinner were in fact chosen because the difference in price between the two would go a little way towards fulfilling their plan for receiving her as an inmate her thought about money had been hitherto a child's thought the subject had never touched her but afterwards when she lived a little while with the bensons her eyes were opened and she remembered their simple kindness on the journey and treasured the remembrance of it in her heart a low grey cloud was the first sign of eccleston it was the smoke of the town hanging over the plain beyond the place where she was expected to believe it existed arose round waving uplands nothing to the fine outlines of the welsh mountains but still going up nearer to heaven than the rest of the flat world into which she had now entered rumbling stones lamp-posts a sudden stop and they were in the town of eccleston and a strange uncouth voice on the dark side of the coach was heard to say be ye there master yes yes said miss benson quickly did sally send you ben get the ostler's lantern and look out the luggage end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen the dissenting minister's household 
Miss Benson had resumed every morsel of the briskness which she had rather lost in the middle of the day. Her foot was on her native stones, and a very rough set they were, and she was near her home and among known people. Even Mr. Benson spoke very cheerfully to Ben, and made many inquiries of him respecting people whose names were strange to Ruth. She was cold and utterly weary. She took Miss Benson's offered arm, and could hardly drag herself as far as the little quiet street in which Mr. Benson's house was situated. The street was so quiet that their footsteps sounded like a loud disturbance, and announced their approach as effectually as the trumpet's lordly blare did the coming of Abdallah. A door flew open, and a lighted passage stood before them. As soon as they had entered, a stout elderly servant emerged from behind the door, her face radiant with welcome. "'Eh, bless ye, ye are back again. I thought I should have been lost without ye.' She gave Mr. Benson a hearty shake of the hand, and kissed Miss Benson warmly. Then, turning to Ruth, she said in a loud whisper, "'Who's yon?' Mr. Benson was silent, and walked a step onward. Miss Benson said boldly out, "'The lady I named in my note, Sally. Mrs. Denby, a distant relation.' "'Ay, but you said she was a widow. Is this chit a widow?' "'Yes, this is Mrs. Denby,' answered Miss Benson. "'If I'd have been her mother, I'd have given her a lollipop instead of a husband. Who looks fitter for it?' "'Hush, Sally, Sally. Look, there's your master trying to move that heavy box.' Miss Benson calculated well when she called Sally's attention to her master, for it was believed by everyone, and by Sally herself, that his deformity was owing to a fall he had when he was scarcely more than a baby, and entrusted to her care, a little nurse girl, as she then was, not many years older than himself. For years the poor girl had cried herself to sleep on her pallet bed, moaning over the blight her carelessness had brought upon her darling. Nor was this self-reproach diminished by the forgiveness of the gentle mother, from whom Thurston Benson derived so much of his character. The way in which comfort stole into Sally's heart was in the gradually formed resolution that she would never leave him nor forsake him, but serve him faithfully all her life long, and she had kept to her word. She loved Miss Benson, but she almost worshipped the brother. The reverence for him was in her heart, however, and did not always show itself in her manners. But if she scolded him herself, she allowed no one else that privilege. If Miss Benson differed from her brother, and ventured to think his sayings or doings might have been improved, Sally came down upon her like a thunderclap. "'My goodness gracious, Master Thurston! When will you learn to leave off meddling with other folks' business? Here, Ben, help me up with these trunks. The little narrow passage was cleared, and Miss Benson took Ruth into the sitting-room. There were only two sitting-rooms on the ground floor, one behind the other. Out of the back room the kitchen opened, and for this reason the back parlour was used as the family sitting-room, or else, being with its garden aspect so much the pleasanter of the two, both Sally and Miss Benson would have appropriated it for Mr. Benson's study. As it was, the front room, which looked to the street, was his room, and many a person coming for help, help of which giving money was the lowest kind, was admitted and let forth by Mr. Benson, unknown to any one else in the house. To make amends for his having the least cheerful room on the ground floor, he had the garden bedroom, while his sister slept over his study. There were two more rooms again over these, with sloping ceilings, though otherwise large and airy. The attic, looking into the garden, was the spare bedroom. 
while the front belonged to Sally. There was no room over the kitchen, which was, in fact, a supplement to the house. The sitting-room was called by the pretty old-fashioned name of the parlour, while Mr. Benson's room was styled the study. The curtains were drawn in the parlour. There was a bright fire and a clean hearth. Indeed, exquisite cleanliness seemed the very spirit of the household, for the door, which was open to the kitchen, showed a delicately white and spotless floor, and bright glittering tins, on which the ruddy firelight danced. From the place in which Ruth sat, she could see all Sally's movements, and though she was not conscious of close or minute observation at the time, her body being weary and her mind full of other thoughts, yet it was curious how faithfully that scene remained depicted on her memory in after years. The warm light filled every corner of the kitchen, in strong distinction to the faint illumination of the one candle in the parlour, whose radiance was confined and was lost in the dead folds of window curtains, carpet, and furniture. The square, stout, bustling figure, neat and clean in every respect, but dressed in the peculiar old-fashioned costume of the county, namely a dark-striped, linsey woolsey petticoat, made very short, displaying sturdy legs in woollen stockings beneath, a loose kind of jacket, called there a bedgown, made of pink print, a snow-white apron and cap, both of linen, and the latter made in the shape of a mutch. These articles completed Sally's costume, and were painted on Ruth's memory. Whilst Sally was busied in preparing tea, Miss Benson took off Ruth's things, and the latter instinctively felt that Sally, in the midst of her movements, was watching their proceedings. Occasionally she also put in a word hmm? in the conversation, and these little sentences were uttered quite in the tone of an equal, if not of a superior. She had dropped the more formal you, with which at first she had addressed Miss Benson, and vowed her quietly and habitually. All these particulars sank unconsciously into Ruth's mind, but they did not rise to the surface and become perceptible for a length of time. She was weary and much depressed. Even the very kindness that ministered to her was overpowering, but over the dark misty moor a little light shone, a beacon, and on that she fixed her eyes and struggled out of her present deep dejection the little child that was coming to her. Mr. Benson was as languid and weary as Ruth, and was silent during all this bustle and preparation. His silence was more grateful to Ruth than Miss Benson's many words, although she felt their kindness. After tea, Miss Benson took her upstairs to her room. The white dimity bed and the walls stained green had something of the colouring and purity of effect of a snowdrop, while the floor, rubbed with a mixture that turned it into a rich dark brown, suggested the idea of the garden mould out of which the snowdrop grows. As Miss Benson helped the pale Ruth to undress, her voice became less full-toned and hurried. The hush of approaching night subdued her into a softened, solemn kind of tenderness and the murmured blessing sounded like granted prayer. When Miss Benson came downstairs, she found her brother reading some letters which had been received during his absence. She went and softly shut the door of communication between the parlour and the kitchen, and then, fetching a grey worsted stocking which she was knitting, she sat down near him, her eyes not looking at her work, but fixed on the fire, while the eternal rapid click of the knitting-needles broke the silence of the room, with a sound as monotonous and incessant as the noise of a hand-loom. She expected him to speak, but he did not. She enjoyed an examination into, and discussion of, her feelings. It was an interest and amusement to her, 
while he dreaded and avoided all such conversation. There were times when his feelings, which were always earnest, and sometimes morbid, burst forth and defied control, and overwhelmed him, when a force was upon him, compelling him to speak, but he, in general, strove to preserve his composure from a fear of the compelling pain of such times, and the consequent exhaustion. His heart had been very full of Ruth all day long, and he was afraid of his sister beginning the subject, so he read on, or seemed to do so, though he hardly saw the letter he held before him. It was a great relief to him when Sally threw open the middle door with a bang, which did not indicate either calmness of mind or sweetness of temper. "'Is yon young woman going to stay any length of time with us?' she asked of Miss Benson. Mr. Benson put his hand gently on his sister's arm, to check her from making any reply, while he said, "'We cannot tell exactly, Sally. She will remain until after her confinement.' lord bless us and save us a baby in the house nay then my time's come and i'll pack up and be gone i never could abide them things i'd sooner have rats in the house sally really did look alarmed why sally said mr benson smiling i was not much more than a baby when you came to take care of me yes you were master thurston you were a fine bouncing lad of three year old and better then she remembered the change she had wrought in the fine bouncing lad and her eyes filled with tears which she was too proud to wipe away with her apron for as she sometimes said to herself she could not abide crying before folk well it's no use talking sally said miss benson too anxious to speak to be any longer repressed we've promised to keep her and we must do it you'll have none of the trouble sally so don't be afraid well i never as if i minded trouble you might have known me better nor that i've scoured master's room twice over just to make the boards look white though the carpet is to cover them and now you go and cast up about me minding my trouble if them's the fashions you've learned in wales i'm thankful i've never been there sally looked red indignant and really hurt mr benson came in with his musical voice and soft words of healing faith knows you don't care for trouble sally she is only anxious about this poor young woman who has no friends but ourselves we know there will be more trouble in consequences of her coming to stay with us and i think though we never spoke about it that in making our plans we reckoned on your kind help sally which has never failed us yet when we needed it you've twice the sense of your sister master thurston that you have boys always has it's truth there will be more trouble and i shall have my share on it i reckon i can face it if i'm told out and out but i cannot abide the way some folk has of denying there's a trouble or pain to be met just as if their saying there was none would do away with it some folk treats one like a baby and i don't like it i'm not meaning you master thurston no sally you need not say that i know well enough who you mean when you say some folk however i admit i was wrong in speaking as if you minded trouble for there never was a creature minded it less but i want you to like mrs denby said miss benson i dare say i should if you'd let me alone i did not like her sitting down in master's chair set her up indeed in an armchair with cushions wenches in my day were glad enough of stools she was tired to-night said mr benson we are all tired so if you have done your work sally come in to reading the three quiet people knelt down side by side and two of them prayed earnestly for them that has gone astray before ten o'clock the household were in bed ruth sleepless weary restless with the oppression of a sorrow which she dared not face and contemplate bravely kept awake all the early part of the night many a time did she rise and go to the long casement window and looked abroad over the still and quiet town over the grey stone walls and chimneys and old high-pointed roofs 
on to the far-away hilly line of the horizon, lying calm under the bright moonshine. It was late in the morning when she woke from her long-deferred slumbers, and when she went downstairs she found Mr. and Miss Benson awaiting her in the parlour. That homely, pretty, old-fashioned little room! How bright and still and clean it looked! The window, all the windows at the back of the house were casements, was open to let in the sweet morning air and the streaming eastern sunshine. The long jessamine sprays, with their white-scented stars, forced themselves almost into the room. The little square garden beyond, with grey stone walls all round, was rich and mellow in its autumnal colouring, running from deep crimson hollyhocks up to amber and gold nasturtiums, and all toned down by the clear and delicate air. It was so still that the gossamer webs laden with dew did not tremble or quiver in the least, but the sun was drawing to himself the sweet incense of many flowers, and the parlour was scented with the odours of mignonette and stocks. Miss Benson was arranging a bunch of china and damask roses in an old-fashioned jar. They lay, all dewy and fresh, on the white breakfast cloth when Ruth entered. Mr. Benson was reading in some large folio. With gentle morning speech they greeted her, but the quiet repose of the scene was instantly broken by Sally popping in from the kitchen and glancing at Ruth with sharp reproach. She said, "'I reckon I may bring in breakfast now,' with a strong emphasis on the last word. "'I am afraid I am very late,' said Ruth. "'Oh, never mind,' said Mr. Benson gently. It was our fault for not telling you our breakfast hour. We always have prayers at half-past seven, and for Sally's sake we never vary from that time, for she can so arrange her work, if she knows the hour of prayers, as to have her mind calm and untroubled. Ahem, said Miss Benson, rather inclined to testify against the invariable calmness of Sally's mind at any hour of the day but her brother went on as if he did not hear her. But the breakfast does not signify being delayed a little, and I am sure you were sadly tired with your long day yesterday. Sally came slapping in, and put down some withered, tough, dry toast with, It's not my doing, if it is like leather. But as no one appeared to hear her, she withdrew to her kitchen, leaving Ruth's cheeks like crimson at the annoyance she had caused. All day long she had that feeling common to those who go to stay at a fresh house among comparative strangers, a feeling of the necessity that she should become accustomed to the new atmosphere in which she was placed before she could move and act freely. It was indeed a purer ether, a diviner air, which she was breathing in now than what she had been accustomed to for long months the gentle, blessed mother, who had made her childhood's home holy ground, was in her very nature so far removed from any of earth's stains and temptation that she seemed truly one of those who ask not if thine eye be on them, who, in love and truth, where no misgiving is, rely upon the genial sense of youth. In the Benson's house there was the same unconsciousness of individual merit, the same absence of introspection and analysis of motive, as there had been in her mother, but it seemed that their lives were pure and good, not merely from a lovely and beautiful nature, but from some law, the obedience to which was, of itself, harmonious peace, and which governed them almost implicitly and with as little questioning on their part as the glorious stars which haste not rest not in their eternal obedience. This household had many failings, they were but human, and with all their loving desire to bring their lives into harmony with the will of God, they often erred and fell short, but somehow the very errors and faults of one individual served to call out higher excellence in another, 
and so they reacted upon each other, and the result of short discords, but they had themselves no idea of the real state of things, and they did not trouble themselves with marking their progress by self-examination. If Mr. Benson did something in hours of sick incapacity for exertion, turn inwards, it was to cry aloud with almost morbid despair, God be merciful to me a sinner. But he strove to leave his life in the hands of God, and to forget himself. Ruth sat still and quiet through the long first day. She was languid and weary from her journey. She was uncertain what help she might offer to give in the household duties, and what she might not. And, in her languor and in her uncertainty, it was pleasant to watch the new ways of the people among whom she was placed. After breakfast, Mr. Benson withdrew to his study. Miss Benson took away the cups and saucers, and, leaving the kitchen door open, talked sometimes to Ruth, sometimes to Sally while she washed them up. Sally had upstairs duties to perform, for which Ruth was thankful, as she kept receiving rather angry glances for her unpunctuality as long as Sally remained downstairs. Miss Benson assisted in the preparation for the early dinner and brought some kidney beans to shred into a basin of bright pure spring water, which caught and danced in the sunbeams as she sat near the open casement of the parlour, talking to Ruth of things and people which as yet the latter did not understand and could not arrange and comprehend. She was like a child who gets a few pieces of a dissected map and is confused until a glimpse of the whole unity is shown him. Mr. and Mrs. Bradshaw were the centerpieces in Ruth's map. Their children, their servants, were the accessories, and one or two other names were occasionally mentioned. Ruth wondered and almost wearied at Miss Benson's perseverance in talking to her about people whom she did not know, but in truth Miss Benson heard the long-drawn quivering sighs which came from the poor heavy past, and her quick accustomed ear caught also the low mutterings of thunder in the distance, in the shape of Sally's soliloquies, which, like the asides at a theatre, were intended to be heard. Suddenly Miss Benson called Ruth out of the room upstairs into her own bedchamber, and then began rummaging in little old-fashioned boxes drawn out of an equally old-fashioned bureau, half-desk, half-table, and holy drawers. "'My dear, I've been very stupid and thoughtless. Oh, I'm so glad I thought of it before Miss, Mrs. Bradshaw came to call. Here it is!' And she pulled out an old wedding ring and hurried it on Ruth's finger. Ruth hung down her head and reddened deep with shame. Her eyes smarted with the hot tears that filled them. Miss Benson talked on, in a nervous, hurried way. It was my grandmother's. It's very broad. They made them so then. To hold a posy inside, there's one in that. Thine own sweetheart, till death doth part. I think it is. There, there, run away, and look as if you'd always worn it. Ruth went up to her room and threw herself down on her knees by the bedside and cried as if her heart would break, and then, as if a light had come down into her soul, she calmed herself and prayed. No words can tell how humbly and with what earnest feeling. When she came down, she was tear-stained and wretchedly pale but even Sally looked at her with new eyes, because of the dignity with which she was invested by an earnestness of purpose which had her child for its object. She sat and thought, but she no longer heed those bitter sighs which had wrung Miss Benson's heart in the morning. In this way the day wore on. Early dinner, early tea, seemed to make it preternaturally long to Ruth. The only event was some unexplained absence of Sally's, who had disappeared out of the house in the evening, much to Miss Benson's surprise, and somewhat to her indignation. At night, after Ruth had gone up to her room, this absence was explained to her, at least. 
she had let down her long waving glossy hair and was standing absorbed in thought in the middle of the room when she heard a round clumping knock at her door different from that given by the small knuckles of delicate fingers and in walked sally with a judge-like severity of demeanour holding in her hand two widow's caps of commonest make and coarsest texture queen eleanor herself when she presented the bowl to fair rosamond had not a more relentless purpose stamped on her demeanour than had sally at this moment she walked up to the beautiful astonished ruth where she stood in her long soft white dressing-gown with all her luxuriant brown hair hanging dishevelled down her figure and thus sally spoke mrs or miss as the case may be i've my doubts as to you i'm not going to have my master and miss faith put upon or shame come near them widows wears these sorts of caps and has their hair cut off and whether widows wears wedding rings or not they shall have their hair cut off they shall i'll have no half work in this house i've lived with the family forty-nine year come michaelmas and i'll not see it disgraced by any one's fine long curls sit down and let me snip off your hair and let me see you sham decently in a widow's cap to-morrow or i'll leave the house what's come over miss faith as used to be as mim a lady as ever was to be taken by such as you i dunnot know here i sit down with ye and let me crop you she laid no light hand on ruth's shoulder and the latter partly intimidated by the old servant who had hitherto only turned her vixen lining to observation and partly because she was broken-spirited enough to be indifferent to the measure proposed quietly sat down sally produced the formidable pair of scissors that always hung at her side and began to cut in a merciless manner she expected some remonstrance or some opposition and had a torrent of words ready to flow forth at the least sign of rebellion but ruth was still and silent with meekly bowed head under the strange hands that were shearing her beautiful hair into the clipped shortness of a boy's long before she had finished sally had some slight misgivings as to the fancied necessity of her task but it was too late for half the curls were gone and the rest must now come off when she had done she lifted up ruth's face by placing her hand under the round white chin she gazed into the countenance expecting to read some anger there though it had not come out in words but she only met the large quiet eyes that looked at her with sad gentleness out of their finely hollowed orbits ruth's soft yet dignified submission touched sally with compunction though she did not choose to show the change in her feelings she tried to hide it indeed by stooping to pick up the long bright tresses and holding them up admiringly and letting them drop down and float on the air like the pendant branches of the weeping birch she said i thought we should have had some crying i did they're pretty curls enough you've not been so bad to let them be cut off neither you see master thurston is no wiser than a baby in some things and miss faith just lets him have his own way so it's all left to me to keep him out of scrapes i'll wish you a very good night i've heard many a one say as long hair was not wholesome good night but in a minute she popped her head into ruth's room once more you'll put on them caps to-morrow morning i'll make you a present on them sally had carried away the beautiful curls and now she could not find it in her heart to throw such lovely chestnut tresses away so she folded them up carefully in paper and placed them in a safe corner of her drawer end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen ruth's first sunday at eccleston ruth felt very shy when she came down at half-past seven the next morning in her widow's cap her smooth pale face with its oval untouched by time 
looked more young and childlike than ever, when contrasted with the headgear usually associated with ideas of age. She blushed very deeply as Mr. and Miss Benson showed the astonishment which they could not conceal in their looks. She said in a low voice to Miss Benson, "'Sally thought I'd better wear it.' Miss Benson made no reply, but was startled at the intelligence which she thought was conveyed in this speech of Sally's acquaintance with Ruth's real situation. She noticed Sally's looks particularly this morning. The manner in which the old servant treated Ruth had in it far more respect than there had been the day before, but there was a kind of satisfied way of braving out Miss Benson's glances which made the latter uncertain and uncomfortable. She followed her brother into his study. "'Do you know, Thurston, I am almost certain Sally suspects.' Mr. Benson sighed. That deception grieved him, and yet he thought he saw its necessity. "'What makes you think so?' asked he. "'Oh, many little things. It was her odd way of ducking her head about, as if to catch a good view of Ruth's left hand, that made me think of the wedding ring. And once, yesterday, when I thought I had made up quite a natural speech, and was saying how sad it was for so young a creature to be left a widow, she broke in with, "'Widow befard, in a very strange, contemptuous kind of manner. If she suspects, we had better tell her the truth at once. She will never rest till she finds it out, so we must make a virtue of necessity. Well, brother, you shall tell her, then, for I am sure I daren't. I don't mind doing the thing, since you talked to me that day, and since I have got to know Ruth. But I do mind all the clatter people will make about it. But Sally is not people. Oh, I see it must be done. She'll talk as much as all the other persons put together, so that's the reason I call her people. Shall I call her? For the house was too homely and primitive to have bells. Sally came, fully aware of what was now going to be told her, and determined not to help them out in telling their awkward secret, by understanding the nature of it before it was put into the plainest language. In every pause, when they hoped she had caught the meaning they were hinting at, she persisted in looking stupid and perplexed, and in saying, well, as if quite unenlightened as to the end of the story. When it was all complete and before her, she said honestly enough, "'It's just as I thought it was, and I think you may thank me for having had the sense to put her into widow's caps and clip off that bonny brown hair that was fitter for a bride in lawful matrimony than for such as her.' She took it very well, though. She was as quiet as a lamb, and I clipped her pretty roughly at first, I must say, though. If I had known who your visitor was, I'd have packed up my things and cleared myself out of the house before such as her came into it. As it's done, I suppose I must stand by you and help you through with it. I only hope I shan't lose my character, and me, a parish clerk's daughter." "'Oh, Sally, people know you too well to think any ill of you,' said Miss Benson, who was pleased to find the difficulty so easily got over. For, in truth, Sally had been much softened by the unresisting gentleness with which Ruth had submitted to the clipping of the night before. "'If I'd been with you, Master Thurston, I'd have seen sharp after you, for you're always picking up some one or other as nobody else would touch with a pair of tongues.' Why, there was that Nellie Brandon's child, as was left at our door. If I hadn't gone to the overseer, we should have had that Irish tramp's baby saddled on us for life. But I went off and told the overseer, and the mother was caught. Yes, said Mr. Benson sadly, and I often lie awake and wonder what is the fate of that poor little thing forced back on the mother who tried to get quit of it. I often doubt whether I did right. "'But it's no use thinking about it now.' "'I'm thankful it isn't,' said Sally. "'And now, if we've talked doctrine long enough, "'I'll make the beds. "'Yon girl's secret is safe enough for me.' "'Saying this, she left the room, "'and Miss Benson followed. 
she found Ruth busy washing the breakfast things, and they were done in so quiet and orderly a manner that neither Miss Benson nor Sally, both particular enough, had any of their little fancies or prejudices annoyed. She seemed to have an instinctive knowledge of the exact period when her help was likely to become a hindrance, and withdrew from the busy kitchen just at the right time. That afternoon, as Miss Benson and Ruth sat at their work, Mrs. and Miss Bradshaw called. Miss Benson was so nervous as to surprise Ruth, who did not understand the probable and possible questions which might be asked respecting any visitor at the minister's house. Ruth went on sewing, absorbed in her own thoughts, and glad that the conversation between the two elder ladies and the silence of the younger one, who sat at some distance from her, gave her an opportunity of retreating into the haunts of memory, and soon the work fell from her hands, and her eyes were fixed on the little garden beyond, but she did not see its flowers or its walls. She saw the mountains which girdled Landu. She saw the sunrise from behind their iron outline, just as it had done. How long ago was it? Was it months or was it years? Since she had watched the night through, crouched up at his door. Which was the dream and which the reality? That distant life or this? His moans rang more clearly in her ears than the buzzing of the conversation between Mrs. Bradshaw and Miss Benson. At length the subdued, scared-looking little lady and her bright-eyed silent daughter rose to take leave. Ruth started into the present, and stood up and curtsied, and turned sick at heart with sudden recollection. Miss Benson accompanied Mrs. Bradshaw to the door, and in the passage gave her a long explanation of Ruth's fictitious history. Mrs. Bradshaw looked so much interested and pleased that Miss Benson enlarged a little more than was necessary, and rounded off her invention with one or two imaginary details, which, she was quite unconscious, were overheard by her brother through the half-open study door. She was rather dismayed when he called her into his room after Mrs. Bradshaw's departure, and asked what she had been saying about Ruth. Oh, I thought it was better to explain it thoroughly. I mean, to tell the story we wish to have believed once for all. You know we agreed about that, Thurston, deprecatingly. Yes, but I heard you saying you believed her husband had been a young surgeon, did I not? Well, Thurston, you know he must have been something, and young surgeons are so in the way of dying, it seemed very natural. Besides, she said with a sudden boldness, I do think I've a talent for fiction. It is so pleasant to invent, to make the incidents dovetail together, and after all, if we are to tell a lie, we may as well do it thoroughly, or else it's of no use. A bungling lie would be worse than useless. And Thurston, it may be very wrong, but, I believe, I am afraid I enjoy not being fettered by truth. Don't look so grave. You know it is necessary if ever it was, to tell falsehoods now. And don't be angry with me, because I do it well. He was shading his eyes with his hand, and did not speak for some time. At last he said, If it were not for the child, I would tell all. But the world is so cruel. You don't know how this apparent necessity for falsehood pains me, Faith, or you would not invent all these details, which are so many additional lies. Well, well, I will restrain myself if I have to talk about Ruth again. But Mrs. Bradshaw will tell everyone who need to know. You don't wish me to contradict it, Thurston. Surely it was such a pretty, probable story. Faith, I hope God will forgive us if we are doing wrong. And pray, dear, don't add one unnecessary word that is not true. Another day elapsed, and then it was Sunday and the house seemed filled with a deep peace. Even Sally's movements were less hasty and abrupt. Mr. Benson 
seemed invested with a new dignity which made his bodily deformity be forgotten in his calm grave composure of spirit every trace of weekday occupation was put away the night before a bright new handsome tablecloth had been smoothed down over the table and the jars had been freshly filled with flowers sunday was a festival and a holy day in the house after the very early breakfast little feet pattered into mr benson's study for he had a class of boys a sort of domestic sunday school only that there was more talking between teachers and pupils than dry absolute lessons going on miss benson too had her little neat tippet maidens sitting with her in the parlour and she was far more particular in keeping them to their reading and spelling than her brother was with his boys sally too put in her word of instruction from the kitchen helping as she fancied though her assistance was often rather mal a propos for instance she called out to a little fat stupid roly-poly girl to whom miss benson was busy explaining the meaning of the word quadruped quadruped a thing with four legs jenny a chair is a quadruped child but miss benson had a deaf manner sometimes when her patience was not too severely tried and she put it on now ruth sat on a low hassock and coaxed the least of the little creatures to her and showed it pictures till it fell asleep in her arms and sent a thrill through her at the thought of the tiny darling who would lie on her breast before long and whom she would have to cherish and to shelter from the storms of the world and then she remembered that she was once white and sinless as the wee lassie who lay in her arms and she knew that she had gone astray by and by the children trooped away and miss benson summoned her to put on her things for chapel the chapel was up a narrow street or rather cul-de-sac close by it stood on the outskirts of the town almost in fields it was built about the time of matthew and philip henry when the dissenters were afraid of att attracting attention or observation and hid their places of worship in obscure and out-of-the-way parts of the town in which they were built accordingly it often happened as in the present case that the buildings looked as if they carried you back to a period a hundred and fifty years ago the chapel had a picturesque and old-world look for luckily the congregation had been too poor to rebuild it or new face it in george the third's time the staircase which led to the galleries were outside at each end of the building and the irregular roof and worn stone steps looked grey and stained by time and weather the grassy hillocks each with a little upright headstone were shaded by a grand old witch elm a lilac bush or two a white rose tree and a few laburnums all old and gnarled enough were planted round the chapel yard and the casement windows of the chapel were made of heavy leaded diamond-shaped panes almost covered with ivy, producing a green gloom, not without its solemnity, within. This ivy was the home of an infinite number of little birds, which twittered and warbled, till it might have been thought that they were emulous of the power of praise possessed by the human creatures within. With such earnest, long-drawn strains did this crowd of winged songsters rejoice and be glad in their beautiful gift of life the interior of the building was plain and simple as plain and simple could be when it was fitted up oak timber was much cheaper than it is now so the woodwork was all of that description but roughly hewed for the early builders had not much wealth to spare the walls were whitewashed and were recipients of the shadows of the beauty without on their white plains the tracery of the ivy might be seen now still now stirred by the sudden flight of some little bird 
the congregation consisted of here and there a farmer with his labourers who came down from the uplands beyond the town to worship where their fathers worshipped and who loved the place because they knew how much those fathers had suffered for it although they never troubled themselves with the reason why they left the parish church and of a few shopkeepers far more thoughtful and reasoning who were dissenters from conviction unmixed with old ancestral association and of one or two families of still higher worldly station with many poor who were drawn there by love for mr benson's character and by a feeling that the faith which made him what he was could not be far wrong for the base of the pyramid and with mr bradshaw for its apex the congregation stood complete the country people came in sleeking down their hair and treading with earnest attempts at noiseless lightness of step over the floor of the aisle and by and by when all were assembled mr benson followed unmarshalled and unattended when he had closed the pulpit door and knelt in prayer for an instant or two he gave out a psalm from the dear old scottish paraphrase with its primitive inversion of the simple perfect bible words and a kind of precentor stood up and having sounded the note on a pitch pipe sang a couple of lines by way of indicating the tune then all the congregation stood up and sang aloud mr bradshaw's great bass voice being half a note in advance of the others in accordance with his place of precedence as principal member of the congregation his powerful voice was like an organ very badly played and very much out of tune but as he had no ear and no diffidence it pleased him very much to hear the fine loud sound he was a tall large-boned iron man stern powerful and authoritative in appearance dressed in clothes of the finest broadcloth and scrupulously ill-made as if to show that he was indifferent to all outward things his wife was sweet and gentle-looking but as if she was thoroughly broken into submission ruth did not see this or hear aught but the words which were reverently oh how reverently spoken by mr benson he had had ruth present in his thoughts all the time he had been preparing for his sunday duty and he had tried carefully to eschew everything which she might feel as an allusion to her own case he remembered how the good shepherd in poussin's beautiful picture tenderly carried the lambs which had wearied themselves by going astray and felt how like tenderness was required towards poor ruth but where is the chapter which does not contain something which a broken and contrite spirit may not apply to itself and so it fell out that as he read ruth's heart was smitten and she sank down and down till she was kneeling on the floor of the pew and speaking to god in the spirit if not in the words of the prodigal son father i have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy child miss benson was thankful all although she loved ruth the better for this self-abandonment that the minister's seat was far in the shade of the gallery she tried to look most attentive to her brother in order that mr bradshaw might not suspect anything unusual while she stealthily took hold of ruth's passive hand as it lay helpless on the cushion and pressed it softly and tenderly but ruth sat on the ground bowed down and crushed in her sorrow till all was ended miss benson loitered in her seat divided between the consciousness that she as locum tenens for the minister's wife was expected to be at the door to receive the kind greetings of many after her absence from home and her unwillingness to disturb ruth who was evidently praying and by her quiet breathing receiving grave and solemn influences into her soul at length she rose up calm and composed even to dignity the chapel was still and empty 
but Miss Benson heard the buzz of voices in the chapel yard without. They were probably those of people waiting for her, and she summoned courage by taking Ruth's arm in hers and holding her hand affectionately. They went out into the broad daylight. As they issued forth, Miss Benson heard Mr. Bradshaw's strong bass voice speaking to her brother, and winced, as she knew he would be wincing, under the broad praise, which is impertinence, however little it may be intended or esteemed as such. "'Oh, yes, my wife told me yesterday about her. Her husband was a surgeon. My father was a surgeon, too, as I think you have heard very much to your credit, I must say, Mr. Benson, with your limited means, to burden yourself with a poor relation. Very creditable, indeed. Miss Benson glanced at Ruth. She either did not hear or did not understand, but passed on into the awful sphere of Mr. Bradshaw's observation unmoved. He was in a bland and condescending humour of universal approval, and when he saw Ruth, he nodded his head in token of satisfaction. That ordeal was over, Miss Benson thought, and in the thought rejoiced. "'After dinner you must go and lie down, my dear,' said she, untying Ruth's bonnet strings and kissing her. "'Sally goes to church again, but you won't mind staying alone in the house. I am sorry we have so many people to dinner, but my brother will always have enough on Sundays for any old or weak people.' who may have come from a distance, to stay and dine with us, and to-day they all seem to have come, because it is his first Sabbath at home. In this way Ruth's first Sunday passed over. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 Mother and Child – "'Here is a parcel for you, Ruth,' said Miss Benson on the Tuesday morning. "'For me?' said Ruth, all sorts of rushing thoughts and hopes filling her mind, and turning her dizzy with expectation. If it had been from him, the newborn resolutions would have had a hard struggle for existence. "'It is directed, Mrs. Denby,' said Miss Benson, before giving it up. It is in Mrs. Bradshaw's handwriting, and, far more curious than Ruth, she awaited the untying of the close-knotted string. When the paper was opened, it displayed a whole piece of delicate cambric muslin, and there was a short note from Mrs. Bradshaw to Ruth, saying her husband had wished her to send this muslin in aid of any preparations Mrs. Denby might have to make. Ruth said nothing, but coloured up, and sat down again to her employment. "'Very fine muslin, indeed,' said Miss Benson, feeling it, and holding it up against the light, with the air of a connoisseur. Yet all the time she was glancing at Ruth's grave face. The latter kept silence, and showed no wish to inspect her present further. At last she said in a low voice, I suppose I may send it back again. My dear child, send it back to Mr. Bradshaw? You'd offend him for life. You may depend on it. He meant it as a mark of high favour. What right had he to send it me? asked Ruth, still in her quiet voice. What right? Mr. Bradshaw thinks. I don't know exactly what you mean by right. Ruth was silent for a moment and then said, there are people to whom I love to feel that I owe gratitude, gratitude which I cannot express and had better not talk about, but I cannot see why a person whom I do not know should lay me under an obligation. Oh, don't say I must take this muslin. Please, Miss Benson. What Miss Benson might have said if her brother had not just then entered the room, neither he nor any other person could tell but she felt his presence was most opportune, and called him in as umpire. He had come hastily, for he had much to do, but he no sooner heard the case than he sat down and tried to draw some more explicit declaration of her feeling from Ruth, who had remained silent during Miss Benson's explanation. 
"'You would rather send this present back?' said he. "'Yes,' she answered softly. "'Is it wrong? "'Why do you want to return it?' "'Because I feel as if Mr. Bradshaw had no right to offer it to me.' Mr. Benson was silent. "'It's beautifully fine,' said Miss Benson, still examining the piece. "'You think that it is a right which must be earned?' "'Yes,' said she, after a minute's pause. "'Don't you?' "'I understand what you mean. It is a delight to have gifts made to you by those to whom you esteem and love, because then such gifts are merely to be considered as fringes to the garment, as inconsiderable additions to the mighty treasure of their affection, adding a grace, but no additional value, to what before was precious, and proceeding as naturally out of that as leaves burgeon out upon the tree. But you feel it to be different when there is no regard for the giver to idealize the gift, when it simply takes its stand among your property as so much money's value. Is this it, Ruth? I think it is. I never reasoned why I felt as I did. I only knew that Mr. Bradshaw's giving me a present hurt me, instead of making me glad. Well, but there is another side of the case we have not looked at yet. We must think of that, too. You know who said, Do unto others as ye would that they should do unto you. Mr. Bradshaw may not have had that in his mind when he desired his wife to send you this. He may have been self-seeking, and only anxious to gratify his love of patronizing. That is the worst motive we can give him. And what would be no excuse for your thinking only of yourself and returning his present? But you would not have me pretend to be obliged, asked Ruth. No, I would not. I have often been similarly situated to you, Ruth. Mr. Bradshaw has frequently opposed me on the points on which I feel the warmest, am the most earnestly convinced. He, no doubt, thinks me quixotic, and often speaks of me and to me with great contempt when he is angry. I suppose he has a little fit of penitence afterwards, or perhaps he thinks he can pay for ungracious speeches by a present. So, formerly, he invariably sent me something after these occasions. It was a time, of all others, to feel as you are doing now but I became convinced it would be right to accept them, giving only the very cool thanks which I felt. This omission of all show of much gratitude had the best effect. The presents have much diminished, but if the gifts have lessened, the unjustifiable speeches have decreased in still greater proportion, and I am sure we respect each other more. Take this muslin, Ruth." for the reason I named, and thank him as your feelings prompt you. Overstrained expressions of gratitude always seem like an endeavour to place the receiver of these expressions in the position of debtor for future favours. But you won't fall into this error. Ruth listened to Mr. Benson, but she had not yet fallen sufficiently into the tone of his mind to understand him fully. She only felt that he comprehended her better than Miss Benson, who once more tried to reconcile her to her present by calling her attention to the length and breadth thereof. "'I will do what you wish me,' she said, after a little pause of thoughtfulness. "'May we talk of something else?' Mr. Benson saw that his sister's frame of mind was not particularly congenial with Ruth's, any more than Ruth's was with Miss Benson's, and putting aside all thought of returning to the business which had appeared to him so important when he came to the room, but which principally related to himself, he remained above an hour in the parlour, interesting them on subjects far removed from the present, and left them at the end of that time soothed and calm. But the present gave a new current to Ruth's ideas. Her heart was as yet too sore to speak, but her mind was crowded with plans. 
she asked Sally to buy her, with the money produced by the sale of a ring or two, the coarsest linen, the homeliest dark blue print, and similar materials, on which she set busily to work to make clothes for herself, and as they were made she put them on, and as she put them on she gave a grace to each, which such homely material and simply shaping had never had before. Then the fine linen and delicate soft white muslin, which she had chosen in preference to more expensive articles of dress when Mr. Bellingham had given her carte blanche in London, were cut into small garments, most daintily stitched and made ready for the little creature, for whom in its white purity of soul nothing could be too precious. The love which dictated this extreme simplicity and coarseness of attire was taken for stiff, hard economy by Mr. Bradshaw when he deigned to observe it, and economy by itself, without any soul or spirit in it to make it living and holy, was a great merit in his eyes. Indeed, Ruth altogether found favour with him. Her quiet manner, subdued by an internal consciousness of a deeper cause for sorrow than he was aware of, he interpreted into a very proper and becoming awe of him. He looked off from his own prayers to observe how well she attended to hers at chapel. When he came to any verse in the hymn relating to immortality or a future life, he sung it unusually loud, thinking he should thus comfort her in her sorrow for her deceased husband. He desired Mrs. Bradshaw to pay her every attention she could, and even once remarked that he thought her so respectable a young person that he should not object to her being asked to tea the next time Mr. and Miss Benson came. He added that he thought, indeed, Benson had looked last Sunday as if he rather hoped to get an invitation and it was right to encourage the ministers, and to show them respect, even though their salaries were small. The only thing against this Mrs. Denby was the circumstance of her having married too early, and without any provision for a family, though Ruth pleaded delicacy of health, and declined accompanying Mr. and Miss Benson on their visit to Mr. Bradshaw, she still preserved her place in his esteem and Miss Benson had to call a little upon her talent for fiction, to spare Ruth from the infliction of further presents, in making which his love of patronizing delighted. The yellow and crimson leaves came floating down on the still October air. November followed, bleak and dreary. It was more cheerful when the earth put on her beautiful robe of white, which covered up all the grey naked stems, and loaded the leaves of the hollies and evergreens, each with its burden of feathery snow. When Ruth sat down to languor and sadness, Miss Benson trotted upstairs, and rummaged up every article of spare or worn-out clothing, bringing down a variety of strange materials. She tried to interest Ruth in making them up into garments for the poor. But, though Ruth's fingers flew through the work, she still sighed with thought and remembrance. Miss Benson was at first disappointed, and then she was angry, when she heard the low, long sigh, and saw the dreamy eyes filling with glittering tears, she would say, "'What is the matter, Ruth?' in a half-reproachful tone for the sight of suffering was painful to her. She had done all in her power to remedy it, and though she acknowledged a cause beyond her reach for Ruth's deep sorrow, and in fact loved and respected her all the more for these manifestations of grief, yet at the time they irritated her. Then Ruth would snatch up the dropped work and stitch away with drooping eyes, from which the hot tears fell fast, and Miss Benson was then angry with herself, not yet at all inclined to agree with Sally when she asked her mistress why she kept mithering the poor lass with asking her for ever what was the matter, 
as if she did not know well enough. Some element of harmony was wanting, some little angel of peace, in loving whom all hearts and natures should be drawn together, and their discords hushed. The earth was still hiding her guilty front with innocent snow when a little baby was laid by the side of the pale white mother. It was a boy. Beforehand she had wished for a girl, as being less likely to feel the want of a father, as being what a mother, worse than widowed, could most effectually shelter. But now she did not think or remember this. What it was she would not have exchanged for a wilderness of girls. It was her own, her darling, her individual baby, already, though not an hour old, separate and sole in her heart, strangely filling up its measure with love and peace and even hope. For here was a new, pure, beautiful, innocent life, which she fondly imagined, in that early passion of maternal love, she could guard from every touch of corrupting sin by ever watchful and most tender care and her mother had thought the same most probably and thousands of others think the same and pray to god to purify and cleanse their souls that they may be fit guardians for their little children oh how ruth prayed even while she was yet too weak to speak and how she felt the beauty and significance of the words our father she was roused from this holy abstraction by the sound of miss benson's voice it was very much as if she had been crying. "'Look, Ruth,' it said softly, "'my brother sends you these. They are the first snowdrops in the garden.' And she put them on the pillow by Ruth. The baby lay on the opposite side. "'Won't you look at him?' said Ruth. "'He is so pretty.' Miss Benson had a strange reluctance to see him. To Ruth, in spite of all that had come and gone, she was reconciled, nay more she was deeply attached but over the baby there hung a cloud of shame and disgrace poor little creature her heart was closed against it firmly as she thought but she could not resist ruth's low faint voice nor her pleading eyes and she went round to peep at him as he lay on his mother's arm as yet his shield and guard "'Sally says he will have black hair, she thinks,' said Ruth. "'His little hand is quite a man's already. "'Just feel how firmly he closes it.' "'And with her own weak fingers she opened his little red fist, "'and taking Miss Benson's reluctant hand, "'placed one of her fingers in his grasp. "'That baby touch called out her love. "'The doors of her heart were thrown open wide "'for the little infant to go in and take possession.' "'Ah, my darling,' said Ruth, falling back, weak and weary, "'if God will but spare you to me, never mother did more than I will. "'I have done you a grievous wrong, but, if I may live, I will spend my life in serving you.' "'And in serving God,' said Miss Benson, with tears in her eyes. "'You must not make him into an idol, or God will, perhaps, punish you through him.' A pang of a fright shot through Ruth's heart at these words. Had she already sinned and made her child into an idol, and was their punishment already in store for her through him? But then the internal voice whispered that God was our Father, and that He knew our frame, and knew how natural was the first outburst of a mother's love. So although she treasured up the warning, she ceased to affright herself for what had already gushed forth. "'Now go to sleep, Ruth,' said Miss Benson, kissing her and darkening the room. But Ruth could not sleep. If her heavy eyes closed, she opened them again with a start, for sleep seemed to be an enemy, stealing from her the consciousness of being a mother. That one thought excluded all remembrance and all anticipation in those first hours of delight. But soon remembrance and anticipation came. There was the natural want of the person who alone could take an interest similar in kind, though not in amount, to the mother's, 
and sadness grew like a giant in the still watches of the night when she remembered that there would be no father to guide and strengthen the child and place him in a favorable position for fighting the hard battle of life she hoped and believed that no one would know the sin of his parents and that the struggle might be spared to him but a father's powerful care and mighty guidance would never be his and then in those hours of spiritual purification came the wonder and the doubt of how far the real father would be the one to whom with her desire of heaven for her child whatever might become of herself she would wish to entrust him slight speeches telling of a selfish worldly nature unnoticed at the time came back upon her ear having a new significance they told of a low standard of impatient self-indulgence of no acknowledgment of things spiritual and heavenly even while this examination was forced upon her by the new spirit of maternity that had entered into her and made her child's welfare supreme she hated and reproached herself for the necessity there seemed upon her of examining and judging the absent father of her child and so the compelling presence that had taken possession of her wearied her into a kind of feverish slumber in which she dreamed that the innocent babe that lay by her side in soft ruddy slumber had started up into man's growth and instead of the pure and noble being whom she had prayed to present as her child to our father in heaven he was a repetition of his father and like him lured some maiden who in her dream seemed strangely like herself only more utterly sad and desolate even than she into sin and left her there to even worse a fate than that of suicide for ruth believed there was a worse she dreamt she saw the girl wandering lost and that she saw her son in high places prosperous but with more than blood on his soul she saw her son dragged down by the clinging girl into some pit of horrors into which she dared not look but from whence his father's voice was heard crying aloud that in his day and generation he had not remembered the words of god and that now he was tormented in this flame then she started in sick terror and saw by the dim rushlight sally nodding in an armchair by the fire and felt her soft little warm babe nestled up against her breast rocked by her heart which yet beat hard from the effects of the evil dream she dared not go to sleep again but prayed and every time she prayed she asked with a more complete wisdom and a more utter and self-forgetting faith little child thy angel was with god and drew her nearer and nearer to him whose face is continually beheld by the angels of little children end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen sally tells of her sweethearts and discourses on the duties of life sally and miss benson took it in turns to sit up or rather they took it in turns to nod by the fire for if ruth was awake she lay very still in the moonlight calm of her sick bed that time resembled a beautiful august evening such as i have seen the white snowy rolling mist covers up under its great sheet all trees and meadows and tokens of earth but it cannot rise high enough to shut out the heavens which on such nights seem bending very near and to be the only real and present objects and so near so real and present did heaven and eternity 
and God seemed to Ruth, as she lay encircling her mysterious holy child. One night Sally found out she was not asleep. "'I'm a rare hand at talking folks to sleep,' said she. "'I'll try on thee, for thou must get strength by sleeping and eating. "'What must I talk to thee about, I wonder? "'Shall I tell thee a love story or a fairy story, "'such as I've told Master Thurston many a time and many a time, "'for all his father set his face again, fairies, and called it vain talking?' Or shall I tell you the dinner I once cooked when Mr. Harding, as was Miss Faith's sweetheart, came unlooked for, and we gnawed in the house but a neck of mutton, out of which I made seven dishes, all with a different name? Who was Mr. Harding? asked Ruth. Oh, he was a grand gentleman from London, as had seen Miss Faith, and had been struck by her pretty looks when she was out on a visit, and came here to ask her to marry him. She said no, she would never leave Master Thurston, as could never marry. But she pined a deal after he went away. She kept up afore Master Thurston, but I seed her fretting, though I never let on that I did, for I thought she'd soonest get over it and be thankful at after she'd be the strength to do right. However, I've no business af to be talking of Miss Benson's concern. I'll tell you of my own sweethearts and welcome, or I'll tell you of the dinner, which was the grandest thing I ever did in my life. But I thought a Londoner should never think country folks knew nothing. And my word, I puzzled him with his dinner. I'm doubting whether to this day he knows whether what he was eating was fish, flesh, or fowl. Shall I tell you how I managed? But Ruth said she would rather hear about Sally's sweethearts, much to the disappointment of the latter, who considered the dinner by far the greatest achievement. Well, you see, I don't know as I should call them sweethearts, for excepting John Rawson, who was shut up in a madhouse the next week, I never had what you may call a downright offer of marriage but once. But I had once, and so I may say I had a sweetheart. I was beginning to be afeard, though, for one likes to be axed, that's but civility, and I remember, after I had turned forty, and afore Jeremiah Dixon had spoken, I began to think John Rawson had perhaps not been so very mad, and that I'd done ill to lightly his offer as a madam's, if it was to be the only one I was ever to have. And I don't mean as I'd have had him, but I thought, if it was to come o'er again, I'd speak respectful of him to folk and say it were only his way to go about on all fours, but that he was a sensible man in most things. However, I'd had my laugh, and so had others, at my crazy lover, and it was late now to set him up as a Solomon. However, I thought it would be no bad thing to be tried again, but I little thought the trial would come when it did. You see, Saturday night is a leisure night in counting-houses and such-like places, while it's the busiest of all for servants. Well, it was a Saturday night, and I'd my bay's apron on, and the tails of my bedgown pinned together behind, down on my knees, pipe-claying the kitchen, when a knock comes to the back door. Come in, says I, but it knocked again, as if it were too stately to open the door for itself. So I got up rather cross and opened the door, and there stood Jerry Dixon, Mr. Holt's head clerk, only he was not head clerk then. So I stood, stopping up the door, fancying he wanted to speak to Master, but he kind of pushed past me, and telling me somewhat about the weather, as if I could not see it for myself, he took a chair and sat down by the oven. Cool and easy, thought I meaning his self, not his place, which I knew must be pretty hot. Well, it seemed no use standing waiting for my gentleman to go. Not that he had much to say either. But he kept twirling his hat round and round, and smoothing the nap on it with the back of his hand. So at last I squatted down to my work, and thinks I, I shall be on my knees all ready if he puts up a prayer for I knew he was a Methody by bringing up, and he had only lately turned to Master's ways of thinking. 
and them methodies are terrible hands at unexpected prayers when one least looks for em i can't say i like their way of taking one by surprise as it were but then i'm parish clerk's daughter and could never demean myself to dissenting fashions always save and accept master thurston's bless him however i've been caught once or twice unawares so this time i thought i'd be up to it and i moved a dry duster whenever i went to kneel upon in case he began when i were in a wet place by and by i thought if the man would pray it would be a blessing for it would prevent his sending his eyes after me wherever i went for when they takes to praying they shuts their eyes and quivers the lids in a queer kind of way them dissenters does i can speak pretty plain to you for you're bred in the church like myself and must find it out o the way as i do to be among dissenting folk god forbid i should speak disrespectful of master thurston and miss faith though i never think on them as church or dissenters but just as christians but to come back to jerry first i tried always to be cleaning at his back but when he wheeled round so as always to face me i thought i'd try a different game so i says master dixon i ax your pardon but i must pipe clay under your chair will you please to move well he moved and by and by i was at him again with the same words and at after that again and again till he were always moving about with his chair behind him like a snail as carries its house on its back and the great gaupus never seed that i was pipe claying the same places twice over at last i got desperate cross he were so in my way so i made two big crosses on the tails of his brown coat for you see wherever he went up or down he drew out the tails of his coat from under him and stuck them through the bars of the chair and flesh and blood could not resist pipe claying them for him and a pretty brushing he'd have i reckon to get it off again well at length he clears his throat uncommon loud so i spreads my duster and shuts my eyes all ready but when naught comed of it i opened my eyes a little bit to see what he were about my word if there he wasn't down on his knees right facing me staring as hard as he could well i thought it would be hard work to stand that if he made a long ado so i shut my eyes again and tried to think serious as became what i fancied were coming but forgive me but i thought why couldn't the fellow go in and pray with master thurston as had always a calm spirit ready for prayer instead of me who had my dresser to scour let alone an apron to iron at last he says says he sally will you oblige me with your hand so i thought it were maybe methody fashion to pray hand in hand and i'll not deny but i wished i'd washed it better after black letting the kitchen fire i thought i'd better tell him it were not so clean as i could wish so i says master dixon you shall have it and welcome if i may just go and wash em first but says he my dear sally dirty or clean it's all the same to me seeing i'm only speaking in a figuring way what i'm asking on my bended knees is that you'd please to be so kind as to be my wedded wife week after next will suit me if it's agreeable to you my word i were up on my feet in an instant it were odd now weren't it i never thought of taking the fellow and getting married for all i'll not deny i had been thinking it would be agreeable to be axed but all at once i couldn't abide the chap sir says i trying to look shamefaced as became the occasion but for all that feeling a twittering round my mouth that i were afeard might end in a laugh master dixon i'm obliged to you for the compliment and thank ye all the same but i think i prefer a single life he looked mighty taken aback but in a minute he cleared up and was as sweet as ever he still kept on his knees and i wished he'd take himself up but i reckon he thought it would give force to his words says he think again my dear sally i've a four-roomed house and furniture conformable and eighty pound a year you may never have such chance again there were truth enough in that 
but it was not pretty in the man to say it, and it put me up a bit. As for that, neither you nor I can tell, Master Dixon, you're not the first chap as I've had down on his knees afore me, asking me to marry him. You see, I was thinking of John Rawson, only I thought there were no need to say he were on all fours. It were truth, he were on his knees, you know. And maybe you'll not be the last. Anyhow, I've no wish to change my condition just now. I'll wait till Christmas, says he. I've a pig as will be ready for killing then, so I must get married before that. Well, now, would you believe it? The pig was a temptation. I'd a receipt for curing hams, as Miss Faith would never let me try, saying the old way were good enough. However, I resisted. Says I, very stern, because I felt I'd been wavering. Master Dixon, once for all, pig or no pig, I'll not marry you. And if you'll take my advice, you'll get up off your knees. The flags is but damp yet, and it would be an awkward thing to have rheumatiz just before winter. With that he got up, stiff enough. He looked as sulky a chap as ever I clapped eyes on. And as he were so black and cross, I thought I'd done well, whatever came of the pig, to say no to him. You may live to repent this, says he very red. But I'll not be hard upon ye. I'll give you another chance. I'll let you have the night to think about it, and I'll call in to hear your second thoughts after chapel to-morrow. Well, now, did ever you hear the like? But that is the way with all of them men, thinking so much of their selves, and that it's but ask and have. They've never had me, though, and I shall be sixty-one next Martinmas so there's not much time left for them to try me, I reckon. Well, when Jeremiah said that he put me up more than ever, and I says my first thoughts, second thoughts, and third thoughts is all one and the same, you've but tempted me once, and that was when you spoke of your pig. But of yourself you're nothing to boast on, and so I'll bid you good night, and I'll keep my manners, or else, if I told the truth, I should say it had been a great loss of time listening to you. But I'll be civil, so good night. He never said a word, but went off as black as thunder, slamming the door after him. The master called me into prayers, but I can't say a c I could put my mind to them, for my heart was beating so. However, it was a comfort to have had an offer of holy matrimony and though it flustered me, it made me think more of myself. In the night I began to wonder if I'd not been cruel and hard to him. You see, I were feverish-like, and the old song of Barbary Allen would keep running in my head, and I thought I were Barbary, and he were young Jemmy Gray, and that maybe he'd die for love of me, and I pictured him to myself, lying on his deathbed, with his face turned to the wall, with deadly sorrow sighing, and I could have pinched myself for having been so like cruel Barbary Allen. And when I got up next day I found it hard to think on the real Jerry Dixon I had seen the night before, apart from the sad and sorrowful Jerry I thought on a-dying, when I were between sleeping and waking. And for many a day I turned sick when I heard the passing bell, for I thought it were the bell loud knelling which were to break my heart with a sense of what I'd missed in saying no to Jerry, and so idling him with cruelty. But in less than a three-week I heard parish bells a-ringing merrily for a wedding, and in the course of the morning someone says to me, Hark, how the bells is ringing for Jerry Dixon's wedding! And all on a sudden he changed back again from a heartbroken young fellow like Jemmy Gray into a stout, middle-aged man, ruddy-complexioned, with a wart on his left cheek like life. Sally waited for some exclamation at the conclusion of her tale, but receiving none, she stepped softly to the bedside, and there lay Ruth, peaceful as death, with her baby on her breast. I thought I'd lost some of my gifts if I could not talk a body to sleep, said Sally, 
in a satisfied and self-complacent tone. Youth is strong and powerful, and makes a hard battle against sorrow. So Ruth strove and strengthened, and her baby flourished accordingly, and before the little celandines were out on the hedge-banks, or the white violets had sent forth their fragrance from the border under the south wall of Miss Benson's small garden, Ruth was able to carry her baby into that sheltered place on sunny days. She often wished to thank Mr. Benson and his sister, but she did not know how to tell the deep gratitude she felt, and therefore she was silent, but they understood her silence well. One day, as she watched her sleeping child, she spoke to Miss Benson, with whom she happened to be alone. "'Do you know of any cottage where the people are clean and where they would not mind taking me in?' asked she. "'Taking you in? What do you mean?' said Miss Benson, dropping her knitting, in order to observe Ruth more closely. "'I mean,' said Ruth, "'where I might lodge with my baby. Any very poor place would do, only it must be clean, or he might be ill.' "'And what in the world do you want to go and lodge in a cottage for?' asked Miss Benson indignantly. Ruth did not lift up her eyes, but she spoke with a firmness which showed that she had considered the subject. "'I think I could make dresses. I know I did not learn as much as I might, but perhaps I might do for servants and people who are not particular.' "'Servants are as particular as anyone,' said Miss Benson, glad to lay hold of the first objection that she could. "'Well, somebody who would be patient with me,' said Ruth. "'Nobody is patient over an ill-fitting gown,' put in Miss Benson. "'There's the stuff spoilt, and what not.' "'Perhaps I could find plain work to do,' said Ruth very meekly. "'That I could do very well. Mamma taught me, and I like to learn from her. "'If you would be so good, Miss Benson, you might tell people that I could do plain work very neatly and punctually and cheaply.' "'You'd get sixpence a day, perhaps,' said Miss Benson. "'And who would take care of baby, I should like to know? "'Prettily he'd be neglected, would he not?' why he'd have the croup and the typhus fever in no time and be burnt to ashes after i have thought of all look how he sleeps hush darling for just at this point he began to cry and to show his determination to be awake as if in contradiction to his mother's words ruth took him up and carried him about the room while she went on speaking yes just now i know he will not sleep but very often he will, and in the night he always does. And so you'd work in the night and kill yourself and leave your poor baby an orphan? Ruth, I'm ashamed of you. Now, brother, Mr. Benson had just come in. Is this not too bad of Ruth? Here she is planning to go away and leave us, just as we, as I, at least, have grown so fond of baby, and he's beginning to know me. Where were you thinking of going to, Ruth? interrupted Mr. Benson with mild surprise anywhere to be near you and miss benson in any poor cottage where i might lodge very cheaply and earn my livelihood by taking in plain sewing and perhaps a little dressmaking and where i could come and see you and dear miss benson sometimes and bring baby if he were not dead before then of some fever or burn or scald poor neglected child or you had not worked yourself to death with never sleeping said miss benson Mr. Benson thought a minute or two, and then he spoke to Ruth. "'Whatever you may do when this little fellow is a year old, and able to dispense with some of a mother's care, let me beg you, Ruth, as a favour to me, and a still greater favour to my sister. Is it not, Faith?' "'Yes, you may put it so, if you like. To stay with us,' continued he, "'till then. When baby is twelve months old, we'll talk about it again.' and very likely before then some opening may be shown us. Never fear leading an idle life, Ruth. We'll treat you as a daughter, and set you all the household tasks, and it is not for your sake that we ask you to stay, but for this little dumb helpless child's, and it is not for our sake that you must stay, but for his. Ruth was sobbing. I do not deserve your kindness, said she in a broken voice. I do not deserve it. Her tears fell fast and soft like summer rain, but no further word was spoken. 
Mr. Benson quietly passed on to make the inquiry for which he had entered the room. But when there was nothing to decide upon, and no necessity for entering upon any new course of action, Ruth's mind relaxed from its strung-up state. She fell into trains of reverie and mournful, regretful recollections which rendered her languid and tearful. This was noticed both by Miss Benson and Sally, and, as each had kind sympathies, and felt depressed when they saw any one near them depressed, and as each, without much reasoning, on the cause or reason for such depression, felt irritated at the uncomfortable state into which they themselves were thrown, they both resolved to speak to Ruth on the next fitting occasion. Accordingly, one afternoon, the morning of that day had been spent by Ruth in housework, for she had insisted on Mr. Benson's words, and had taken Miss Benson's share of the more active and fatiguing household duties, but she went through them heavily, and as if her heart was far away. In the afternoon, when she was nursing her child, Sally, on coming into the back parlour, found her there alone, and easily detected the fact she was crying. "'Where's Miss Benson?' asked Sally gruffly. "'Gone out with Mr. Benson,' answered Ruth, with an absent sadness in her voice and manner. Her tears, scarce checked while she spoke, began to fall afresh, and as Sally stood and gazed, she saw the babe look back in his mother's face, and his little lip begin to quiver, and his open blue eye to grow overclouded as with some mysterious sympathy, with a sorrowful face bent over him. Ruth took him briskly from his mother's arms. Ruth looked up in grave surprise, for in truth she had forgotten Sally's presence, and the suddenness of the motion startled her. Bonny boy, are they letting the salt tears drop on thy sweet face before thou art weaned? Little somebody knows how to be a mother. I could make a better myself. Dance, Thumpkin, dance, dance, ye merry men, every one. Ay, that's it. Smile, my pretty. Any one but a child like thee, continued she, turning to Ruth, would have known better than to bring ill luck on thy baby by letting tears fall on its face before it was weaned. But thou art not fit to have a baby, and so I've said many a time, I've a great mind to buy thee a doll and take thy baby myself. Sally did not look at Ruth, for she was too engaged in amusing the baby with the tassel of the string to the window-blind, or else she would have seen the dignity which the mother's soul put into Ruth at that moment. Sally was quelled into silence by the gentle composure, the self-command over her passionate sorrow, which gave to Ruth an unconscious grandeur of demeanour as she came up to the old servant. Give him back to me, please. I did not know it brought ill luck, or if my heart broke, I would not have let a tear drop on his face. I never will again. Thank you, Sally, as the servant relinquished him to her who came in the name of a mother. Sally watched Ruth's grave, sweet smile as she followed up Sally's play with the tassel, and imitated with all the docility inspired by love every movement and sound which had amused her babe. "'Thou'lt be a mother after all,' said Sally, with a kind of admiration of the control which Ruth was exercising over herself. "'But why talk of heart-breaking? I don't question thee about what's past and gone, but now thou'rt wanting for nothing, nor thy child either. The time to come is the Lord's, and in his hands.' and yet thou goest about a-sighing and a-moaning in a way that I can't stand or thole. "'What do I do wrong?' said Ruth. "'I try to do all I can.' "'Yes, in a way,' said Sally, puzzled to know how to describe her meaning. "'Thou dost it, but there's a right and a wrong way of setting about everything, and to my thinking the right way is to take a thing up heartily, if it is only making a bed. Why, dear, ah, me!' 
making a bed may be done after a christian fashion i take it or else what's to come of such as me in heaven who've had little enough time on earth for clapping ourselves down on our knees for set prayers when i was a girl and wretched enough about master thurston and the crook on his back which came of the fall i gave him i took to praying and sighing and giving up the world and i thought it were wicked to care for the flesh so i made heavy puddings and was careless about dinner and the rooms and thought i was doing my duty though i did call myself a miserable sinner but one night the old missus master thurston's mother came in and sat down by me as i was scolding myself without thinking of what i was saying and says she sally what are you blaming yourself about and groaning over we hear you in the parlour every night and it makes my heart ache oh ma'am says i i'm a miserable sinner and i'm travailing in the new birth was that the reason says she why the pudding was so heavy to-day oh ma'am ma'am said i if you would not think of the things of the flesh but trouble yourself about your immortal soul and i sat a shaking my head to think about her soul but says she in her sweet dropping voice i do try to think of my soul every hour of the day if by that you mean trying to do the will of god but we'll talk now about the pudding master thurston could not eat it and i know you'll be sorry for that well i was sorry but i didn't choose to say so as she seemed to expect me so i says it's a pity to see children brought up to care for things of the flesh and then i could have bitten my tongue out for the missus looked so grave and i thought of my darling little lad pining for his want of his food at last says she sally do you think god has put us into the world just to be selfish and do nothing but see after our own souls or to help one another with heart and hand as christ did to all who wanted help i was silent for you see she puzzled me so she went on what is that beautiful answer in your church catechism sally i was pleased to hear a dissenter as i did not think would have done it speak so knowledgeably about the catechism and she went on to do my duty in that station of life unto which it shall please god to call me well your station is a servant and it is as honourable as a king's if you look at it right and you are to help and serve others in one way just as a king is to help others in another now what way are you to help and serve or to do your duty in that station in life unto which it has pleased god to call you did it answer god's purpose and serve him when the food was unfit for a child to eat and unwholesome for any one well i would not give it up i was so pig-headed about my soul so says i i wish folks would be content with locusts and wild honey and leave other folks in peace to work out their salvation and i groaned out pretty loud to think of missus's soul i often think since she smiled a bit at me but she said well sally to-morrow you shall have time to work out your salvation but as we have no locusts in england and i don't think they'd agree with master thurston if we had i will come and make the pudding but i shall try to do it well not only for him to like it because everything may be done in a right way or a wrong the right way is to do it as well as we can as in god's sight the wrong is to do it in a self-seeking spirit which either leads us to neglect it to follow out some device of our own for our own ends or to give up too much time and thought to it both before and after the doing well i thought of old missus's words this morning when i saw you making the beds you sighed so you could not half shake the pillows your heart was not in your work and yet it was the duty god had set you i reckon i know it's not the work parsons preach about though i don't think they go so far off the mark when they read whatsoever thy hand findeth to do that do with all thy might just try for a day to think of all the odd jobs as to be done well and truly in god's sight not just slurred over anyhow and you'll go through them twice as cheerfully and have no thought to spare for sighing or crying sally bustled off 
to set on the kettle for tea and felt half ashamed in the quiet of the kitchen to think of the oration she had made in the parlour but she saw with much satisfaction that henceforward ruth nursed her boy with a vigour and cheerfulness that were reflected back from him and the household work was no longer performed with a languid indifference as if life and duty were distasteful miss benson had her share in this improvement though sally placidly took all the credit to herself one day as she and ruth sat together miss benson spoke of the child and thence went on to talk about her own childhood by degrees they spoke of education and the book learning that forms one part of it and the result was that ruth determined to get up early all through the bright summer mornings to acquire the knowledge hereafter to be given her child her mind was uncultivated by reading scant beyond the mere mechanical arts of education she knew nothing but she had a refined taste and excellent sense and judgment to separate the true from the false with these qualities she set to work under mr benson's directions she read in the early morning the books that he had marked out she trained herself with strict perseverance to do all thoroughly she did not attempt to acquire any foreign language although her ambition was to learn latin in order to teach it to her boy those summer mornings were happy for she was learning neither to look backwards nor forwards but to live faithfully and earnestly in the present she rose while the hedge sparrow was yet singing his revel to his mate she dressed and opened her window shading the soft blowing air and the sunny eastern light from her baby if she grew tired she went and looked at him and all her thoughts were holy prayers for him then she would gaze a while out of the high upper window on to the moorlands that swelled in waves one behind the other in the grey cool morning light these were her occasional relaxations and after them she returned with strength to her work End of chapter 16chapter 17 leonard's christening in that body of dissenters to which mr benson belonged it is not considered necessary to baptize infants as early as the ceremony can be performed and many circumstances concurred to cause the solemn thanksgiving and dedication of the child for so these dissenters looked upon christenings to be deferred until it was probably somewhere about six months old there had been many conversations in the little sitting-room between the brother and sister and their protege which had consisted of questions betraying a thoughtful wondering kind of ignorance on the part of ruth and answers more suggestive than explanatory from mr benson while miss benson kept up a kind of running commentary always simple and often quaint but with that intuition into the very heart of all things truly religious which is often the gift of those who seem at first sight to be only affectionate and sensible when mr benson had explained his own view of what a christening ought to be considered and by calling out ruth's latent feelings into pious earnestness brought her into a right frame of mind he felt that he had done what he could to make the ceremony more than a mere form and to invest it quiet humble and obscure as it must necessarily be in outward shape mournful and anxious as many of its antecedents had rendered it with the severe grandeur of an act done in faith and truth it was not far to carry the little one for as i said the chapel almost adjoined the minister's house 
the whole procession was to have consisted of mr and miss benson ruth carrying her babe and sally who felt herself as a church of england woman to be condescending and kind in requesting leave to attend a baptism among them dissenters but unless she had asked permission she would not have been desired to attend so careful was the habit of her master and mistress that she should be allowed that freedom which they claimed for themselves but they were glad she wished to go they liked the feeling that all were of one household and that the interests of one were the interests of all it produced a consequence however which they did not anticipate sally was full of the event which her presence was to sanction and as it were to redeem from the character of being utterly schismatic she spoke about it with an air of patronage to three or four and among them to some of the servants at mr bradshaw's miss benson was rather surprised to receive a call from jemima bradshaw on the very morning of the day on which little leonard was to be baptized miss bradshaw was rosy and breathless with eagerness although the second in the family she had been at school when her younger sisters had been christened and she was now come in the full warmth of a girl's fancy to ask if she might be present at the afternoon service she had been struck with mrs denby's grace and beauty at the very first sight when she had accompanied her mother to call upon the bensons on their return from wales and had kept up an enthusiastic interest in the widow only a little older than herself whose very reserve and retirement but added to her unconscious power of enchantment oh miss benson i never saw a christening papa says i may go if you think mr benson and mrs denby would not dislike it and i will be quite quiet and sit up behind the door or anywhere and that sweet little baby i should so like to see him christened is he to be called leonard did you say after mr denby is it no not exactly said miss benson rather discomfited was not mr denby's name leonard then mamma thought it would be sure to be called after him and so did i but i may come to the christening may i not dear miss benson miss benson gave her consent with a little inward reluctance both her brother and ruth shared in this feeling although no one expressed it and it was presently forgotten jemima stood grave and quiet in the old-fashioned vestry adjoining the chapel as they entered with steps subdued to slowness she thought ruth looked so pale and awed because she was left a solitary parent but ruth came to the presence of god as one who has gone astray and doubted her own worthiness to be called his child she came as a mother who had incurred a heavy responsibility and who entreated his almighty aid to enable her to discharge it full of passionate yearning love which craved for more faith in god to still her distrust and fear of the future that might hang over her darling when she thought of her boy she sickened and trembled but when she heard of god's loving kindness far beyond all tender mother's love she was hushed into peace and prayer there she stood her fair pale cheek resting on her baby's head as he slumbered on her bosom her eyes went slanting down under their half-closed white lids but their gaze was not on the primitive cottage-like room it was earnestly fixed on a dim mist through which she fain would have seen the life that lay before her child but the mist was still and dense too thick a veil for anxious human love to penetrate the future was hid with god mr benson stood right under the casement window that was placed high up in the room he was almost in shade 
except for one or two marked lights which fell on hair already silvery white his voice was always low and musical when he spoke to few it was too weak to speak so as to be heard by many without becoming harsh and strange but now it filled the little room with a loving sound like the stock dove's brooding murmur over her young he and ruth forgot all in their earnestness of thought and when he said let us pray and the little congregation knelt down you might have heard the baby's faint breathing scarcely sighing out upon the stillness so absorbed were all in the solemnity but the prayer was long thought followed thought and fear crowded upon fear and all were to be laid bare before god and his aid and counsel asked before the end sally had shuffled quietly out of the vestry into the green chapel yard upon which the door opened miss benson was alive to this movement and so full of curiosity as to what it might mean that she could no longer attend to her brother and felt inclined to rush off and question sally the moment all was ended miss bradshaw hung about the babe and ruth and begged to be allowed to carry the child home but ruth pressed him to her as if there was no safe harbour for him but in his mother's breast mr benson saw her feeling and caught miss bradshaw's look of disappointment come home with us said he and stay to tea you have never drunk tea with us since you went to school i wish i might said miss bradshaw colouring with pleasure but i must ask papa may i run home and ask to be sure my dear jemima flew off and fortunately her father was at home for her mother's permission would have been deemed insufficient she received many directions about her behaviour take no sugar in your tea jemima i am sure the bensons ought not to be able to afford sugar with their means and do not eat much you can have plenty at home on your return remember mrs denby's keep must cost them a great deal so jemima returned considerably sobered and very much afraid of her hunger leading her to forget mr benson's poverty meanwhile miss benson and sally acquainted with mr benson's invitation to jemima set about making some capital tea-cakes on which they piqued themselves they both enjoyed the offices of hospitality and were glad to place some home-made tempting dainty before their guests what made you leave the chapel vestry before my brother had ended inquired miss benson indeed ma'am i thought the master had prayed so long he'd be droughty so i just slipped out to put on the kettle for tea miss benson was on the point of reprimanding her for thinking of anything besides the object of the prayer when she remembered how she herself had been unable to attend after sally's departure for wondering what had become of her so she was silent it was a disappointment to miss benson's kind and hospitable expectation when jemima as hungry as a hound confined herself to one piece of the cake which her hostess had had such pleasure in making and jemima wished she had not a prophetic feeling all tea-time of the manner in which her father would inquire into the particulars of the meal elevating his eyebrows at every viand named beyond plain bread and butter and winding up with some such sentence as this well i marvel how with benson's salary he can afford to keep such a table sally could have told of self-denial when no one was by when the left hand did not know what the right hand did on the part of both her master and mistress practised without thinking even to themselves that it was either a sacrifice or a virtue in order to enable them to help those who were in need or even to gratify miss benson's kind old-fashioned feelings on such occasion as the present when a stranger came to the house her homely affectionate pleasure 
in making others comfortable, might have shown that such little occasional extravagances were not waste, but a good work, and were not to be gauged by the standard of money-spending this evening her spirits were damped by jemima's refusal to eat poor jemima the cakes were so good and she was so hungry but still she refused while sally was clearing away the tea-things miss benson and jemima accompanied ruth upstairs when she went to put the little leonard to bed a christening is a very solemn service said miss bradshaw I had no idea it was so solemn. Mr. Benson seemed to speak as if he had a weight of care on his heart that God alone could relieve or lighten. "'My brother feels these things very much,' said Miss Benson, rather wishing to cut short the conversation, for she had been aware of several parts in the prayer which she knew were suggested by the peculiarity and sadness of the case before him. I could not quite follow him all through, continued Jemima. What did he mean by saying, This child, rebuked by the world and bidden to stand apart, thou wilt not rebuke, but wilt suffer it to come to thee and be blessed with thine almighty blessing? Why is this little darling to be rebuked? I do not think I remember the exact words, but he said something like that. "'My dear, your gown is dripping wet. It must have dipped into the tub. Let me wring it out.' "'Oh, thank you. Never mind my gown,' said Jemima hastily, and wanting to return to her question. But just then she caught the sight of tears falling fast down the cheeks of the silent Ruth as she bent over her child, crowing and splashing away in his tub with a sudden consciousness that unwittingly she had touched on some painful chord, Jemima rushed into another subject, and was eagerly seconded by Miss Benson. The circumstance seemed to die away and leave no trace, but in after years it rose, vivid and significant, before Jemima's memory. At present it was enough for her, if Mrs. Denby would let her serve her in every possible way. Her admiration for beauty was keen and little indulged at home, and Ruth was very beautiful in her quiet mournfulness. Her mean and homely dress left herself only the more open to admiration, for she gave it a charm by her unconscious wearing of it that made it seem like the drapery of an old Greek statue, subordinate to the figure it covered yet imbued by it with an unspeakable grace. Then the pretended circumstances of her life were such as to catch the imagination of a young romantic girl. Altogether Jemima could have kissed her hand and professed herself Ruth's slave. She moved away all the articles used at this little coucher. She folded up Leonard's day clothes she felt only too much honoured when ruth trusted him to her for a few minutes only too amply rewarded when ruth thanked her with a grave sweet smile and a grateful look of her loving eyes when jemima had gone away with the servant who was sent to fetch her there was a little chorus of praise she's a warm-hearted girl said miss benson she remembers all the old days before she went to school. She is worth two of Mr. Richard. They're each of them just the same as they were when they were children, when they broke that window in the chapel, and he ran away home, and she came knocking at our door with a single knock, just like a beggar's, and I went to see who it was, and she was quite startled to see her round, brown honest face looking up at me half frightened and telling me what she had done and offering me the money in her savings bank to pay for it we never should have heard of master richard's share in the business if it had not been for sally but remember said miss benson how strict mr bradshaw has always been with his children it is no wonder if poor richard was a coward in those days he is now, or I'm much mistaken, 
answered Miss Benson. And Mr. Bradshaw was just as strict with Jemima, and she's no coward. But I've no faith in Richard. He has a look about him that I don't like. And when Mr. Bradshaw was away on business in Holland last year, for those months my young gentleman did not come hall as regularly to chapel, and I always believe that story of his being seen out with his hounds at Smithley's. Those are neither of them great offences in a young man of twenty, said Mr. Benson, smiling. No, I don't mind them in themselves, but when he could change back so easily to being regular and mim when his father came home, I don't like that. Leonard shall never be afraid of me, said Ruth, following her own train of thought. I will be his friend from the very first, and I will try and learn how to be a wise friend, and you will teach me, won't you, sir? What made you wish to call him Leonard, Ruth? asked Miss Benson. It was my mother's father's name, and she used to tell me about him and his goodness, and I thought if Leonard could be like him. Do you remember the discussion there was about Miss Bradshaw's name, Thurston, her father wanting her to be called Hepzibah, but insisting that she was to have a scripture name at any rate, and Mrs. Bradshaw wanting her to be called Juliana after some novel she had read not long before? and at last Jemima was fixed upon, because it would do either for a scripture name or a name for a heroine out of a book. "'I did not know Jemima was a scripture name,' said Ruth. "'Oh, yes, it is. One of Job's daughters, Jemima, Kezia, and Karen Huppock. There are a good many Jemimas in the world, and some Kezias, but I never heard of a Karen Huppock and yet we know just as much of one as of another. People really like a pretty name, whether in scripture or out of it, when there is no particular association with the name, said Mr. Benson. Now, I was called Faith after the cardinal virtue, and I like my name, though many people would think it too Puritan. That was according to our gentle mother's pious desire and Thurston was called by his name because father wished it, for, although he was what people called a radical and a democrat in his ways of thinking and talking, he was very proud in his heart of being descended from old Sir Thurston, who figured away in the French wars. The difference between theory and practice, thinking and being, put in Mr. Benson, who was in a mood for allowing himself a little social enjoyment. He leaned back in his chair, with his eyes looking at, but not seeing, the ceiling. Miss Benson was clicking away with her eternal knitting needles, looking at her brother, and seeing him too. Ruth was arranging her child's clothes against the morrow. It was but their usual way of spending an evening. The variety was given by the different tone which the conversation assumed on the different nights. Yet somehow the peacefulness of the time, the window open into the little garden, the scents that came stealing in, and the clear summer heaven above, made the time be remembered as a happy festival by Ruth. Even Sally seemed more placid than usual when she came into prayers and she and Miss Benson followed Ruth to her bedroom to look at the beautiful sleeping Leonard. "'God bless him,' said Miss Benson, stooping down to kiss his little dimpled hand, which lay outside the coverlet, tossed abroad in the heat of the evening. "'Now, don't get up too early, Ruth. Injuring your health will be short-sighted wisdom and poor economy. Good night.' "'Good night, dear Miss Benson. Good night, Sally.' When Ruth had shut her door, she went again to the bed and looked at her boy till her eyes filled with tears. "'God bless thee, darling. I only ask to be one of his instruments, and not thrown aside as useless, or worse than useless.' So ended the day of Leonard's christening. Mr. Benson had sometimes taught the children of different people as an especial favour when requested by them. 
but then his pupils were only children, and by their progress he was little prepared for Ruth's. She had had early teaching of that kind which need never be unlearned from her mother, enough to unfold many of her powers. They had remained inactive now for several years, but had grown strong in the dark and quiet time. Her tutor was surprised at the bounds by which she surmounted obstacles, the quick perception and ready adaptation of truths and first principles, and her immediate sense of the fitness of things. Her delight in what was strong and beautiful called out her master's sympathy, but, most of all, he admired the complete unconsciousness of uncommon power or unusual progress. It was less of a wonder than he considered it to be, it is true, for she never thought of comparing what she was now with her former self, much less with another. Indeed, she did not think of herself at all, but of her boy, and what she must learn in order to teach him to be and to do as suited her hope and her prayer. If any one's devotion could have flattered her into self-consciousness, it was Jemima's. Mr. Bradshaw never dreamed that his daughter could feel herself inferior to the minister's protege, but so it was, and no knight-errant of old could consider himself more honoured by his lady's commands than did Jemima, if Ruth allowed her to do anything for her or for the boy. Ruth loved her heartily, even while she was rather annoyed at the open expression Jemima used of admiration. Please, I really would rather not be told if people do think me pretty. But it was not merely beautiful, it was sweet-looking and good, Miss Postlewaith called you, replied Jemima. All the more I would rather not hear it. I may be pretty, but I know I am not good. Besides, I don't think we ought to hear what is said of us behind our backs. Ruth spoke so gravely that Jemima feared lest she was displeased. Dear Mrs. Denby, I will never admire or praise you again. Only let me love you. And let me love you, said Ruth with a tender kiss. Jemima would not have been allowed to come so frequently if Mr. Bradshaw had not been possessed with the idea of patronizing Ruth. If the latter had chosen, she might have gone dressed from head to foot in the presents which he wished to make her, but she refused them constantly, occasionally to Miss Benson's great annoyance. But if he could not load her with gifts, he could show his approbation by asking her to his house, and after some deliberation she consented to accompany Mr. and Miss Benson there. The house was square and massy-looking, with a great deal of drab colour about the furniture. Mrs. Bradshaw, in her lackadaisical sweet-tempered way, seconded her husband in his desire of being kind to Ruth, and as she cherished privately a great taste for what was beautiful or interesting, as opposed to her husband's love of the purely useful, this taste of hers had rarely had so healthy and true a mode of gratification as when she watched Ruth's movements about the room, which seemed in its obtrusiveness and poverty of colour to receive the requisite ornament of light and splendour from Ruth's presence. Mrs. Bradshaw sighed and wished she had a daughter as lovely about whom to weave a romance, for castle-building, after the manner of the Minerva press, was the outlet by which she escaped from the pressure of her prosaic life as Mr. Bradshaw's wife. Her perception was only of external beauty, and she was not always alive to that, or she might have seen how a warm, affectionate, ardent nature, free from all envy or cocking care of self, gave an unspeakable charm to her plain, bright-faced daughter Jemima, whose dark eyes kept challenging admiration for her friend. The first evening spent at Mr. Bradshaw's passed like many succeeding visits there. There was tea, 
the equipage for which was as handsome and as ugly as money could purchase then the ladies produced their sewing while mr bradshaw stood before the fire and gave the assembled party the benefit of his opinions on many subjects the opinions were as good and excellent as the opinions of any man can be who sees one side of a case very strongly and almost ignores the other they coincided in many points with those held by mr benson but he once or twice interposed with a plea for those who might differ and then he was heard by mr bradshaw with a kind of evident and indulgent pity such as one feels for a child who unwittingly talks nonsense by and by mrs bradshaw and miss benson fell into one tete-a-tete and ruth and jemima into another two well-behaved but unnaturally quiet children were sent to bed early in the evening in an authoritative voice by their father because one of them had spoken too loud while he was enlarging on an alteration in the tariff just before the supper tray was brought in a gentleman was announced whom ruth had never previously seen but who appeared well known to the rest of the party it was mr farquhar mr bradshaw's partner he had been on the continent for the last year and had only recently returned he seemed perfectly at home but spoke little he leaned back in his chair screwed up his eyes and watched everybody yet there was nothing unpleasant or unpertinent in his keenness of observation ruth wondered to hear him contradict mr bradshaw and almost expected some rebuff but mr bradshaw if he did not yield the point admitted for the first time that evening that it was possible something might be said on the other side mr farquhar differed also from mr benson but it was in a more respectful manner than mr bradshaw had done for these reasons although mr farquhar had never spoken to ruth she came away with the impression that he was a man to be respected and perhaps liked sally would have thought herself mightily aggrieved if on their return she had not heard some account of the evening as soon as miss benson came in the old servant began well and who was there and what did they give you for supper only mr farquhar besides ourselves and sandwiches sponge cake and wine there was no occasion for anything more replied miss benson who was tired and preparing to go upstairs mr farquhar why do they say he's thinking of miss jemima nonsense sally why he's old enough to be her father said miss benson halfway up the first flight there's no need for it to be called nonsense though he may be ten years older muttered sally retreating towards the kitchen bradshaw's betsy knows what she's about and wouldn't have said it for nothing ruth wondered a little about it she loved jemima well enough to be interested in what related to her but after thinking for a few minutes she decided that such a marriage was and would ever be very unlikely end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen ruth becomes a governess in mr bradshaw's family one afternoon not long after this mr and miss benson set off to call upon a farmer who attended the chapel but lived at some distance from the town they intended to stay to tea if they were invited and ruth and sally were left to spend a long afternoon together at first sally was busy in her kitchen and ruth employed herself in carrying her baby out into the garden it was now nearly a year since she came to the bensons it seemed like yesterday and yet as if a lifetime had gone between the flowers were budding now that were all in bloom when she came down on the first autumnal morning into the sunny parlour 
the yellow jessamine that was then a tender plant had now taken firm root in the soil and was sending out strong roots the wallflowers which miss benson had sown on the wall a day or two after her arrival were scenting the air with their fragrant flowers ruth knew every plant now it seemed as though she had always lived here and always known the inhabitants of the house she heard sally singing her accustomed song in the kitchen a song she never varied over her afternoon's work it began as i was going to derby sir upon a market day and if music is a necessary element in a song perhaps i had better call it by some other name but the strange change was in ruth herself she was conscious of it though she could not define it and did not dwell upon it life had become significant and full of duty to her she delighted in the exercise of her intellectual powers and liked the idea of the infinite amount of which she was ignorant for it was a grand pleasure to learn to crave and be satisfied she strove to forget what had gone before this last twelve months she shuddered up from contemplating it it was like a bad unholy dream and yet there was a strange yearning kind of love for the father of the child whom she pressed to her heart which came and she could not bid it be gone as sinful it was so pure and natural even when thinking of it as in the sight of god little leonard cooed to the flowers and stretched after their bright colours and ruth laid him on the dry turf and pelted him with the gay petals he chinked and crowed with laughing delight and clutched at her cap and pulled it off her short rich curls were golden brown in the slanting sunlight and by their very shortness made her more childlike she hardly seemed as if she could be the mother of the noble babe over whom she knelt now snatching kisses now matching his cheek with rose leaves all at once the bells of the old church struck the hour and far away high up in the air began slowly to play the old tune of life let us cherish they had played it for years for the life of man and it always sounded fresh and strange and aerial ruth was still in a moment she knew not why and the tears came into her eyes as she listened when it was ended she kissed her baby and bade god bless him just then sally came out dressed for the evening with a leisurely look about her she had done her work and she and ruth were to drink tea together in the exquisitely clean kitchen but while the kettle was boiling she came out to enjoy the flowers she gathered a piece of southern wood and stuffed it up her nose by way of smelling it what do you call this in your country asked she old man replied ruth we call it here lad's love it and peppermint drops always reminds me of going to church in the country here i'll get you a black currant leaf to put in the teapot it gives it a flavour we had bees once against this wall but when missus died we forgot to tell em and put em in mourning and in course they swarmed away without our knowing and the next winter came a hard frost and they died now i dare say the water will be boiling and it's time f for little master there to come in for the dew is falling see all the daisies is shutting themselves up sally was most gracious as a hostess she quite put on her company manners to receive ruth in the kitchen they laid leonard to sleep on the sofa in the parlour that they might hear him the more easily and then they sat quietly down to their sewing by the bright kitchen fire sally was as usual the talker and as usual the subject was the family of whom for so many years she had formed a part ay things were different when i was a girl quoth she eggs was thirty for a shilling and butter only sixpence a pound my wage when i came here was but three pound and i did on it 
and was always clean and tidy which is more than many a lass can say who now gets seven and eight pound a year and tea was kept for an afternoon drink and pudding was eaten afore meat in them days and the upshot was people paid their debts better ay ay we're gone backwards we thinkin we're gone forwards after shaking her head a little over the degeneracy of the times sally returned to a part of the subject on which she thought she had given ruth a wrong idea you'll not go for to think now that i've not more than three pound a year i've a deal above that now first of all old missus gave me four pound for she said i were worth it and i thought in my heart that i were so i took it without more ado but after her death master thurston and miss faith took a fit of spending and says they to me one day as i carried tea in sally we think your wages ought to be raised what matter what you think said i pretty sharp for i thought they'd have shown more respect to missus if they let things stand as they were in her time and they'd gone and moved the sofa away from the wall to where it stands now already that very day so i speaks up sharp and says i as long as i'm content i think it's no business o yours to be meddling with me and my money matters but says miss faith she's always the one to speak first if you'll notice though it's master that comes in and clinches the matter with some reason she'd never have thought of he were always a sensible lad sally all the servants in the town have six pound and better and you have as hard a place as any of em did you ever hear me grumble about my work that you talk about it in that, that way wait till i grumble says i but don't meddle with me till then so i flung off in a huff but in the course of the evening master thurston came in and sat down in the kitchen and he's such winning ways he whiles one over to anything and besides a notion had come into my head now you'll not tell said she glancing round the room and hitching up her chair nearer to ruth in a confidential manner ruth promised and sally went on i thought i should like to be an heiress with money and leave it all to master and miss faith and i thought if i'd six pound a year i could maybe get to be an heiress all i was feared on was that some chap or other might marry me for my money but i've managed to keep the fellows off so i looks mim and grateful and i thanks master thurston for his offer and i take the wages and what do you think i've done asked sally with an exultant air what have you done asked ruth why replied sally slowly and emphatically i've saved thirty pounds but that's not it i've gotten a lawyer to make me a will that's it wench said she slapping ruth on the back how did you manage it asked ruth ay that was it said sally i thought about it many a night before i hit on the right way i was afeard the money might be thrown into chancery if i didn't make it all safe yet i could not ask master thurston at last and at length john jackson the grocer had a neighbour come to stay a week with him as was prentice to a lawyer in liverpool so now is my time and here was my lawyer wait a minute i could tell you my story better if i had my will in my hand and i'll scumfish you if ever you go for to tell she held up her hand and threatened ruth as she left the kitchen to fetch the will when she came back she brought a parcel tied up in a blue pocket handkerchief she sat down squared her knees untied the handkerchief and displayed a small piece of parchment now do you know what this is said she holding it up it's parchment and it's the right stuff to make wills on people gets into chancery if they don't make them of this stuff and i reckon tom jackson thought he'd have a fresh job on it if he could get it into chancery for the rascal went and wrote it on a piece of paper at first and came and read it me out loud off a piece of paper no better than what one writes letters upon 
I were up to him, and thinks I, come, come, my lad, I'm not a fool, though you may think so. I know a piece of paper won't stand, but I'll let you run your rig. So I sits and I listens, and would you believe me? He read it out as if it were clear a business as you're giving me that thimble. No more ado, though it were thirty pound, I could understand it myself. That were no law for me. I wanted summit to consider about, and for the meaning to be wrapped up as I wrap up my best gown. So I says, Tom, it's not on parchment. I must have it on parchment. This'll do as well, says he. We'll get it witnessed, and it will stand good. Well, I like the notion of having it witnessed, and for a while that soothed me but after a bit I felt I should like it done according to law, and not plain out as anybody might have done it. I myself, if I could have written, so I says, Tom, I must have it on parchment. Parchment costs money, says he, very grave. Oh, my lad, are ye there, thinks I. That's the reason I'm clipped of law. So says I, Tom, I must have it on parchment. I'll pay the money and welcome. It's thirty pound, and what can I lay to it? I'll make it safe. It shall be on parchment, and I'll tell thee what, lad. I'll give ye sixpence for every good law word you put in it, sounding like, and not to be caught up as a person runs. Your master had need to be ashamed of you as an apprentice if you can't do a thing more tradesmanlike than this. Well, he laughed above a bit, but I were firm and stood to it. So he made it out on parchment. Now, woman, try and read it, says she, giving it to Ruth. Ruth smiled and began to read. Sally listened with rapt attention. When Ruth came to the word, testatrix sally stopped her that was the first sixpence said she i thought he was going to fob me off again with plain language but when that word came i out with my sixpence and gave it to him on the spot now go on presently ruth read accruing that was the second sixpence four sixpences it were in all besides six and eight pence as we bargained at first, and three and four pence parchment. There, that's what I call a will, witnessed according to law and all. Master Thurston will be prettily taken in when I die, and he finds all his extra wage left back to him. But it will teach him it's not so easy as he thinks for to make a woman give up her way. The time was now drawing near when little Leonard might be weaned, the time appointed by all three for Ruth to endeavour to support herself in some way more or less independent of Mr. and Miss Benson. This prospect dwelt much in all of their minds, and was in each shaded with some degree of perplexity, but they none of them spoke of it for fear of of accelerating the event. If they had felt clear and determined as to the best course to be pursued, they were none of them deficient in courage to commence upon that course at once. Miss Benson would, perhaps, have objected the most to any alteration in their present daily mode of life, but that was because she had the habit of speaking out her thoughts as they arose, and she particularly disliked and dreaded change. Besides this, she had felt her heart open out and warm towards the little helpless child in a strong and powerful manner. Nature had intended her warm instincts to find vent in a mother's duties, her heart had yearned after children, and made her restless in her childless state, without her well knowing why. But now the delight she experienced in tending, nursing, and contriving for the little boy, even contriving to the point of sacrificing many of her cherished whims, made her happy and satisfied and peaceful. It was more difficult to sacrifice her whims than her comforts, but all had been given up 
when and where required by the sweet lordly baby who reigned paramount in his very helplessness from some cause or other an exchange of ministers for one sunday was to be effected with a neighbouring congregation and mr benson went on a short absence from home when he returned on monday he was met at the house door by his sister who had evidently been looking out for him for some time she stepped out to greet him don't hurry yourself thurston all's well only i wanted to tell you something don't fidget yourself baby is quite well bless him it's only good news come into your room and let me talk a little quietly with you she drew him into his study which was near the outer door and then she took off his coat and put his carpet-bag in a corner and wheeled a chair to the fire before she would begin well now to think how often things fall out just as we want them thurston have you not often wondered what was to be done with ruth when the time came at which we promised her she should earn her living i am sure you have because i have so often thought about it myself and yet i never dared to speak out my fear because that seemed giving it a shape and now mr bradshaw has put all to rights he invited mr jackson to dinner yesterday just as we were going into chapel and then he turned to me and asked me if i would come to tea straight from afternoon chapel because mrs bradshaw wanted to speak to me he made it very clear i was not to bring ruth and indeed she was only too happy to stay home with baby and so i went and mrs bradshaw took me into her bedroom and shut the doors and said mr bradshaw had told her that he did not like jemima being so much confined with the younger ones while they were at their lessons and that he wanted some one above a nursemaid to sit with them while their masters were there some one who would see about their learning their lessons and who would walk out with them a sort of nursery governess i think she meant though she did not say so and mr bradshaw for of course i saw his thoughts and words constantly peeping out though he had told her to speak to me believed that our ruth would be the very person now thurston don't look so surprised as if she had never come into your head i am sure i saw what mrs bradshaw was driving at long before she came to the point and i could scarcely keep from smiling and saying we jump at the proposal long before i ought to have known anything about it oh i wonder what we ought to do said mr benson or rather i believe i see what we ought to do if i durst but do it why what ought we to do asked his sister in surprise i ought to go and tell mr bradshaw the whole story and get ruth turned out of our house said miss benson indignantly they can't make us do that said her brother i do not think they would try yes mr bradshaw would try and he would blazon out poor ruth's sin and there would not be a chance for her left i know him well thurston and why should he be told now more than a year ago a year ago he did not want to put her in a situation of trust about his children and you think she'll abuse that trust do you you've lived a twelvemonth in the house with ruth and the end of it is you think she will do his children harm besides who encouraged jemima to come to the house so much to see ruth did you not say it would do them both good to see something of each other mr benson sat thinking if you had not known ruth as well as you do if during her stay with us you had marked anything wrong or forward or deceitful or immodest i would say at once don't allow mr bradshaw to take her into his house but still i would say don't tell of her sin and sorrow to so severe a man so unpitiful a judge but here i ask you thurston can you or i or sally quick-eyed as she is say that in any one thing we have had true just occasion to find fault with ruth i don't mean that she is perfect she acts without thinking her temper is sometimes warm and hasty but have we any right to go and injure her prospects for life by 
telling mr bradshaw all we know of her errors only sixteen when she did so wrong and never to escape from it all her many years to come to have the despair which would arise from its being known clutching her back into worse sin what harm do you think she can do what is the risk to which you think you are exposing mr bradshaw's children she paused out of breath her eyes glittering with tears of indignation and impatient for an answer that she might knock it to pieces i do not see any danger that can arise said he at length and with slow difficulty as if not fully convinced i have watched ruth and i believe she is pure and truthful and the very sorrow and penitence she has felt the very suffering she has gone through has given her a thoughtful conscientiousness beyond her age that and the care of her baby said miss benson secretly delighted at the tone of her brother's thoughts ah faith that baby you so much dreaded once is turning out a blessing you see said thurston with a faint quite smile yes any one might be thankful and better too for leonard but how could i tell that it would be like him but to return to ruth and mr bradshaw what did you say oh with my feelings of course i was only too glad to accept the proposal and so i told mrs bradshaw then and i afterwards repeated it to mr bradshaw when he asked me if his wife had mentioned their plans they would understand that i must consult you and ruth before it could be considered as finally settled and have you named it to her yes answered miss benson half afraid lest he should think she had been too precipitate and what did she say asked he after a little pause of grave silence at first she seemed very glad and fell into my mood of planning how it should all be managed how sally and i should take care of the baby the hours that she was away at mr bradshaw's but by and by she became silent and thoughtful and knelt down by me and hid her face in my lap and shook a little as if she was crying and then i heard her speak in a very low smothered voice for her head was still bent down quite hanging down indeed so that i could not see her face so i stooped to listen and i heard her say do you think i should be good enough to teach little girls miss benson she said it so humbly and fearfully that all i thought of was how to cheer her and i answered and asked her if she did not hope to be good enough to bring up her own darling to be a brave christian man and she lifted up her head and i saw her eyes looking wild and wet and earnest and she said with god's help that will i try to make my child and then i said ruth as you strive and as you pray for your own child you must strive and pray to make mary and elizabeth good if you are trusted with them and she said quite clear though her face was hidden from me once more i will strive and i will pray you would not have any fears thurston if you could have heard and seen her last night i have no fear said he decidedly let the plan go on after a minute he added but i am glad i it was so far arranged before i heard of it my indecision about right and wrong my perplexity about how far we are to calculate consequences grows upon me i fear you look tired and weary dear you should blame your body rather than your conscience at these times a very dangerous doctrine the scroll of fate was closed and they could not foresee the future and yet if they could have seen it though they might have shrunk fearfully at first they would have smiled and thanked god when all was done and said End of chapter 18chapter 19 after five years the quiet days grew into weeks and months and even years 
without any event to startle the little circle into the consciousness of the lapse of time. One who had known them at the date of Ruth's becoming a governess in Mr. Bradshaw's family, and had been absent until the time of which I am now going to tell you, would have noted some changes which had imperceptibly come over all. But he, too, would have thought that the life which had brought so little of turmoil and vicissitude must have been calm and tranquil, and in accordance with the bygone activity of the town in which their existence passed away. The alterations that he would have perceived were those caused by the natural progress of time. The Benson home was brightened into vividness by the presence of the little Leonard, now a noble boy of six, large and grand in limb and stature, and with a face of marked beauty and intelligence. Indeed, he might have been considered by many as too intelligent for his years, and often the living with old and thoughtful people gave him, beyond most children, the appearance of pondering over the mysteries which meet the young on the threshold of life, but which fade away as advancing years bring us more into contact with the practical and tangible, fade away and vanish, until it seems to require the agitation of some great storm of the soul before we can again realize spiritual things. But at times Leonard seemed oppressed and bewildered, after listening intent, with grave and wondering eyes, to the conversation around him. At others, the bright animal life shone forth radiant, and no three months kitten, no foal, suddenly tossing up its heels by the side of its sedate dam, and careering around the pasture in pure mad enjoyment, no young creature of any kind could show more merriment and gladness of heart. Forever in mischief was Sally's account of him at such times, but it was not intentional mischief, and Sally herself would have been the first to scold any one else who had used the same words in reference to her darling. Indeed, she was once nearly giving warning because she thought the boy was being ill-used. The occasion was this. Leonard had for some time shown a strange, odd disregard of truth. He invented stories, and told them with so grave a face, that unless there was some internal evidence of their incorrectness, such as describing a cow with a bonnet on, he was generally believed, and his statements, which were given with the full appearance of relating a real occurrence, had once or twice led to awkward results. All the three, whose hearts were pained by this apparent unconsciousness of the difference between truth and falsehood, were unaccustomed to children, or they would have recognized this as a stage through which most infants, who would have lively imaginations, pass. And accordingly, there was a consultation in Mr. Benson's study one morning. Ruth was there, quiet, very pale, and with compressed lips, sick at heart as she heard Miss Benson's arguments for the necessity of whipping, in order to cure Leonard of his storytelling. Mr. Benson looked happy and uncomfortable. Education was but a series of experiments to them all, and they all had a secret dread of spoiling the noble boy, who was the darling of their hearts and, perhaps, this very intensity of love begot an impatient, unnecessary anxiety, and made them resolve on sterner measures than the parent of a large family, where love was more spread abroad, would have dared to use. At any rate, the vote for whipping carried the day, and even Ruth, trembling and cold, agreed that it must be done. Only she asked, in a meek, sad voice, if she need be present. Mr. Benson was to be the executioner, the scene, the study, and being instantly told that she had better not, 
she went slowly and languidly up to her room and kneeling down she closed her ears and prayed miss benson having carried her point was very sorry for the child and would have begged him off but mr benson had listened more to her arguments than now to her pleadings and only answered if it is right it shall be done he went into the garden and deliberately almost as if he wished to gain time chose and cut off a little switch from the laburnum tree then he returned through the kitchen and gravely taking the awed and wondering little fellow by the hand he led him silently into the study and placing him before him began an admonition on the importance of truthfulness meaning to conclude with what he believed to be the moral of all punishment as you cannot remember this of yourself i must give you a little pain to make you remember it i am sorry it is necessary and that you cannot recollect without my doing so but before he had reached this very proper and desirable conclusion and while he was yet working his way his heart ached with the terrified look of the child at the solemnly sad face and words of upbraiding sally burst in and what may ye be going to do with that fine switch i saw ye gathering master thurston asked she her eyes gleaming with anger at the answer she knew must come if answer she had at all go away sally said mr benson annoyed at the fresh difficulty in his path i'll not stir never a step till you give me that switch as you've got for some mischief i'll be bound sally remember where it is said he that spareth the rod spoileth the child said mr benson austerely ay i remember and i remember a bit more than you want me to remember i reckon it were king solomon as spoke them words and it were king solomon's son that were king rehoboam and no great shakes either i can remember what is said on him second chronicles twelve chapter fourteenth verse and he that's king rehoboam the lad that tasted the rod did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the lord i've not been reading my chapters every night for fifty year to be caught napping by a dissenter neither said she triumphantly come along leonard she stretched out her hand to the child thinking that she had conquered but leonard did not stir he looked wistfully at mr benson come said she impatiently the boy's mouth quivered if you want to whip me uncle you may do it i don't much mind put in this form it was impossible to carry out his intentions and so mr benson told the lad he might go that he would speak to him another time leonard went away more subdued in spirit than if he had been whipped sally lingered a moment she stopped to add i think it's for them without sin to throw stones at a poor child and cut up good laburnum branches to whip him i only do as my betters do when i call leonard's mother mrs denby the moment she had said this she was sorry it was an ungenerous advantage after the enemy had acknowledged himself defeated mr benson dropped his head upon his hands and bid his face and sighed deeply leonard flew in search of his mother as in search of a refuge if he had found her calm he would have burst into a passion of crying after his agitation as it was he came upon her kneeling and sobbing and he stood quite still then he threw his arms round her neck and said mamma mamma i will be good i make a promise i will speak true i make a promise and he kept his word miss benson piqued herself upon being less carried away by her love for this child than any one else in the house she talked severely and had capital theories but her severity ended in talk and her theories would not work however she read several books on education knitting socks for leonard all the while and upon the whole i think the hands were more usefully employed than the head and the good honest heart better than either she looked older 
than when we first knew her, but it was a ripe, kindly age that was coming over her. Her excellent practical sense, perhaps, made her a more masculine character than her brother. He was often so much perplexed by the problems of life that he let the time for action go by, but she kept him in check by her clear pithy talk which brought back his wandering thoughts to the duty that lay straight before him waiting for action and then he remembered that it was the faithful part to wait patiently upon god and leave the ends in his hands who alone knows why evil exists in this world and why it ever hovers on either side of good in this respect miss benson had more faith than her brother or so it seemed for quick resolute action in the next step of life was all she required while he deliberated and trembled and often did wrong from his very deliberation when his first instinct would have led him right but although decided and prompt as ever miss benson was grown older since the summer afternoon when she dismounted from the coach at the foot of the long welsh hill that led to landu where her brother awaited her to consult her about ruth though her eye was as bright and straight-looking as ever quick and brave in its glances her hair had become almost snowy white and it was on this point she consulted sally soon after the date of leonard's last untruth the two were arranging miss benson's room one morning when after dusting the looking-glass she suddenly stopped in her operation and after a close inspection of herself startled sally by this speech sally i'm looking a great deal older than i used to sally who was busy dilating on the increased price of flour considered this remark of miss benson's as strangely irrelevant to the matter in hand and only noticed it by a to be sure i suppose we all on us do but two and fourpence a dozen is too much to make us pay for it miss benson went on with her inspection of herself and sally with her economical projects sally said miss benson my hair is nearly white the last time i looked it was only pepper and salt what must i do why do why what would the wench do asked sally contemptuously you're never going to be taken in at your time of life by hair dyes and such gimcracks as can only take in young girls whose wisdom teeth are not cut and who are not very likely to want them said miss benson quietly no but you see sally it's very awkward having such grey hair and feeling so young do you know sally i've as great a mind for dancing when i hear a lively tune on the street organs as ever and as great a mind to sing when i'm happy to sing in my old way sally you know ay you had it from a girl said sally and many a time when the door's been shut i did not know if it was you in the parlour or a big bumblebee in the kitchen as was making that drumbling noise i heard you at it yesterday but an old woman with grey hair ought not to have a fancy for dancing or singing continued miss benson what nonsense are you talking said sally roused to indignation calling yourself an old woman when you're better than ten years younger than me and many a girl has grey hair at five-and-twenty but i'm more than five-and-twenty sally i'm fifty-seven next may more shame for ye then not to know better than to talk of dyeing your hair i cannot abide such vanities oh dear sally when will you understand what i mean i want to know how i'm to keep remembering how old i am so as to prevent myself from feeling so young i was quite startled just now to see my hair in the glass for i can generally tell if my cap is straight by feeling i'll tell you what i'll do i'll cut off a piece of my grey hair and plait it together for a mark in my bible miss benson expected applause for this bright idea but sally only made answer you'll be taking to painting your cheeks next now you've once thought of dyeing your hair so miss benson plaited her grey hair in silence and quietness leonard holding one end of it while she wove it 
and admiring the colour and texture all the time, with a sort of implied dissatisfaction at the auburn colour of his own curls, which was only half comforted away by Miss Benson's information that he lived long enough his hair would be like hers. Mr. Benson, who had looked old and frail while he was yet but young, was now stationary as to the date of his appearance, but there was something more of nervous restlessness in his voice and ways than formerly. That was the only change five years had brought to him. And as for Sally, she chose to forget age in the passage of years altogether and had as much work in her to use her own expression as she had at sixteen. Nor was her appearance very explicit as to the flight of time. Fifty, sixty, or seventy she might be, not more than the last nor less than the first, though her usual answer to any circuitous inquiry as to her age was now what it had been for many years past. I'm feared I shall never see thirty again. Then, as to the house, it was not one where the sitting-rooms are refurnished every two or three years, not now even, since Ruth came to share their living, a place where, as an article grew shabby or worn, a new one was purchased. The furniture looked poor, and the carpets almost threadbare. But there was such a dainty spirit of cleanliness abroad, such exquisite neatness of repair, and altogether so bright and cheerful a look about the rooms, everything so above board, no shifts to conceal poverty under flimsy ornament, that many a splendid drawing-room would give less pleasure to those who could see evidence of character in inanimate things. But whatever poverty there might be in the house, there was full luxuriance in the little square wall-encircled garden, on two sides of which the parlour and kitchen looked, the laburnum tree, which when Ruth came was like a twig stuck into the ground, was now a golden glory in spring and a pleasant shade in summer, the wild hop that Mr. Benson had brought home from one of his country rambles, and planted by the parlour window, while Leonard was yet a baby in his mother's arms, was now a garland over the casement, hanging down long tendrils that waved in the breezes, and threw pleasant shadows and traceries, like some old bacchanalian carving, on the parlour walls, at morn or dusky eve. The yellow rose had clambered up to the window of Mr. Benson's bedroom, and its blossom-laden branches were supported by a jargonelle pear-tree rich in autumnal fruit. But perhaps in Ruth herself there was the greatest external change, for of the change which had gone on in her heart and mind and soul, or if there had been any, neither she or any one around her was conscious. But sometimes Miss Benson did say to Sally, "'How very handsome Ruth is grown!' to which Sally made ungracious answer. "'Yes, she's well enough. Beauty is deceitful and favour a snare, and I'm thankful the Lord has spared me from such man-traps and spring-guns.' But even Sally could not help secretly admiring Ruth. If her early brilliancy of colouring was gone, a clear ivory skin as smooth as satin told of complete and perfect health, and was as lovely, if not so striking in effect, as the banished lilies and roses. Her hair had grown darker and deeper in the shadow that lingered in its masses. Her eyes, even if you had guessed that they had shed bitter tears in their day, had a thoughtful spiritual look about them that made you wonder at their depth and look and look again. The increase of dignity in her face had been imparted to her, to her form. I do not know if she had grown taller since the birth of her child, but she looked as if she had, and although she had lived in a very humble home, yet there was something about either it or her 
or the people amongst whom she had been thrown during the last few years which had so changed her that whereas six or seven years ago you would have perceived that she was not altogether a lady by birth and education yet now she might have been placed among the highest in the land and would have been taken by the most critical judge for their equal although ignorant of their conventional etiquette an ignorance which she would have acknowledged in a simple childlike way being unconscious of any false shame her whole heart was in her boy she often feared that she loved him too much more than god himself yet she could not bear to pray to have her love for her child lessened but she would kneel down by his little bed at night at the deep still midnight with the stars that kept watch over rispa shining down upon her and tell god what i have now told you that she feared and loved her child too much yet could not would not love him less and speak to him of her one treasure as she could speak to no earthly friend and so unconsciously her love of her child led her up to love to god to the all-knowing who read her heart it might be superstition i dare say it was but somehow she never lay down to rest without saying as she looked her last on her boy thy will not mine be done and even while she trembled and shrank with infinite dread from sounding the depths of what that will might be she felt as if her treasure were more secure to waken up rosy and bright in the morning as one over whose slumbers god's holy angels had watched for the very words which she had turned away in sick terror from realizing the night before her daily absence at her duties to the bradshaw children only ministered to her love for leonard everything does minister to love when its foundation lies deep in a true heart and it was with exquisite pang of delight that after a moment of vague fear oh mercy to myself i said if lucy should be dead she saw her child's bright face of welcome as he threw open the door every afternoon on her return home for it was his silently appointed work to listen for her knock and rush breathless to let her in if he were in the garden or upstairs among the treasures of the lumber-room either miss benson or her brother or sally would fetch him to his happy little task no one so sacred as he to the allotted duty and the joyous meeting was not deadened by custom to either mother or child ruth gave the bradshaws the highest satisfaction as mr bradshaw often said both to her and to the bensons indeed she rather winced under his pompous approbation but his favourite recreation was patronising and when ruth saw how quietly and meekly mr benson submitted to gifts and praise when an honest word of affection or a tacit implied acknowledgment of equality would have been worth everything said and done she tried to be more meek in spirit and to recognize the good that undoubtedly existed in mr bradshaw he was richer and more prosperous than ever a keen far-seeing man of business with an undisguised contempt for all who failed in the success which he had achieved but it was not alone those who were less fortunate in obtaining wealth than himself that he visited with severity of judgment every moral error or delinquency came under his unsparing comment stained by no vice himself either in his own eyes or in that of any human being who cared to judge him having nicely and wisely proportioned and adapted his means to his ends he could afford to speak and act with a severity which was almost sanctimonious in its ostentation or thankfulness as to himself not a misfortune or a sin was brought to light but mr bradshaw could trace to its cause in some former mode of action 
which he long ago foretold would lead to shame. If another's son turned out wild or bad, Mr. Bradshaw had little sympathy. It might have been prevented by a stricter rule or more religious life at home. Young Richard Bradshaw was quiet and steady, and other fathers might have had sons like him if they had taken the same pains to enforce obedience. Richard was an only son, and yet Mr. Bradshaw might venture to say he had never had his own way in his life. Mrs. Bradshaw was, he confessed. Mr. Bradshaw did not like confessing his wife's errors. Rather less firm than he should have liked with the girls, and with some people, he believed, Jemima was rather headstrong, but to his wishes she had always shown herself obedient. All children were obedient if their parents were decided and authoritative, and every one would turn out well, if properly managed. If they did not prove good, then they might take the consequences of their errors. Mrs. Bradshaw murmured faintly at her husband when his back was turned, but if his voice was heard or his footsteps sounded in the distance, she was mute and hurried her children into the attitude or action most pleasing to their father. Jemima, it is true, rebelled against this manner of proceeding, which savoured to her a little of deceit, but even she had not, as yet, overcome her awe of her father sufficiently to act independently of him, and according to her own sense of right, or rather, I should say, according to her own warm, passionate impulses. Before him, the willfulness which made her dark eyes blaze out at times was hushed and still. He had no idea of her self-tormenting, no notion of the almost southern jealousy which seemed to belong to her brunette complexion. Jemima was not pretty. The flatness and shortness of her face made her almost plain. Yet most people looked twice at her expressive countenance, at the eyes which flamed or melted at every trifle, at the rich colour which came, at every expressed emotion into her usually sallow face, at the faultless teeth which made her smile like a sunbeam. But then, again, when she thought she was not kindly treated, when a suspicion crossed her mind, or when she was angry with herself, her lips were tight-pressed together, her colour was wan and almost livid, and a stormy gloom clouded her eyes as with a film. But before her father her words were few, and he did not notice looks or tones. Her brother Richard had been equally silent before his father in boyhood and early youth, but since he had gone to be a clerk in a London house, preparatory to assuming his place as junior partner in Mr. Bradshaw's business, he spoke more on his occasional visits at home, and very proper and highly moral was his conversation, sentences of goodness, which were like the flowers that children stick in the ground, and that have not sprung upwards from roots deep down in the hidden life and experience of the heart. He was as severe a judge as his father of other people's conduct, but you felt that Mr. Bradshaw was sincere in his condemnation of all outward error and vice, and that he would try himself by the same laws as he tried others. Somehow Richard's words were frequently heard with a lurking distrust, and many shook their heads over the patterned son. But then it was those whose sons had gone astray and had been condemned in no private or tender manner by Mr. Bradshaw, so it might be revenge in them. Still, Jemima felt that all was not right. Her heart sympathized in the rebellion against his father's commands, which her brother had confessed to her in an unusual moment of confidence. But her uneasy conscience condemned the deceit which he had practiced. The brother and sister was sitting alone over a blazing Christmas fire, and Jemima held an old newspaper in her hand to shield her face from the hot light. They were talking of family events, when, during a pause, 
Jemima's eye caught the name of a great actor who had lately given prominence and life to a character in one of Shakespeare's plays. The criticism in the paper was fine and warmed Jemima's heart. "'How I should like to see a play!' exclaimed she. "'Should you?' said her brother listlessly. "'Yes, to be sure. Just hear this.' And she began to read a fine passage of criticism. "'Those newspaper people can make an article out of anything,' said he, yawning. "'I've seen the man myself, and it was all very well, but nothing to make such a fuss about. "'Have you seen a play, Richard? Oh, why did you never tell me before? Tell me all about it. Why did you never name seeing in your letters?' He half smiled, contemptuously enough. "'Oh, at first it strikes one, rather, but after a while one cares no more for the theatre than one does for mince pies.' "'Oh, I wish I might go to London,' said Jemima impatiently. "'I've a great mind to ask Papa to let me go to the George Smiths, and then I could see. I would not think him like mince pies.' "'You must not do any such thing,' said Richard, now neither yawning nor contemptuous. "'My father would never allow you to go to the theatre, and the George Smiths are such old fogies. They would be sure to tell.' "'How do you go, then? Does my father give you leave?' "'Oh, many things are right for men which are not for girls.' Jemima sat and pondered. Richard wished he had not been so confidential. "'You need not name it,' said he, rather anxiously. "'Name what?' said she, startled, for her thoughts had gone far afield. "'Oh, name my going once or twice to the theatre. "'No, I shan't name it,' said she. "'No one here would care to hear it.' But it was with some little surprise, and almost with a feeling of disgust, that she heard Richard join with her father in condemning someone, and add to Mr. Bradshaw's list of offences by alleging that the young man was a playgoer. He did not think his sister heard his words. Mary and Elizabeth were the two girls whom Ruth had in charge. They resembled Jemima more than their brother in character. The household rules were occasionally a little relaxed in their favour, for Mary, the elder, was nearly eight years younger than Jemima, and three intermediate children had died. They loved Ruth dearly, made a great pet of Leonard, and had many profound secrets together, most of which related to their wonders if Jemima and Mr. Farquhar would ever be married. They watched their sister closely, and every day had some fresh confidence to make to each other, confirming or discouraging to their hopes. Ruth rose early and shared the household work with Sally and Miss Benson till seven, and then she helped Leonard to dress and had a quiet time alone with him till prayers and breakfast. At nine she was to be at Mr. Bradshaw's house. She sat in the room with Mary and Elizabeth during the Latin, the writing, and the arithmetic lessons, which they received from masters. Then she read and walked with them, clinging to her as to an elder sister. She dined with her pupils at the family lunch and reached home by four that happy home, those quiet days. And so the peaceful days passed on into weeks and months and years, and Ruth and Leonard grew and strengthened into the riper beauty of their respective ages, while as yet no touch of decay had come on the quaint, primitive elders of the household. End of chapter 19《Chapter Twenty: Jemima Refuses to be Managed It was no wonder that the lookers-on were perplexed as to the state of affairs between Jemima and Mr. Farquhar, for they too were sorely puzzled themselves at the sort of relationship between them. Was it love, or was it not? That was the question in Mr. Farquhar's mind. He hoped it was not. He believed it was not and yet he felt as if it were. 
There was something preposterous, he thought, in a man nearly forty years of age being in love with a girl of twenty. He had gone on reasoning through all the days of his manhood on the idea of a staid, noble-minded wife, grave and sedate, the fit companion in experience of her husband. He had spoken with admiration of reticent characters full of self-control and dignity, and he hoped, he trusted, that all this time he had not been allowing himself unconsciously to fall in love with a wild-hearted, impetuous girl who knew nothing of life beyond her father's house, and who chafed under the strict discipline enforced there for it was rather a suspicious symptom of the state of Mr. Farquhar's affections that he had discovered the silent rebellion which continued in Jemima's heart, unperceived by any of her own family, against the severe laws and opinions of her father. Mr. Farquhar shared in these opinions, but in him they were modified and took a milder form. Still, he approved of much that Mr. Bradshaw did and said, and this made it all the more strange that he should wince so for Jemima, whenever anything took place which he instinctively knew that she would dislike. After an evening at Mr. Bradshaw's, when Jemima had gone to the very verge of questioning or disputing some of her father's severe judgments, Mr. Farquhar went home in a dissatisfied, restless state of mind, which he was almost afraid to analyze. He admired the inflexible integrity, and almost the pomp of principle, evinced by Mr. Bradshaw on every occasion. He wondered how it was that Jemima could not see how grand a life might be, whose every action was shaped in obedience to some eternal law instead of which he was afraid she rebelled against every law and was only guided by impulse mr farquhar had been taught to dread impulses as promptings of the devil sometimes if he tried to present her father's opinion before her in another form so as to bring himself and her rather more into that state of agreement he longed for she flashed out upon him with the indignation of difference that she dared not show to or before her father, as if she had some diviner instinct which taught her more truly than they knew, with all their experience. At least, in her first expressions there seemed something good and fine, but opposition made her angry and irritable, and the arguments which he was constantly provoking, whenever he was with her in her father's absence, frequently ended in some vehemence of expression on her part that offended Mr. Farquhar, who did not see how she expiated her anger in tears and self-reproaches when alone in her chamber. Then he would lecture himself severely on the interest he could not help feeling in a willful girl. He would determine not to interfere with her opinions in future, and yet, the very next time they differed, he strove to argue her into harmony with himself, in spite of all resolutions to the contrary. Mr. Bradshaw saw just enough of this interest which Jemima had excited in his partner's mind to determine him in considering their future marriage as a settled affair. The fitness of the thing had long ago struck him. Her father's partner, so the fortune he meant to give her might continue in the business a man of such steadiness of character and such a capital eye for a desirable speculation as mr farquhar just the right age to unite the paternal with the conjugal affection and consequently the very man for jemima who had something unruly in her which might break out under a regime less wisely adjusted to the circumstances than was Mr. Bradshaw's, in his own opinion. A house ready furnished at a convenient distance from her home, no near relations on Mr. Farquhar's side, 
who might be inclined to consider his residence as their own for an indefinite time and so add to the household expenses in short what could be more suitable in every way mr bradshaw respected the very self-restraint he thought he saw in mr farquhar's demeanour attributing it to a wise desire to wait until trade should be rather more slack and the man of business more at leisure to become the lover as for jemima at times she thought she almost hated mr farquhar what business has he she would think to lecture me often i can hardly bear it from papa and i will not bear it from him he treats me just like a child and as if i should lose my present opinions when i know more of the world i am sure i should like never to know the world if it was to make me think as he does hard man that he is i wonder what made him take jem brown on as a gardener again if he does not believe that above one criminal in a thousand is restored to goodness i'll ask him some day if that was not acting on impulse rather than principle poor impulse how do you get abused but i will tell mr farquhar i will not let him interfere with me if i do what papa bids me no one has a right to notice whether i do it willingly or not so then she tried to defy mr farquhar by doing and saying things that she knew he would disapprove she went so far that he was seriously grieved and did not even remonstrate and lecture and then she was disappointed and irritated for somehow with all her indignation at interference she liked to be lectured by him not that she was aware of this liking of hers but still it would have been more pleasant to be scolded than so quietly passed over her two little sisters with their wide-awake eyes had long ago put things together and conjectured every day they had some fresh mystery together to be imparted in garden walks and whispered talks lizzie did you see how the tears came into mimi's eyes when mr farquhar looked so displeased when she said good people were always dull i think she's in love mary said the last words with grave emphasis and felt like an oracle of twelve years of age i don't said lizzie i know i cry often enough when papa is cross and i'm not in love with him yes but you don't look as mimi did don't call her mimi you know papa does not like it yes but there are so many things papa does not like i can never remember them all never mind about that but listen to something i've got to tell you if you'll never never tell no indeed i won't mary what is it not to mrs denby no not even to mrs denby well then the other day last friday mimi jemima interrupted the more conscientious elizabeth jemima if it must be so jerked out mary sent me to her desk for an envelope and what do you think i saw what asked elizabeth expecting nothing else than a red-hot valentine signed walter farquhar pro bradshaw farquhar and company in full why a piece of paper with dull-looking lines upon it just like the scientific dialogues and i remember all about it it was once when mr farquhar had been telling us that a bullet does not go in a straight line but in a something curve and he drew some lines on a piece of paper and mimi jemima put in elizabeth well well she had treasured it up and written in corner w f april third now that's rather like love is it not for jemima hates useful information just as much as i do and that's saying a great deal and yet she had kept this paper and dated it if that's all i know dick keeps a paper with miss benson's name written on it and yet he's not in love with her and perhaps jemima may like mr farquhar and he may not like her it seems such a little while since her hair was turned up and he has always been a grave middle-aged man ever since i can recollect and then 
have you never noticed how often he finds fault with her almost lectures her to be sure said mary but he may be in love for all that just think how often papa lectures mamma and yet of course they're in love with each other well we shall see said elizabeth poor jemima little thought of the four sharp eyes that watched her daily course while she sat alone as she fancied with her secret in her own room for in a passionate fit of grieving at the impatient hasty temper which had made her so seriously displeased mr farquhar that he had gone away without remonstrance without more leave-taking than a distant bow she had begun to suspect that rather than not be noticed at all by him rather than be an object of indifference to him oh far rather would she be an object of anger and upbraiding and the thoughts that followed this confession to herself stunned and bewildered her for once that they made her dizzy with hope ten times they made her sick with fear for an instant she planned to become and to be all he could wish her to change her very nature for him and then a great gush of pride came over her and she set her teeth tight together and determined that he should either love her as she was or not at all unless he could take her with all her faults she would not care for his regard love was too noble a word to call such cold calculating feeling as his must be who went about with a pattern idea in his mind trying to find a wife to match besides there was something degrading jemima thought in trying to alter herself to gain the love of any human creature and yet if he did not care for her if this late indifference were to last what a great shroud was drawn over life could she bear it from the agony she dared not look at but which she was going to risk encountering she was aroused by the presence of her mother jemima your father wants to speak to you in the dining-room what for asked the girl oh he is fidgeted by something mr farquhar said to me and which i repeated i am sure i thought there was no harm in it and your father always likes me to tell him what everybody says in his absence jemima went with a heavy heart into her father's presence he was walking up and down the room and did not see her at first oh jemima is that you has your mother told you what i want to speak to you about no said jemima not exactly she has been telling me what proves to me how very seriously you must have displeased and offended mr farquhar before he could have expressed himself to her as he did when he left the house you know what he said no said jemima her heart swelling within her he has no right to say anything about me she was desperate or she durst not have said this before her father no right what do you mean jemima said mr bradshaw turning sharp round surely you must know that i hope he may one day be your husband that is to say if you prove yourself worthy of the excellent training i have given you i cannot suppose mr farquhar would take any undisciplined girl as a wife jemima held tight by a chair near which she was standing she did not speak her father was pleased by her silence it was the way in which he liked his projects to be received but you cannot suppose he continued that mr farquhar will consent to marry you consent to marry me repeated jemima in a low tone of brooding indignation were those the terms upon which her rich woman's heart was to be given with a calm consent of acquiescent acceptance but a little above resignation on the part of the receiver if you give way to a temper which although you have never dared to show it to me i am well aware exists although i hope the habits of self-examination i had instilled had done much to cure you of manifesting it at one time richard promised to be the more headstrong of the two now i must desire you to take pattern by him yes he continued falling to into his old train of thought 
it would be a most fortunate connection for you in every way i should have you under my own eye and could still assist you in the formation of your character and i should be at hand to strengthen and confirm your principles mr farquhar's connection with the firm would be convenient and agreeable to me in a pecuniary point of view he mr bradshaw was going on in his enumeration of the advantages which he in particular and jemima in the second place would derive from this marriage when his daughter spoke at first so low that he could not hear her as he walked up and down the room with his creaking boots and he had to stop to listen has mr farquhar ever spoken to you about it jemima's cheek was flushed as she asked the question she wished that she might have been the person to whom he had first addressed himself mr bradshaw answered no not spoken it has been implied between us from for some time at least i have been so aware of his intentions that i have made several allusions in the course of business to it as a thing that might take place he can hardly have misunderstood he must have seen that i perceived his design and approved of it said mr bradshaw rather doubtfully as he remembered how very little in fact passed between him and his partner which could have reference to the subject to any but a mind prepared to receive it perhaps mr farquhar had not really thought of it but then again that would imply that his own penetration had been a mistaken a thing not impossible certainly but quite beyond the range of probability so he reassured himself and as he thought his daughter by saying the whole thing is so suitable the advantages arising from the connection are so obvious besides which i am quite aware from many little speeches of mr farquhar's that he contemplates marriage at no very distant time and he seldom leaves eccleston and visits few families besides our own certainly none that compare with ours in the advantages you have all received in moral and religious training but then mr bradshaw was checked in his implied praises of himself and only himself could be his martingale when he once set out on such a career by a recollection that jemima must not feel too secure as she might become if he dwelt too much on the advantages of her being her father's daughter accordingly he said but you must be aware jemima that you do very little credit to the education i have given you when you make such an impression as you must have done to-day before mr farquhar could have said what he did of you what did he say asked jemima still in the low husky tone of suppressed anger your mother says he remarked to her what a pity it is that jemima cannot maintain her opinions without going into a passion and what a pity it is that her opinions are such as to sanction rather than curb these fits of rudeness and anger did he say that said jemima in a still lower tone not questioning her father but speaking rather to herself i have no doubt he did replied her father gravely your mother is in the habit of repeating accurately to me what takes place in my absence besides which the whole speech is not one of hers she has not altered a word in the repetition i am convinced i have trained her to habits of accuracy very unusual in a woman at another time jemima might have been inclined to rebel against this system of carrying constant intelligence to headquarters which she had long ago felt as an insurmountable obstacle to any free communication with her mother but now her father's means of acquiring knowledge faded into insignificance before the nature of the information he imparted she stood quite still grasping the chair back longing to be dismissed i have said enough now i hope to make you behave in a becoming manner to mr farquhar if your temper is too unruly to be always under your own control at least have respect to my injunctions and take some pains to curb it before him may i go asked jemima 
chafing more and more. "'You may,' said her father. When she left the room, he gently rubbed his hands together, satisfied with the effect he had produced, and wondering how it was that one so well brought up as his daughter could ever say or do anything to provoke such a remark from Mr. Farquhar as that which he heard repeated. Nothing can be more gentle and docile than she is when spoken to in the proper manner. I must give Farquhar a hint, said Mr. Bradshaw to himself. Jemima rushed upstairs and locked herself into her room. She began pacing up and down at first, without shedding a tear, but then she suddenly stopped and burst out crying with passionate indignation. So I am to behave well, not because it is right, not because it is right, but to show off before Mr. Farquhar. Oh, Mr. Farquhar, said she, suddenly changing to a sort of upbraiding tone of voice, I did not think so of you an hour ago. It, I did not think you could choose a wife in that cold-hearted way, though you did profess to act by rule and line. But you think to have me, do you? Because it is fitting and suitable? And do you want to be married, and can't spare time for wooing? She was lashing herself up by an exaggeration of all her father had said. And how often I have thought you were too grand for me, but now I know better. Now I can believe that all you do is done from calculation. You are good because it adds to your business credit. You talk in that high strain about principle because it sounds well and is respectable, and even these things are better than your cold way of looking out for a wife, just as you would do for a carpet, to add to your comforts and settle you respectably. But I won't be that wife. You shall see something of me which shall make you not acquiesce so quietly in the arrangements of the firm. She cried too vehemently to go on, thinking or speaking. Then she stopped and said, Only an hour ago I was hoping, I don't know what I was hoping, but I thought, oh, how I was deceived. I thought he had a true, deep, loving, manly heart which God might let me win, but now I know he has only a calm, calculating head. If Jemima had been vehement and passionate before this conversation with her father, it was better than the sullen reserve she assumed now whenever Mr. Farquhar came to the house. He felt it deeply. No reasoning with himself took off the pain he experienced. He tried to speak on the subjects she liked, in the manner she liked, until he despised himself for the unsuccessful efforts. He stood between her and her father once or twice, in obvious inconsistency with his own previously expressed opinions, and Mr. Bradshaw piqued himself upon his admirable management, in making Jemima feel that she owed his indulgence or forbearance to Mr. Farquhar's interference. But Jemima, perverse, miserable Jemima, thought that she hated Mr. Farquhar all the more. She respected her father, inflexible, much more than her father, pompously giving up to Mr. Farquhar's subdued remonstrances on her behalf. Even Mr. Bradshaw was perplexed and shut himself up to consider how Jemima was to be made more fully to understand his wishes and her own interests. But there was nothing to take hold of as a ground for any further conversation with her. Her actions were so submissive that they were spiritless. She did all her father desired. She did it with a nervous quickness and haste, if she thought that otherwise Mr. Farquhar would interfere in any way. She wished, evidently, to owe nothing to him. She had begun by leaving the room when he came in, after the conversation she had had with her father, but at Mr. Bradshaw's first expression of his wish that she should remain, she remained, silent, indifferent, inattentive to all that was going on, 
at least there was this appearance of inattention she would work away at her sewing as if she were to earn her livelihood by it the light was gone out of her eyes as she lifted them up heavily before replying to any question and the eyelids were often swollen with crying but in all this there was no positive fault mr bradshaw could not have told her not to do this or to do that without her doing it for she had become much more docile of late it was a wonderful proof of the influence ruth had gained in the family that mr bradshaw after much deliberation congratulated himself on the wise determination he had made of requesting her to speak to jemima and find out what feeling was at the bottom of all this change in her ways of going on he rang the bell is mrs denby here he inquired of the servant who answered it yes sir she has just come beg her to come to me in this room as soon as she can leave the young ladies ruth came sit down mrs denby sit down i want to have a little conversation with you not about your pupils they are going on well under your care i am sure and i often congratulate myself on the choice i made i assure you i do but now i want to speak to you about jemima she is very fond of you and perhaps you could take an opportunity of observing to her in short of saying to her that she is behaving very foolishly in fact disgusting mr farquhar who was i know inclined to like her by the sullen sulky way she behaves in when he is by he paused for the ready acquiescence he expected but ruth did not quite comprehend what was required of her and disliked the glimpse she had gained of the task very much i hardly understand sir you are displeased with miss bradshaw's manners to mr farquhar well well not quite that i am displeased with her manners they are sulky and abrupt particularly when he is by and i want you of whom she is so fond to speak to her about it but i have never had the opportunity of noticing them whenever i have seen her she has been most gentle and affectionate but i think you do not hesitate to believe me when i say that i have noticed the reverse said mr bradshaw drawing himself up no sir i beg your pardon if i had expressed myself so badly as to seem to doubt but am i to tell miss bradshaw that you have spoken of her faults to me asked ruth a little astonished and shrinking more than ever from the proposed task if you would allow me to finish what i have got to say without interruption i could tell you what i do wish i beg your pardon sir said ruth gently i wish you to join our circle occasionally in an evening mrs bradshaw shall send you an invitation when mr farquhar is likely to be here warned by me and consequently with your observation quickened you can hardly fail to notice instances of what i had pointed out and then i will trust to your own good sense mr bradshaw bowed to her at this part of his sentence to find an opportunity to remonstrate with her ruth was beginning to speak but he waved his hand for another minute of silence only a minute mrs denby i am quite aware that in requesting your presence occasionally in the evening i shall be trespassing upon the time which is in fact your money you may be assured that i shall not forget this little circumstance and you can explain what i have said on this head to benson and his sister i am afraid i cannot do it ruth began but while she was choosing words delicate enough to express her reluctance to act as he wished he had almost bowed her out of the room and thinking that she was modest in her estimate of her qualifications for remonstrating with his daughter he added blandly no one so able mrs denby i have observed many qualities in you observed when perhaps you have little thought it if he had observed ruth that morning he would have seen an absence of mind and depression of spirits not much to her credit as a teacher 
for she could not bring herself to feel that she had any right to go into the family purposely to watch over and find fault with any one member of it if she had seen anything wrong in jemima ruth loved her so much that she would have told her of it in private and with many doubts how far she was the one to pull out the moat from any one's eye even in the most tender manner she would have had to conquer reluctance before she could have done even this but there was something indefinably repugnant to her in the manner of acting which mr bradshaw had proposed and she determined not to accept the invitations which were to place her in so false a position but as she was leaving the house after the end of the lessons while she stood in the hall tying on her bonnet and listening to the last small confidences of her two pupils she saw jemima coming in through the garden door and was struck by the change in her looks the large eyes so brilliant once were dim and clouded the complexion sallow and colourless a lowering expression was on the dark brow and the corners of her mouth drooped as with sorrowful thoughts she looked up and her eyes met ruth's oh you beautiful creature thought jemima with your still calm heavenly face what are you to know of earth's trials you have lost your beloved by death but that is a blessed sorrow the sorrow i have pulls me down and down and makes me despise and hate every one not you though and her face changing to a soft tender look she went up to ruth and kissed her fondly as if it were a relief to be near some one on whose true pure heart she relied ruth returned the caress and even while she did so she suddenly rescinded her resolution to keep clear of what mr bradshaw had desired her to do on her way home she resolved if she could to find out what were jemima's secret feelings and if as if from some previous knowledge she suspected they were morbid and exaggerated in any way to try and help her right with all the wisdom which true love gives it was time that some one should come to still the storm in jemima's turbulent heart which was daily and hourly knowing less and less of peace the irritating difficulty was to separate the two characters which at two different times she had attributed to mr farquhar the old one which she had formerly believed to be true that he was a man acting up to a high standard of lofty principle and acting up without a struggle and this last had been the circumstance which had made her rebellious and irritable once the new one which her father had excited in her suspicious mind that mr farquhar was cold and calculating in all he did and that she was to be transferred by the former and accepted by the latter as a sort of stock in trade these were the two mr farquhars who clashed together in her mind and in this state of irritation and prejudice she could not bear the way in which he gave up his opinions to please her that was not the way to win her she liked him far better when he inflexibly and rigidly adhered to his idea of right and wrong not even allowing any force to temptation and hardly any grace to repentance compared with that beauty of holiness which had never yielded to sin he had been her idol in those days as she found out now however much at the time she had opposed him with violence as for mr farquhar he was almost weary of himself no reasoning even no principle seemed to have influence over him for he saw that jemima was not at all what he approved of in woman he saw her uncurbed and passionate affecting to despise the rules of life he held most sacred and indifferent to if not positively disliking him and yet he loved her dearly but he resolved to make a great effort of will and break loose from these trammels of sense and while he resolved some old recollection would bring her up hanging on his arm 
in all the confidence of early girlhood, looking up in his face with her soft dark eyes, and questioning him upon the mysterious subjects which had so much interest for both of them at that time, although they had become only matter for dissension in these later days. It was also true, as Mr. Bradshaw had said, Mr. Farquhar wished to marry, and had not much choice in the small town of Eccleston. He never put this so plainly before himself as a reason for choosing Jemima, as her father had done to her, but it was an unconscious motive all the same. However, now he had lectured himself into the resolution to make a pretty long absence from Eccleston, and see if, amongst his distant friends, there was no woman more in accordance with his ideal who could put the naughty, willful, plaguing Jemima Bradshaw out of his head if he did not soon perceive some change in her for the better. A few days after Ruth's conversation with Mr. Bradshaw, the invitation she had been expecting, yet dreading, came. It was to her alone. Mr. and Miss Benson were pleased at the compliment to her, and urged her acceptance of it. She wished that they had been included. She had not thought it right or kind to Jemima to tell them why she was going and she feared now lest they should feel a little hurt that they were not asked too. But she need not have been afraid. They were glad and proud of this attention to her, and never thought of themselves. "'Ruthie, what gown shall you wear to-night? Your dark grey one, I suppose?' asked Miss Benson. "'Yes, I suppose so. I never thought of it, but that is my best.' "'Well, then, I shall quill up a ruff for you. You know I am a famous quiller of net.' Ruth came downstairs with a little flush on her cheeks when she was ready to go. She held her bonnet and shawl in her hand, for she knew Miss Benson and Sally would want to see her dressed. "'Is not Mamma pretty?' asked Leonard, with a child's pride. "'She looks very nice and tidy,' said Miss Benson, who had an idea that children should not talk or think about beauty. "'I think my ruff looks so nice,' said Ruth, with gentle pleasure and indeed it did look nice, and set off the pretty round throat most becomingly. Her hair, now grown long and thick, was smoothed as close to her head as its waving nature would allow, and plaited up in a great rich knot low down behind. The grey gown was as plain as plain could be. "'You should have light gloves, Ruth,' said Miss Benson. She went upstairs, and brought down a delicate pair of limerick ones, which had been long treasured up in a walnut shell. "'They say them gloves is made of chicken skins,' said Sally, examining them curiously. "'I wonder how they set about skinning em. "'Here, Ruth,' said Mr. Benson, coming in from the garden, "'here's a rose or two for you. I am sorry there are no more. I hoped I should have had my yellow rose out by this time, but the damask and the white are in a warmer corner and have got the start. Miss Benson and Leonard stood at the door and watched her down the little passage street till she was out of sight. She had hardly touched the bell at Mr. Bradshaw's door when Mary and Elizabeth opened it with boisterous glee. "'We saw you coming. We've been watching for you. We want you to come round the garden before tea.' Papa is not come in yet. Do come. She went round the garden with a little girl clinging to each arm. It was full of sunshine and flowers, and this made the contrast between it and the usual large family room, which fronted the northeast and therefore had no evening sun to light up its cold, drab furniture, more striking than usual. It looked very gloomy. There was the great dining table, heavy and square the range of chairs straight and square, the work-boxes useful and square, the colouring of walls and carpets and curtains, all of the coldest description. Everything was handsome and everything was ugly. Mrs. Bradshaw was asleep in her easy-chair when they came in. Jemima had just put down her work, and lost in thought, she leaned her cheek on her hand. When she saw Ruth, she brightened a little and went to her and kissed her. Mrs. Bradshaw jumped up at the sound of their entrance, and was wide awake in a moment. 
"'Oh, I thought your father was here,' said she, evidently relieved to find that he had not come in and caught her sleeping. "'Thank you, Mrs. Denby, for coming to us to-night,' said she, in the quiet tone in which she generally spoke in her husband's absence. When he was there, a sort of constant terror of displeasing him made her voice sharp and nervous. The children knew that many a thing passed over by their mother when their father was away was sure to be noticed by her when he was present, and noticed, too, in a cross and querulous manner, for she was so much afraid of the blame which on any occasion of their misbehaviour fell upon her. And yet she looked up to her husband with a reverence and regard, and a faithfulness of love which his decision of character was likely to produce on a weak and anxious mind. He was a rest and a support to her, on whom she cast all her responsibilities. She was an obedient, unremonstrating wife to him. No stronger affection had ever brought her duty into conflict with any desire of her heart. She loved her children dearly, though they all perplexed her very frequently. Her son was her especial darling, because he was very seldom brought her into any scrapes with his father. He was so cautious and prudent, and had the art of keeping a calm so about any difficulty he might be in. With all her dutiful sense of the obligation which her husband forced upon her to notice and tell him everything that was going wrong in the household, and especially among his children, Mrs. Bradshaw somehow contrived to be honestly blind to a good deal that was not praiseworthy in Master Richard. Mr. Bradshaw came in before long, bringing with him Mr. Farquhar. Jemima had been talking to Ruth with some interest before then, but on seeing Mr. Farquhar she bent her head down over her work, went a little paler, and then turned obstinately silent. Mr. Bradshaw longed to command her to speak but even he had a suspicion that what she might say when so commanded might be rather worse in its effect than her gloomy silence, so he held his peace, and a discontented, angry kind of peace it was. Mrs. Bradshaw saw that something was wrong, but could not tell what. Only she became every moment more trembling and nervous and irritable, and sent Mary and Elizabeth off on all sorts of contradictory errands to the servants, and made the tea twice as strong, and sweetened it twice as much as usual, in hopes of pacifying her husband with good things. Mr. Farquhar had gone for the last time, or so he thought. He had resolved, for the fifth time, that he would go and watch Jemima once more, and if her temper got the better of her, and she showed the old sullenness again, and gave the old proofs of indifference to his good opinion, he would give her up altogether and seek a wife elsewhere. He sat watching her with folded arms and in silence. Altogether they were a pleasant family party. Jemima wanted to wine a skein of, of wool. Mr. Farquhar saw it and came to her, anxious to do her this little service. She turned away pettishly and asked Ruth to hold it for her. Ruth was hurt for Mr. Farquhar, and looked sorrowfully at, at Jemima, but Jemima would not see her glance of upbraiding, as Ruth, hoping that she would relent, delayed a little to comply with her request. Mr. Farquhar did, and went back to his seat to watch them both. He saw Jemima, turbulent and stormy in look, he saw Ruth, to all appearance, heavenly calm as the angels or with only that little tinge of sorrow which her friend's behaviour had called forth. He saw the unusual beauty of her face and form, which he had never noticed before, and he saw Jemima, with all the brilliancy she once possessed in eyes and complexion, dimmed and faded. He watched Ruth, speaking low and soft to the little girls, who seemed to come to her in every difficulty, and he remarked her gentle firmness when their bedtime came, and they pleaded to stay up longer. Their father was absent in his counting-house, or they would have not dared to do so. He liked Ruth's soft, distinct, unwavering, 
no you must go you must keep to what is right far better than the good-natured yielding to entreaty he had formerly admired in jemima he was wandering off into this comparison while ruth with delicate and unconscious tact was trying to lead jemima into some subject which should take her away from the thoughts whatever they were that made her so ungracious and rude jemima was ashamed of herself before ruth in a way which she had never been before any one else she valued ruth's good opinion so highly that she dreaded lest her friend should perceive her faults she put a check upon herself a check at first but after a little time she had forgotten something of her trouble and listened to ruth and questioned her about leonard and smiled at his little witticisms and only the sighs that would come up from the very force of habit brought back the consciousness of her unhappiness before the end of the evening jemima had allowed herself to speak to mr farquhar in the old way questioning differing disputing she was recalled to the remembrance of that miserable conversation by the entrance of her father after that she was silent but he had seen her face more animated and bright with a smile as she spoke to mr farquhar and although he regretted the loss of her complexion for she was still very pale he was highly pleased with the success of his project he never doubted but that ruth had given her some sort of private exhortation to behave better he could not have understood the pretty art with which by simply banishing unpleasant subjects and throwing a wholesome natural sunlit tone over others ruth had insensibly drawn jemima out of her gloom he resolved to buy mrs denby a handsome silk gown the very next day he did not believe she had a silk gown poor creature he had noticed that dark grey stuff this long long time as her sunday dress he liked the colour the silk one should be just the same tinge then he thought that it would perhaps be better to choose a lighter shade one which might be noticed as different to the old gown for he had no doubt she would like to have it remarked and perhaps would not object to tell people that it was a present from mr bradshaw a token of his approbation he smiled a little to himself as he thought of this additional source of pleasure to ruth she in the meantime was getting up to go home while jemima was lighting the bed candle at the lamp ruth came round to bid good-night mr bradshaw could not allow her to remain till the morrow uncertain whether he was satisfied or not good-night mrs denby said he good-night thank you i am obliged to you i am exceedingly obliged to you he laid emphasis on these words for he was pleased to see mr farquhar step forward to help jemima in her little office mr farquhar offered to accompany ruth home but the streets that intervened between mr bradshaw's and the chapel house were so quiet that he desisted when he learned from ruth's manner how much she disliked his proposal mr bradshaw too instantly observed oh mrs denby need not trouble you farquhar i have servants at liberty at any moment to attend to her if she wishes it in fact he wanted to make hay while the sun shone and to detain mr farquhar a little longer now that jemima was so gracious she went upstairs with ruth to help her put on her things dear jemima said ruth i am so glad to see you looking better to-night you quite frightened me this morning you looked so ill did i replied jemima oh ruth i have been so unhappy lately i want you to come and put me to rights she continued half smiling you know i'm a sort of out pupil of yours though we are so nearly of an age you ought to lecture me and make me good should i dear said ruth i don't think i'm the one to do it oh yes you are you've done me good to-night well if i can do anything for you tell me what it is asked ruth tenderly oh not now not now replied jemima i could not tell you here it's a long story and i don't know that i can tell you at all mamma might come up at any moment and papa would be sure to ask what we had been talking about so long 
take your own time love said ruth only remember as far as i can how glad i am to help you you're too good my darling said jemima fondly don't say so replied ruth earnestly almost as if she were afraid god knows i am not well we're none of us too good answered jemima i know that but you are very good nay i won't call you so if it makes you look so miserable but come away downstairs with the fragrance of ruth's sweetness lingering about her jemima was her best self during the next half hour mr bradshaw was more and more pleased and raised the price of the silk which he was going to give to ruth sixpence a yard during the time mr farquhar went home through the garden way happier than he had been this long time he even caught himself humming the old refrain on revient on revient toujours à ses premiers amours but as soon as he was aware of what he was doing he cleared away the remnants of the song into a cough which was sonorous if not perfectly real end of chapter twenty Chapter Twenty One Mr. Farquhar's Attentions Transferred. The next morning, as Jemima and her mother sat at their work, it came into the head of the former to remember her father's very marked way of thanking Ruth the evening before. What a favorite Mrs. Denby is with papa, said she. I am sure I don't wonder at it. Did you notice, mamma, how he thanked her for coming here last night? yes dear but i don't think it was all mrs bradshaw stopped short she was never certain if it was right or wrong to say anything not at all what asked jemima when she saw her mother was not going to finish the sentence not all because mrs denby came to tea here replied mrs bradshaw why what else could he be thanking her for what has she done asked jemima stimulated to curiosity by her mother's hesitating manner i don't know if i ought to tell you said mrs bradshaw oh very well said jemima rather annoyed nay dear your papa never said i was not to tell perhaps i may never mind i don't want to hear in a piqued tone there was silence for a while jemima was trying to think of something else but her thoughts would revert to the wonder what mrs denby could have done for her father i think i may tell you though said mrs bradshaw half questioning jemima had the honour not to urge any confidence but she was too curious to take any active step toward repressing it mrs bradshaw went on i think you deserve to know it is partly your doing that papa is so pleased with mrs denby he is going to buy her a silk gown this morning and i think you ought to know why why asked jemima because papa is so pleased to find that you mind what she says i mind what she says to be sure i do and always did but why should papa give her a gown for that i think he ought to give it me rather said jemima half laughing i am sure he would dear he will give you one i am certain if you want one he was so pleased to see you like your old self to mr farquhar last night we neither of us could think what had come over you this last month but now all seems right a dark cloud came over jemima's face she did not like this close observation and constant comment on her manners and what had ruth to do with it i am glad you were pleased said she very coldly then after a pause she added but you have not told me what mrs denby had to do with my good behaviour did she not speak to you about it asked mrs bradshaw looking up no why should she she has no right to criticise what i do she would not be so impertinent said jemima feeling very uncomfortable and suspicious yes love she would have had a right for papa had desired her to do it papa desired her what do you mean mamma oh dear i dare say i should not have told you said mrs bradshaw perceiving from jemima's tone of voice that something had gone wrong only you spoke 
as if it would be impertinent in Mrs. Denby, and I am sure she would not do anything that was impertinent. You know, it would be but right for her to do what papa told her, and he said a great deal to her the other day about finding out why you were so cross, and bringing you right. And you are right now, dear, said Mrs. Bradshaw soothingly, thinking that Jemima was annoyed, like a good child, at the recollection of how naughty she had been. Then papa is going to give Mrs. Denby a gown because I was civil to Mr. Farquhar last night? Yes, dear, said Mrs. Bradshaw, more and more frightened at Jemima's angry manner of speaking, low-toned but very indignant. Jemima remembered, with smouldered anger, Ruth's pleading way of willing her from her sullenness the night before. Management everywhere, but in this case it was peculiarly revolting, so much so that she could hardly bear to believe that the seemingly transparent Ruth had lent herself to it. "'Are you sure, mamma, that papa asked Mrs. Denby to make me behave differently? It seems so strange.' "'I am quite sure. He spoke to her last Friday morning in the study. I remember it was Friday, because Mrs. Dean was working here.' Jemima remembered now that she had gone into the schoolroom on the Friday, and had found her sisters lounging about, and wondering what papa could possibly want with Mrs. Denby. After this conversation, Jemima repulsed all Ruth's timid efforts to ascertain the cause of her disturbance, and to help her if she could. Ruth's tender, sympathizing manner, as she saw Jemima daily looking more wretched, was distasteful to the latter in the highest degree. She could not say that Mrs. Denby's conduct was positively wrong. It might even be quite right, but it was inexpressibly repugnant to her to think of her father consulting with a stranger. A week ago she almost considered Ruth as a sister, how to manage his daughter, so as to obtain the end he wished for, yes, even if that end was for her own good. She was thankful and glad to see a brown paper parcel lying on the hall table, with a note in Ruth's handwriting addressed to her father. She knew what it was the grey silk dress, that she was sure Ruth would never accept. No one henceforward could induce Jemima to enter into conversation with Mr. Farquhar. She suspected manoeuvring in the simplest actions, and was miserable in this constant state of suspicion. She would not allow herself to like Mr. Farquhar, even when he said things the most after her own heart. She heard him one evening talking with her father about the principles of trade. Her father stood out for the keenest, sharpest work, consistent with honesty. If he had not been her father, she would perhaps have thought some of his sayings inconsistent with true Christian honesty. He was for driving hard bargains, exacting interest and payment of just bills to a day. That was, he said, the only way in which trade could be conducted, once allow a margin of uncertainty, or where feelings instead of maxims were to be the guide, and all hope of there ever being any good men of business was ended. Suppose a delay of a month in requiring payment might save a man's credit, prevent his becoming a bankrupt, put in Mr. Farquhar. I would not give it him. I would let him have money to set up again as soon as he had passed the bankruptcy court. If he never passed, I might, in some cases, make him an allowance, but I would always keep my justice and my charity separate. And yet charity, in your sense of the word, degrades. Justice, tempered with mercy and consideration, elevates. That is not justice. Justice is certain and inflexible. No, Mr. Farquhar, you must not allow any quixotic notions to mingle with your conduct as a tradesman. And so they went on, Jemima's face glowing with sympathy in all Mr. Farquhar said, till once, on looking up suddenly with sparkling eyes, 
she saw a glance of her father's which told her as plain as words can say that he was watching the effect of mr farquhar's speeches upon his daughter she was chilled thenceforward she thought her father prolonged the argument in order to call out those sentiments which he knew would most recommend his partner to his daughter she would so fain have let herself love mr farquhar but this constant manoeuvring in which she did not feel clear that he did not take a passive part made her sick at heart she even wished that they might not go through the form of pretending to try to gain her consent to the marriage if it involved all this premeditated action and speech-making such moving about of every one into their right places like pieces at chess she felt as if she would rather be bought openly like an oriental daughter where no one is degraded in their own eyes by being parties to such a contract the consequence of all this admirable management of mr bradshaw's would have been very unfortunate to mr farquhar who was innocent of all connivance in any of the plots indeed would have been as much annoyed at them as jemima had he been aware of them but that the impression made upon him by ruth on the evening i have so lately described was deepened by the contrast which her behaviour made to miss bradshaw's on one or two more recent occasions there was no use he thought in continuing attentions so evidently distasteful to jemima to her a young girl hardly out of the schoolroom he probably appeared like an old man and he might even lose the friendship with which she used to regard him and which was and ever would be very dear to him if he persevered in trying to be considered as a lover he should always feel affectionately toward her her very faults gave her an interest in his eyes for which he had blamed himself most conscientiously and most uselessly when he was looking upon her as his future wife but which the said conscience would learn to approve of when she sank down to the place of a young friend over whom he might exercise a good and salutary interest mrs denby if not many months older in years had known sorrow and cares so early that she was much older in character besides her shy reserve and her quiet daily walk within the lines of duty were much in accordance with mr farquhar's notion of what a wife should be still it was a wrench to take his affections away from jemima if she had not helped him to do so by every means in her power he could never have accomplished it yes by every means in her power had jemima alienated her lover her beloved for so he was in fact and now her quick-sighted eyes saw he was gone for ever past recall for did not her jealous sore heart feel even before he himself was conscious of the fact that he was drawn towards sweet lovely composed and dignified ruth one who always thought before she spoke as mr farquhar used to bid jemima do who never was tempted by sudden impulse but walked the world calm and self-governed what now availed jemima's reproaches as she remembered the days when he had watched her with earnest attentive eyes as he now watched ruth and the time since when led astray by her morbid fancy she had turned away from all his advances it was only in march last march he called me dear jemima ah don't i remember it well the pretty nosegay of greenhouse flowers that he gave me in exchange for the wild daffodils and how he seemed to care for the flowers i gave him and how he looked at me and thanked me that is all gone and over now her sisters came in bright and glowing oh jemima how nice and cool you are sitting in this shady room she had felt it even chilly we have been such a long walk we are so tired it is so hot why did you go then said she oh we wanted to go we would not have stayed at home on any account it has been so pleasant said mary we have been to scoreside wood to gather wild strawberries said elizabeth 
such a quantity we've left a whole basketful in the dairy mr farquhar says he'll teach us to dress them in the way he learnt in germany if we can get him some hock do you think papa will let us have some was mr farquhar with you asked jemima a dull light coming into her eyes yes we told him this morning that mamma wanted us to take some old linen to the lame man at scawside farm and that we meant to coax mrs denby to let us go into the wood and gather strawberries said elizabeth i thought he would make some excuse and come said the quick-witted mary as eager and thoughtless an observer of one love affair as of another and quite forgetting that not many weeks ago she had fancied an attachment between him and jemima did you i did not replied elizabeth at least i never thought about it i was quite startled when i heard his horse's feet behind us on the road he said he was going to the farm and could take our basket was it not kind of him jemima did not answer so mary continued you know it's a great pull up to the farm and we were so hot already the road was quite white and baked it hurt my eyes terribly i was so glad when mrs denby said we might turn into the wood the light was quite green there the branches are so thick overhead and there are whole beds of wild strawberries said elizabeth taking up the tale now mary was out of breath mary fanned herself with her bonnet while elizabeth went on you know where the grey rock crops out don't you jemima well there was a complete carpet of strawberry runners so pretty and we could hardly step without treading the little bright scarlet berries underfoot we did so wish for leonard put in mary yes but mrs denby gathered a great many for him and mr farquhar gave her all his i thought you said he had gone on to dawson's farm said jemima oh yes he just went up there and then he left his horse there like a wise man and came to us in the pretty cool green wood oh jemima it was so pretty little flecks of light coming down here and there through the leaves and quivering on the ground you must go with us to-morrow yes said mary we're going again to-morrow we could not gather nearly all the strawberries and leonard is to go too to-morrow yes we thought of such a capital plan that's to say mr farquhar thought of it we wanted to carry leonard up the hill in a king's cushion but mrs denby would not hear of it she said it would tire us so and yet she wanted him to gather strawberries and so interrupted mary for by this time the two girls were almost speaking together mr farquhar is to bring him up before him on his horse you'll go with us won't you dear jemima asked elizabeth it will be at no i can't go said jemima abruptly don't ask me i can't the little girls were hushed into silence by her manner for whatever she might be to those above her in age and position to those below her jemima was almost invariably gentle she felt that they were wondering at her go upstairs and take off your things you know papa does not like you to come into this room in the shoes in which you have been out she was glad to out her sisters short in the details which they were so mercilessly inflicting details which she must harden herself to before she could hear them quietly and unmoved she saw that she had lost her place as the first object in mr farquhar's eyes a position she hardly cared for while she was secure in the enjoyment of it but the charm of it now was redoubled in her acute sense of how she forfeited it by her own doing and her own fault for if he was the cold calculating man her father had believed him to be and had represented him as being to her would he care for a portionless widow in humble circumstances like mrs denby no money no connection encumbered with her boy the very action which proved mr farquhar to be lost to jemima reinstated him on his throne in her fancy and she must go on in hushed quietness quivering with every fresh token of his preference for another 
that other too one so infinitely more worthy of him than herself so that she could not have even the poor comfort of thinking that he had no discrimination and was throwing himself away on a common or worthless person ruth was beautiful gentle good and conscientious the hot colour flushed up into jemima's sallow face as she became aware that even while she acknowledged these excellences on mrs denby's part she hated her the recollection of her marble face wearied her even to sickness the tones of her low voice were irritating from their very softness her goodness undoubted as it was was more distasteful than many faults which had more savour of human struggle in them what was this terrible demon in her heart asked jemima's better angel was she indeed given up to possession was not this the old stinging hatred which had prompted so many crimes the hatred of all sweet virtues which might win the love denied to us the old anger that wrought in the elder brother's heart till it ended in the murder of the gentle abel while yet the world was young oh god help me i did not know i was so wicked cried jemima aloud in her agony it had been a terrible glimpse into the dark lurid gulf the capability for evil in her heart she wrestled with the demon but he would not depart it was to be a struggle whether or not she was to be given up to him in this her time of sore temptation all the next day long she sat and pictured the happy strawberry gathering going on even then in pleasant scarside wood every touch of fancy which could heighten her idea of their enjoyment and of mr farquhar's attention to the blushing conscious ruth every such touch which would add a pang to her self-reproach and keen jealousy was added to her imagination she got up and walked about to try and stop her over-busy fancy by bodily exercise but she had eaten little all day and was weak and faint in the intense heat of the sunny garden even the long grass walk under the filbert hedge was parched and dry in the glowing august sun yet her sisters found her there when they returned walking quickly up and down as if to warm herself on some winter's day they were very weary and not half so communicative as on the day before now that jemima was craving for every detail to add to her agony yes leonard came up before mr farquhar oh how hot it is jemima do sit down and i'll tell you about it but i can't tell if you keep walking so i can't sit still to-day said jemima springing up from the turf as soon as she had sat down tell me i can hear you while i walk about oh but i can't shout i can hardly speak i am so tired mr farquhar brought leonard you've told me that before said jemima sharply well i don't know what else to tell somebody had been since yesterday and gathered nearly all the strawberries off the grey rock jemima jemima said elizabeth faintly i am so dizzy i think i am ill the next minute the tired girl lay swooning on the grass it was an outlet for jemima's fierce energy with a strength she had never again and never had known before she lifted up her fainting sister and bidding mary run and clear the way she carried her in through the open garden door up the wide old-fashioned stairs and laid her on the bed in her own room where the breeze from the window came softly and pleasantly through the green shade of the vine leaves and jessamine give me the water run for mamma mary said jemima as she saw that the fainting fit did not yield to the usual remedy of a horizontal position and water sprinkling dear dear lizzie said jemima kissing the pale unconscious face i think you loved me darling the long walk on the hot day had been too much for the delicate elizabeth who was fast outgrowing her strength 
it was many days before she regained any portion of her spirit and vigour after that fainting fit she lay listless and weary without appetite or interest through the long sunny autumn weather on the bed or on the couch in jemima's room whither she had been carried at first it was a comfort to mrs bradshaw to be able at once to discover what it was that had knocked up elizabeth she did not rest easily until she had settled upon a cause for every ailment or illness in the family it was a stern consolation to mr bradshaw during his time of anxiety respecting his daughter to be able to blame somebody he could not like his wife have taken comfort from an inanimate fact he wanted the satisfaction of feeling that some one had been in fault or else this never could have happened poor ruth did not need his implied reproaches when she saw her gentle elizabeth lying feeble and languid her heart blamed her for thoughtlessness so severely as to make her take all mr bradshaw's words and hints as too light censure for the careless way in which to please her own child she had allowed her two pupils to fatigue themselves with such long walks she begged hard to take her share of nursing every spare moment she went to mr bradshaw's and asked with earnest humility to be allowed to pass them with elizabeth and as it was often a relief to have her assistance mrs bradshaw received these entreaties very kindly and desired her to go upstairs where elizabeth's pale countenance brightened when she saw her but where jemima sat in silent annoyance that her own room was now become open ground for one whom her heart rose up against to enter in and be welcomed whether it was that ruth who was not an inmate of the house brought with her a fresher air more change of thought to the invalid i do not know but elizabeth always gave her a peculiarly tender greeting and if she had sunk down into languid fatigue in spite of all jemima's endeavours to interest her she roused up into animation when ruth came in with a flower a book or a brown and ruddy pear sending out the warm fragrance it retained from the sunny garden wall at chapel house the jealous dislike which jemima was allowing to grow up in her heart against ruth was as she thought never shown in word or deed she was cold in manner because she could not be hypocritical but her words were polite and kind in purport and she took pains to make her actions the same as formerly but rule and line may measure out the figure of a man it is the soul that gives it life and there was no soul no inner meaning breathing out in jemima's actions ruth felt the change acutely she suffered from it some time before she ventured to ask what had occasioned it one day she took miss bradshaw by surprise when they were alone together for a few minutes by asking her if she had vexed her in any way she was so changed it is sad when friendship has cooled so far as to render such a question necessary jemima went rather paler than usual and then made answer changed how do you mean how am i changed what do i say or do different from what i used to do but the tone was so constrained and cold that ruth's heart sank within her she knew now as well as words could have told her that not only had the old feeling of love passed away from jemima but that it had gone unregretted and no attempt had been made to recall it love was very precious to ruth now as of old time it was one of the faults of her nature to be ready to make any sacrifices for those who loved her and to value affection almost above its price she had yet to learn the lesson that it is more blessed to love than to be beloved and lonely as the impressible years of her youth had been without parents without brother or sister it was perhaps no wonder that she clung tenaciously to every symptom of regard and could not relinquish 
the love of any one without a pang. The doctor, who was called in to Elizabeth, prescribed sea air as the best means of recruiting her strength. Mr. Bradshaw, who liked to spend money ostentatiously, went down straight to Abermouth and engaged a house for the remainder of the autumn, for, as he told the medical man, money was no object to him in comparison with his children's health, and the doctor cared too little about the mode in which his remedy was administered to tell Mr. Bradshaw that lodgings would have done as well, or better than the complete house he had seen fit to take for it was now necessary to engage servants and take much trouble which might have been obviated and elizabeth's removal effected more quietly and speedily if she had gone into lodgings as it was she was weary of hearing all the planning and talking and deciding and undeciding and redeciding before it was possible for her to go her only comfort was in the thought that dear mrs denby was to go with her it had not been entirely by way of pompously spending his money that mr bradshaw had engaged this seaside house he was glad to get his little girls and their governess out of the way for a busy time was impending when he should want his head clear for electioneering purposes and his house clear for hospitality he was the mover of a project for bringing forward a man on the liberal and dissenting interest to contest the election with the old tory member who had on several successive occasions walked over the course as he and his family owned half the town and votes and rent were paid alike to the landlord kings of eccleston had mr cranworth and his ancestors been this many a long year their right was so little disputed that they never thought of acknowledging the allegiance so readily paid to them. The old feudal feeling between landowner and tenant did not quake prophetically at the introduction of manufactures. The Cranworth family ignored the growing power of the manufacturers, more especially as the principal person engaged in the trade was a dissenter but notwithstanding this lack of patronage from the one great family in the neighbourhood the business flourished increased and spread wide and the dissenting head thereof looked around about the time of which i speak and felt himself powerful enough to defy the great cranworth interest even in their hereditary stronghold and by so doing avenge the slights of many years slights which rankled in mr bradshaw's mind as much as if he did not go to chapel twice every sunday and pay the largest pew-rent of any member of mr benson's congregation accordingly mr bradshaw had applied to one of the liberal parliamentary agents in london a man whose only principle was to do wrong on the liberal side he would not act right or wrong for a tory but for a Whig the latitude of his conscience had never yet been discovered. It was possible Mr. Bradshaw was not aware of the character of this agent. At any rate, he knew he was the man for his purpose, which was to hear of some one who would come forward as a candidate for the representation of Eccleston on the dissenting interest. There are in round numbers about six hundred voters, said he two hundred are decidedly in the cranworth interest dare not offend mr cranworth poor souls two hundred more we may calculate upon as pretty certain factory hands or people connected with our trade in some way or another who are indignant at the stubborn way in which cranworth has contested the right of water two hundred are doubtful don't much care either way said the parliamentary agent of course we must make them care mr bradshaw rather shrank from the knowing look with which this was said he hoped that mr pilson did not mean to allude to bribery but he did not express this hope because he thought it would deter the agent from using this means and it was possible it might prove to be the only way and if he mr bradshaw once embarked on such an enterprise there must be no failure 
by some expedient or another success must be certain or he could have nothing to do with it the parliamentary agent was well accustomed to deal with all kinds and shades of scruples he was most at home with men who had none but still he could allow for human weakness and he perfectly understood mr bradshaw i have a notion i know of a man who will just suit your purpose plenty of money does not know what to do with it in fact tired of yachting travelling wants something new i heard through some of the means of intelligence i employ that not very long ago he was wishing for a seat in parliament a liberal said mr bradshaw decidedly belongs to a family who were in the long parliament in their day mr bradshaw rubbed his hands dissenter asked he no no not so far as that but very lax church what is his name asked mr bradshaw eagerly excuse me until i am certain that he would like to come forward for eccleston i think i had better not mention his name the anonymous gentleman did like to come forward and his name proved to be dunn he and mr bradshaw had been in correspondence during all the time of mr ralph cranworth's illness and when he died everything was arranged ready for a start even before the cranworths had determined who should keep the seat warm till the eldest son came of age for the father was already member for the county mr dunn was to come down to canvas in person and was to take up his abode at mr bradshaw's and therefore it was that the seaside house within twenty miles distance of eccleston was found to be so convenient as an infirmary and nursery for those members of his family who were likely to be useless if not positive encumbrances during the forthcoming election End of chapter 21chapter twenty two the liberal candidate and his precursor jemima did not know whether she wished to go to abermouth or not she longed for change she wearied of the sights and sounds of home but yet she could not bear to leave the neighbourhood of mr farquhar especially as if she went to abermouth ruth would in all probability be left to take her holiday at home when mr bradshaw decided that she was to go ruth tried to feel glad that he gave her the means of repairing her fault towards elizabeth and she resolved to watch over the two girls most faithfully and carefully and to do all in her power to restore the invalid to health but a tremor came over her whenever she thought of leaving leonard she had never quitted him for a day and it seemed to her as if her brooding constant care was his natural and necessary shelter from all evils from very death itself she would not go to sleep at nights in order to enjoy the blessed consciousness of having him near her when she was away from him teaching her pupils she kept trying to remember his face and print it deep on her heart against the time when days and days would elapse without her seeing that little darling countenance miss benson would wonder to her brother that mr bradshaw did not propose that leonard should accompany his mother he only begged her not to put such an idea into ruth's head as he was sure mr bradshaw had no thoughts of doing any such thing yet to ruth it might be a hope and then a disappointment his sister scolded him for being so cold-hearted but he was full of sympathy although he did not express it and made some quiet little sacrifices in order to set himself at liberty to take leonard a long walking expedition on the day when his mother left eccleston ruth cried until she could cry no longer and felt very much ashamed of herself as she saw the grave and wondering looks of her pupils whose only feeling on leaving home was delight at the idea of abermouth and into whose minds the possibility of death to any of their beloved ones never entered 
Ruth dried her eyes and spoke cheerfully as soon as she caught the perplexed expression of their faces, and by the time they arrived at Abermouth she was as much delighted with all the new scenery as they were, and found it hard work to resist their entreaties to go rambling out on the seashore at once. But Elizabeth had undergone more fatigue that day than she had had before for many weeks, and Ruth was determined to be prudent. Meanwhile, the Bradshaw's house at Eccleston was being rapidly adapted for electioneering hospitality. The partition wall between the unused drawing-room and the schoolroom was broken down in order to admit of folding doors. The ingenious upholsterer of the town, and what town does not boast of the upholsterer full of contrivances and resources in opposition to the upholsterer of steady capital and no imagination, who looks down with uneasy contempt on ingenuity, had come in to give his opinion that nothing could be easier than to convert a bathroom into a bedroom by the assistance of a little drapery to conceal the shower-bath, the string of which was to be carefully concealed, for fear that the unconscious occupier of the bath-bed might innocently take it for a bell-rope. The professional cook of the town had been already engaged to take up her abode for a month at Mr. Bradshaw's, much to the indignation of Betsy, who became a vehement partisan of Mr. Cranworth. As soon as ever she heard of the plan of her deposition from sovereign authority in the kitchen, in which she had reigned supreme for fourteen years, Mrs. Bradshaw sighed and bemoaned herself in all her leisure moments, which were not many and wondered why their house was to be turned into an inn for this Mr. Dunn, when everybody knew that the George was good enough for the Cranworths, who never thought of asking the electors to the hall. And they had lived at Cranworth ever since Julius Caesar's time, and if that was not being an old family, she did not know what was. The excitement soothed Jemima. There was something to do. It was she who planned with the upholsterer, it was she who soothed Betsy into angry silence. It was she who persuaded her mother to lie down and rest, while she herself went out to buy the heterogeneous things required to make the family and house presentable to Mr. Dunn and his precursor, the friend of the parliamentary agent. This latter gentleman never appeared himself on the scene of action, but pulled all the strings notwithstanding. The friend was a Mr. Hickson, a lawyer, a briefless barrister, some people called him, but he himself professed a great disgust to the law as a great sham, which involved an immensity of underhanded action, and truckling and time-serving, and was perfectly encumbered by useless forms and ceremonies, and dead obsolete words. So, Instead of putting his shoulder to the wheel to reform the law, he talked eloquently against it, in such a high priest's style that it was occasionally a matter of surprise how he could ever have made a friend of the parliamentary agent before mentioned. But, as Mr. Hickson himself said, it was the very corruptness of the law which he was fighting against in doing all he could to effect the return of certain members to Parliament, these certain members being pledged to effect a reform in the law, according to Mr. Hickson. And, as he once observed confidentially, if you had to destroy a hydra-headed monster, would you measure swords with the demon as if he were a gentleman? Would you not rather seize the first weapon that came to hand? And so do I. My great object in life, sir, is to reform the law of England, sir. Once get a majority of Liberal members into the House, and the thing is done. And I consider myself justified for so high, for, I may say, so holy an end, in using men's weaknesses to work out my purpose. Of course, if men were angels, or even immaculate, men invulnerable to bribes, we would not bribe. Could you ask Jemima 
for the conversation took place at Mr. Bradshaw's dinner-table, where a few friends were gathered together to meet Mr. Hickson, and among them was Mr. Benson. "'We neither would nor could,' said the ardent barrister, disregarding, in his vehemence, the point of the question, and floating on over the bar of argument into the wide ocean of his own eloquence. As it is, as the world stands, they who would succeed even in good deeds must come down to the level of expediency, and therefore, I say once more, if Mr. Dunn is the man for your purpose, and your purpose is a good one, a lofty one, a holy one, for Mr. Hickson remembered the dissenting character of his little audience, and privately considered the introduction of the word holy a most happy hit. Then, I say, we must put all the squeamish scruples which might befit Utopia, or some such place, on one side, and treat men as they are. If they are avaricious, it is not we who have made them so, but as we have to do with them, we must consider their failings in dealing with them. If they had been careless or extravagant, or have had their little peccadilloes, we must administer the screw. The glorious reform of the law will justify, in my idea, all means to obtain the end. That law, from the profession of which I have withdrawn myself from perhaps a too scrupulous conscience, he concluded softly to himself. "'We are not to do evil that good may come,' said Mr. Benson. He was startled at the deep sound of his own voice as he uttered these words. But he had not been speaking for some time, and his voice came forth strong and unmodulated. "'True, sir, most true,' said Mr. Hickson, bowing. "'I honour you for the observation.' and he profited by it in so much that he confined his further remarks on elections to the end of the table, where he sat near Mr. Bradshaw, and one or two equally eager, though not equally influential partisans of Mr. Dunn's. Meanwhile, Mr. Farquhar took up Mr. Benson's quotation at the end where he and Jemima sat down near to Mrs. Bradshaw and him. But, in the present state of the world, as Mr. Hickson says, it is rather difficult to act upon that precept. Oh, Mr. Farquhar, said Jemima indignantly, the tears springing to her eyes with a feeling of disappointment, for she had been chafing under all that Mr. Hickson had been saying, perhaps the more for one or two attempts on his part at flirtation with the daughter of his wealthy host, which she resented with all the loathing of a preoccupied heart, and she had longed to be a man to speak out her wrath at this paltering with right and wrong. She had felt grateful to Mr. Benson for his one clear short precept, coming down with a divine force against which there was no appeal and now to have Mr. Farquhar taking the side of expediency. It was too bad. "'Nay, Jemima,' said Mr. Farquhar, touched and secretly flattered by the visible pain his speech had given. "'Don't be indignant with me till I, I have explained myself a little more. I don't understand myself yet, and it is a very intricate question, or so it appears to me, which I was going to put really, earnestly and humbly, for Mr. Benson's opinion. Now, Mr. Benson, may I ask if you always find it practicable to act strictly in accordance with that principle? For, if you do not, I am sure no man living can. Are there not occasions when it is absolutely necessary to wade through evil to good? I am not speaking in the careless, presumptuous way of that man yonder, said he, lowering his voice and addressing himself to Jemima more exclusively. I am really anxious to hear what Mr. Benson will say on the subject, for I know no one to whose candid opinion I should attach more weight. But Mr. Benson was silent. He did not see Mrs. Bradshaw and Jemima leave the room. He was really, as Mr. Farquhar supposed him, completely absent 
questioning himself as to how far his practice tallied with his principle by degrees he came to himself he found the conversation still turned on the election and mr hickson who felt that he had jarred against the little minister's principles and yet knew from the carte du pays which the scouts of the parliamentary agent had given him that mr benson was a person to be conciliated on account of his influence over many of the working people began to ask him questions with an air of deferring to superior knowledge that almost surprised mr bradshaw who had been accustomed to treat benson in a very different fashion of civil condescending indulgence just as one listens to a child who can have no opportunities of knowing better at the end of a conversation that mr hickson held with mr benson on a subject in which the latter was really interested and on which he had expressed himself at some length the young barrister turned to mr bradshaw and said very audibly i wish dunn had been here this conversation during the last half hour would have interested him almost as much as it has done me mr bradshaw little guessed the truth that mr dunn was at that very moment coaching up the various subjects of public interest at eccleston and privately cursing the particular subject on which mr benson had been holding forth as being an unintelligible piece of quixotism or the leading dissenter of the town need not have experienced a pang of jealousy at the possible future admiration his minister might excite in the possible future member for eccleston and if mr benson had been clairvoyant he need not have made an especial subject of gratitude out of the likelihood that he might have an opportunity of so far interesting mr dunn in the condition of the people of eccleston as to induce him to set his face against any attempts at bribery mr benson thought of this half the night through and ended by determining to write a sermon on the christian view of political duties which might be good for all both electors and member to hear on the eve of an election for mr dunn was expected at mr bradshaw's before the next sunday and of course as mr and miss benson had settled it he would appear at the chapel with them on that day but the stinging conscience refused to be quieted no present plan of usefulness allayed the aching remembrance of the evil he had done that good might come not even the look of leonard as the early dawn fell on him and mr benson's sleepless eyes saw the rosy glow on his firm round cheeks his open mouth through which the soft long-drawn breath came gently quivering and his eyes not fully shut but closed to outward sight not even the aspect of the quiet innocent child could soothe the troubled spirit leonard and his mother dreamt of each other that night her dream of him was one of undefined terror terror so great that it wakened her up and she strove not to sleep again for fear that ominous ghastly dream should return he on the contrary dreamt of her sitting watching and smiling by his bedside as her gentle self had been many a morning and when she saw him awake so it fell out in the dream she smiled still more sweetly and bending down she kissed him and then spread out large soft white feathered wings which in no way surprised her child he seemed to have known they were there all along and sailed away through the open window far into the blue sky of a summer's day leonard wakened up then and remembered how far away she really was far more distant and inaccessible than the beautiful blue sky to which she had betaken herself in his dream and cried himself to sleep again in spite of her absence from her child which made one great and abiding sorrow ruth enjoyed her seaside visit exceedingly in the first place 
there was the delight of seeing elizabeth's daily and almost hourly improvement then at the doctor's express orders there were so few lessons to be done that there was time for the long exploring rambles which all three delighted in and when the rain came on and the storms blew the house with its wild sea views was equally delightful it was a large house built on the summit of a rock which nearly overhung the shore below there was to be sure a series of zigzag tacking paths down the face of this rock but from the house they could not be seen old or delicate people would have considered the situation bleak and exposed indeed the present proprietor wanted to dispose of it on this very account but by its present inhabitants this exposure and bleakness was called by other names and considered as charms from every part of the rooms they saw the grey storms gather on the sea horizon and put themselves in marching array and soon the march became a sweep and the great dome of the heavens was covered with the lurid clouds between which and the vivid green earth below there seemed to come a purple atmosphere making the very threatening beautiful and by and by the house was wrapped in sheets of rain shutting out sky and sea and inland view till of a sudden the storm was gone by and the heavy raindrops glistened in the sun as they hung on leaf and grass and the little birds sang east and the little birds sang west and there was a pleasant sound of running waters all abroad oh if papa would but buy this house exclaimed elizabeth after one such storm which she had watched silently from the very beginning of the little cloud no bigger than a man's hand mamma would never like it i am afraid said mary she would call our delicious gushes of air draughts and think we should catch cold jemima would be on our side but how long mrs denbigh is i hope she was near enough to the post office when the rain came on ruth had gone to the shop in the little village about a half a mile distant where all the letters were left till fetched she only expected one but that one was to tell her of leonard she however received two the unexpected one was from mr bradshaw and the news it contained was if possible a greater surprise than the letter itself mr bradshaw informed her that he planned arriving by dinner-time the following saturday at eagle's crag and more that he intended bringing mr dunn and one or two other gentlemen with him to spend the sunday there the letter went on to give every possible direction regarding the household preparations the dinner hour was fixed to be at six but of course ruth and the girls would have dined long before the professional cook would arrive the day before laden with all the provisions that could not be obtained on the spot ruth was to engage a waiter from the inn and this it was that detained her so long while she sat in the little parlour awaiting the coming of the landlady she could not help wondering why mr bradshaw was bringing this strange gentleman to spend two days at abermouth and thus giving himself so much trouble and fuss of preparation there were so many small reasons that went to make up the large one which had convinced mr bradshaw of the desirableness of this step that it was not likely that ruth should guess at one half of them in the first place miss benson in the pride and fulness of her heart had told mrs bradshaw what her brother had told her how he meant to preach upon the christian view of the duties involved in political rights and as of course mrs bradshaw had told mr bradshaw he began to dislike the idea of attending chapel on that sunday at all for he had an uncomfortable idea that by the christian standard that divine test of the true and pure bribery would not be altogether approved of and yet he was tacitly coming round to the understanding that packets would be required for what purpose both he and mr dunn 
were to be supposed to remain ignorant but it would be very awkward so near to the time if he were to be clearly convinced that bribery however disguised by names and words was in plain terms a sin and yet he knew mr benson had once or twice convinced him against his will of certain things which he had thenceforward found it impossible to do without such great uneasiness of mind that he had left off doing them which was sadly against his interest and if mr dunn whom he had intended to take with him to chapel as fair dissenting prey should also become convinced why the cranworths would win the day and he should be the laughing-stock of eccleston no in this one case bribery must be allowed was allowable but it was a great pity human nature was so corrupt and if his member succeeded he would double his subscription to the schools in order that the next generation might be taught better there were various other reasons which strengthened mr bradshaw in the bright idea of going down to abermouth for the sunday some connected with the out-of-door politics and some with the domestic for instance it had been the plan of the house to have a cold dinner on the sunday mr bradshaw had piqued himself on this strictness and yet he had instinctive feeling that mr dunn was not quite the man to partake of cold meat for conscience sake with cheerful indifference to his fare mr dunn had in fact taken the bradshaw household a little by surprise before he came mr bradshaw had pleased himself with thinking that more unlikely things had happened than the espousal of his daughter with the member of a small borough but this pretty airy bubble burst as soon as he saw mr dunn and its very existence was forgotten in less than half an hour when he felt the quiet but incontestable difference of rank and standard that there was in every respect between his guest and his own family it was not through any circumstance so palpable and possibly accidental as the bringing down a servant who mr dunn seemed to consider as much a matter of course as a carpet-bag though the smart gentleman's arrival fluttered the volsians in Corolli considerably more than his gentle-spoken masters it was nothing like this it was something indescribable a quiet being at ease and expecting every one else to be so an attention to women which was so habitual as to be unconsciously exercised to those subordinate persons in mr bradshaw's family a happy choice of simple and expressive words some of which it must be confessed were slang but fashionable slang and that makes all the difference a measured graceful way of utterance with a style of pronunciation quite different to that of eccleston all these put together make but a part of the indescribable whole which unconsciously affected mr bradshaw and established mr dunn in his estimation as a creature quite different to any he had seen before and as most unfit to mate with jemima mr hickson who had appeared as a model of gentlemanly ease before mr dunn's arrival now became vulgar and coarse in mr bradshaw's eyes and yet such was the charm of that languid high-bred manner that mr bradshaw cottoned as he expressed it to mr farquhar to his new candidate at once he was only afraid lest mr dunn was too indifferent to all things under the sun to care whether he gained or lost the election but he was reassured after the first conversation they had together on the subject mr dunn's eye lightened with an eagerness that was almost fierce though his tones were as musical and nearly as slow as ever when mr bradshaw alluded distantly to probable expenses and packets mr dunn replied 
oh of course disagreeable necessity better speak as little about such things as possible other people can be found to arrange all the dirty work neither you nor i would like to soil our fingers by it i am sure four thousand pounds are in mr pilson's hands and i shall never inquire what becomes of them they may very probably be absorbed in the law expenses you know i shall let it be clearly understood from the hustings that i most decidedly disapprove of bribery and leave the rest to hickson's management he is accustomed to these sort of things i am not mr bradshaw was rather perplexed by this want of bustling energy on the part of the new candidate and if it had not been for the four thousand pounds aforesaid would have doubted whether mr dunn cared sufficiently for the result of the election jemima thought differently she watched her father's visitor attentively with something like the curious observation which a naturalist bestows on a new species of animal do you know what mr dunn reminds me of mamma said she one day as the two sat at work while the gentlemen were absent canvassing no he is not like anybody i ever saw he quite frightens me by being so ready to open the door for me if i am going out of the room and by giving me a chair when i come in i never saw any one like him who is it jemima not any person not any human being mamma said jemima half smiling do you remember our stopping at wakefield once on our way to scarborough and there were horse races going on somewhere and some of the racers were in the stables at the inn where we dined yes i remember it but what about that why richard somehow knew one of the jockeys and as we were coming in from our ramble throughout the town this man or boy asked us to look at one of the racers he had the charge of well my dear well mamma mr dunn is like that horse nonsense jemima you must not say so i don't know what your father would say if he heard you likening mr dunn to a brute brutes are sometimes very beautiful mamma i am sure i should think it a compliment to be likened to a racehorse such as the one we saw but the thing in which they are alike is the sort of repressed eagerness in both eager why i should say there never was any one cooler than mr dunn think of the trouble your papa had this month past and then remember the slow way in which mr dunn moves when he is going out to canvas and the low drawling voice in which he questions the people who bring him intelligence i can see your papa standing by ready to shake them to get out their news but mr dunn's questions are always to the point and force out the grain without the chaff and look at him if any one tells him ill news about the election have you never seen a dull red light come into his eyes that is like my racehorse her flesh quivered all over at certain sounds and noises which had some meaning to her but she stood quite still pretty creature now mr dunn is just as eager as she was though he may be too proud to show it though he seems so gentle i almost think he is very headstrong in following out his own will well don't call him like a horse again for i am sure papa would not like it do you know i thought you were going to say he was like little leonard when you asked me who he was like leonard oh mamma he is not in the least like leonard he is twenty times more like my racehorse now my dear jemima do be quiet your father thinks racing so wrong that i am sure he would be very seriously displeased if he were to hear you to return to mr bradshaw and to give one more of his various reasons for wishing to take mr dunn to abermouth the wealthy eccleston manufacturer was uncomfortably impressed with an indefinable sense of inferiority to his visitor it was not in education for mr bradshaw was a well-educated man it was not in power for if he chose the present object of mr dunn's life might be utterly defeated it did not arise from anything overbearing in manner for mr dunn was habitually polite and courteous 
and was just now anxious to propitiate his host, whom he looked upon as a very useful man. Whatever this sense of inferiority arose from, Mr. Bradshaw was anxious to relieve himself from it, and imagined that if he could make more display of his wealth, his object would be obtained. Now his house in Eccleston was old-fashioned and ill-calculated to exhibit money's worth. His mode of living, though strained to a high pitch just at this time, he became aware was no more than Mr. Dunn was accustomed to every day of his life. The first day at dessert, some remark, some opportune remark, as Mr. Bradshaw in his innocence had thought, was made regarding the price of pineapples, which was rather exorbitant that year, and Mr. Dunn asked Mrs. Bradshaw, with quiet surprise, if they had no pinery, as if to be without pinery were indeed a depth of pitiable destitution. In fact, Mr. Dunn had been born and cradled in all that wealth could purchase, and so had his ancestors before him for so many generations, that refinement and luxury seemed the natural condition of man and they that dwelt without were in the position of monsters. The absence was noticed, but not the presence. Now Mr. Bradshaw knew that the house and grounds of Eagle's Crag were exorbitantly dear, and yet he really thought of purchasing them. And as one means of exhibiting his wealth, and so raising himself up to the level of Mr. Dunn, he thought that if he could take the ladder down to Abermouth and show him the place for which, because his little girls had taken a fancy to it, he was willing to give the fancy price of fourteen thousand pounds, he should, at last, make those half-shut dreamy eyes open wide, and their owner confess that, in wealth at least, the Eccleston manufacturer stood on a par with him. All these mingled motives caused the determination which made Ruth sit in the little inn parlour of Abermouth during the wild storm's passage. She wondered if she had fulfilled all Mr. Bradshaw's directions. She looked at the letter. Yes, everything was done, and now home with her news through the wet lane where the little pools by the roadside reflected the deep blue sky and the round white clouds with even deeper blue and clearer white, and the raindrops hung so thick on the trees that even a little bird's flight was enough to shake them down in a bright shower as of rain. When she told the news, Mary exclaimed, "'Oh, how charming! Then we shall see this new member after all.' while Elizabeth added, "'Yes, I shall like to do that. But where must we be? Papa will want the dining-room, and this room, and where must we sit?' "'Oh,' said Ruth, "'in the dressing-room next to my room. All that your papa wants always is that you are quiet and out of the way.'" End of chapter 22《Chapter Twenty Three of Ruth by Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell》Recognition Saturday came. Torn, ragged clouds were driven across the sky. It was not a becoming day for the scenery, and the little girls regretted it much. First they hoped for a change at twelve o'clock, and then at the afternoon tide-turning, but at neither time did the sun show his face. "'Papa will never buy this dear place,' said Elizabeth sadly, as she watched the weather. "'The sun is everything to it. The sea looks quite leaden to-day, and there's no sparkle on it. And the sands, that were so yellow and sun-sparkled on Thursday, are all one dull brown now.' "'Never mind. Tomorrow may be better,' said Ruth cheerily. "'I wonder what time they will come at,' inquired Mary." Your papa said they would be at the station at five o'clock, and the landlady at the Swan said it would take them half an hour to get here. "'And are they to dine at six? asked Elizabeth. "'Yes,' answered Ruth, "'and I think, if we 
had our tea half an hour earlier at half-past four, and then went out for a walk, we should be nicely out of the way, just during the bustle of the arrival and dinner, and we could be in the drawing-room, ready against your papa came in after dinner. Oh, that would be nice, said they, and tea was ordered accordingly. The south-westerly wind had dropped, and the clouds were stationary, when they went out on the sands. They dug little holes near the incoming tide, and made canals to them from the water, and blew the light sea-foam against each other, and then stole on tiptoe near to the groups of grey and white seagulls, which despised their caution, flying softly and slowly away to a little distance as soon as they drew near. And in all this Ruth was as great a child as any. Only she longed for Leonard with a mother's longing, as indeed she did every day, and all hours of the day. By and by the clouds thickened yet more, and one or two drops of rain were felt. It was very little, but Ruth feared a shower for her delicate Elizabeth, and besides, the September evening was fast closing in the dark and sunless day. As they turned homewards in the rapidly increasing dusk, they saw three figures on the sand near the rocks, coming in their direction. "'Papa and Mr. Dunn!' exclaimed Mary. "'Now we shall see him.' "'Which do you make out is him?' asked Elizabeth. "'Oh, the tall one, to be sure. Don't you see how Papa always turns to him, as if he were speaking to him, and not to the other?' "'Who is the other?' asked Elizabeth. "'Mr. Bradshaw said that Mr. Farquhar and Mr. Hickson would come with him. "'But that is not Mr. Farquhar, I am sure,' said Ruth. "'The girls looked at each other, as they always did, "'when Ruth mentioned Mr. Farquhar's name. "'But she was perfectly unconscious both of the look "'and of the conjectures which gave rise to it. "'As soon as the two parties drew near, Mr. Bradshaw called out in his strong voice, "'Well, my dears, we found there was an hour before dinner, so we came down upon the sands, and here you are.' The tone of his voice assured them that he was in a bland and indulgent mood, and the two little girls ran towards him. He kissed them, and shook hands with Ruth told his companions that these were the little girls who were tempting him to this extravagance of purchasing Eagle's Crag, and then, rather doubtfully, and because he saw that Mr. Dunn expected it, he introduced my daughter's governess, Mrs. Denby. It was growing darker every moment, and it was time they should hasten back to the rocks, which were even now indistinct in the grey haze. Mr. Bradshaw held a hand of each of his daughters, and Ruth walked alongside, the two strange gentlemen being on the outskirts of the party. Mr. Bradshaw began to give his little girls some home news. He told them that Mr. Farquhar was ill and could not accompany them, but Jemima and their mamma were quite well. The gentleman nearest to Ruth spoke to her. "'Are you fond of the sea?' asked he. There was no answer, so he repeated his question in a different form. "'Do you enjoy staying by the seaside? I should rather ask.' The reply was yes, rather breathed out in a deep inspiration than spoken in a sound. The sands heaved and trembled beneath Ruth. The figures near her vanished into strange nothingness. The sounds of their voices were as distant sounds in a dream, while the echo of one voice thrilled through and through. She could have caught at his arm for support, in the awful dizziness which wrapped her up body and soul. That voice, no, if name and face and figure were all changed, that voice was the same which had touched her girlish heart which had spoken most tender words of love, which had won and wrecked her, and which she had last heard in the low mutterings of fever. She dared not look round to see the figure of him who spoke, dark as it was. She knew he was there, 
she heard him speak in the manner in which he used to address strangers years ago. Perhaps she answered him, perhaps she did not, God knew. It seemed as if weights were tied to her feet, as if the steadfast rocks receded, as if time stood still. It was so long, so terrible, that path across the reeling sand. At the foot of the rocks they separated. Mr. Bradshaw, afraid lest dinner should cool, preferred the shorter way for himself and his friends. On Elizabeth's account, the girls were to take the longer and easier path, which wound upwards through a rocky field where larks' nests abounded, and where wild thyme and heather were now throwing out their sweets to the soft night air. The little girls spoke in eager discussion of the strangers. They appealed to Ruth, but Ruth did not answer, and they were too impatient to convince each other to repeat the question. The first little ascent from the sands to the fields surmounted, Ruth sat down suddenly and covered her face with her hands. This was so unusual. Their wishes, their good, was so invariably the rule of motion or of rest in their walks, that the girls, suddenly checked, stood silent and affrighted in surprise. They were still more startled when Ruth wailed aloud some inarticulate words. "'Are you not well, dear Mrs. Denby?' asked Elizabeth gently, kneeling down on the grass by Ruth. She sat facing the west. The low, watery twilight was on her face as she took her hands away, so pale, so haggard, so wild and wandering a look the girls had never seen on human countenance before. "'Well, what are you doing here with me? You should not be with me,' said she, shaking her head slowly. They looked at each other. "'You are sadly tired,' said Elizabeth soothingly. "'Come home and let me help you to bed. I will tell papa you are ill and ask him to send for a doctor.' Ruth looked at her as if she did not understand the meaning of her words. No more she did at first. But by and by the dull brain began to think most vividly and rapidly, and she spoke in a sharp way which deceived the girls into a belief that nothing had been the matter. Yes, I was tired, I am tired, those sands, oh, those sands, those weary, dreadful sands, but that is all over now, only my heart aches still. Feel how it flutters and beats, said she, taking Elizabeth's hand and holding it to her side. I am quite well, though, she continued, reading pity in the child's looks as if she felt the trembling, quivering beat. We will go straight into the dressing-room and read a chapter that will still my heart, and then I'll go to bed, and Mr. Bradshaw will excuse me, I know, this one night. I only ask for one night. Put on your right frocks, dears, and do all you ought to do. But I know you will, said she, bending down to kiss Elizabeth, and then, before she had done so, raising her head abruptly. You are good and dear girls, God keep you so. By a strong effort at self-command, she went onwards at an even pace, neither rushing nor pausing to sob and think. The very regularity of motion calmed her. The front and back doors of the house were on two sides, at right angles with each other. They all shrank a little from the idea of going in at the front door now that the strange gentlemen were about, and accordingly they went through the quiet farmyard right into the bright ruddy kitchen, where the servants were dashing about with the dinner things. It was a contrast in more than colour to the lonely dusky field, which even the little girls perceived, and the noise, the warmth, the very bustle of the servants, were a positive relief to Ruth. And for the time lifted off the heavy press of pent-up passion. A silent house, with moonlit rooms, or with a faint gloom brooding over the apartments, would have been more to be dreaded. Then she must have given way and cried out. As it was, she went up the old, awkward back stairs, 
and into the room they were to sit in. There was no candle. Mary volunteered to go down for one, and when she returned she was full of the wonders of preparation in the drawing-room, and ready and eager to dress, so as to take her place there before the gentlemen had finished dinner. But she was struck by the strange paleness of Ruth's face, now that the light fell upon it. "'Stay up here, dear Mrs. Denby. We'll tell papa you are tired and gone to bed.' Another time Ruth would have dreaded Mr. Bradshaw's displeasure, for it was an understood thing that no one was to be ill or tired in his household without leave asked, and cause given and assigned. But she never thought of that now. Her great desire was to hold quiet till she was alone. Quietness it was not. It was rigidity. But she succeeded in being rigid in look and movement, and went through her duties to Elizabeth, who preferred remaining with her upstairs, with wooden precision. But her heart felt at times like ice, at times like burning fire, always a heavy, heavy weight within her. At last Elizabeth went to bed. Still Ruth dared not think. Mary would come upstairs soon, and with a strange, sick, shrinking yearning, Ruth awaited her and the crumbs of intelligence she might drop out about him. Ruth's sense of hearing was quickened to miserable intensity as she stood before the chimney-piece, grasping it tight with both hands, gazing into the dying fire, but seeing not the dead grey embers or the little sparks of vivid light that ran hither and thither among the wood ashes, but an old farmhouse and climbing, winding road, and a little golden breezy common with a rural inn on the hilltop far far away and through the thoughts of the past came the sharp sounds of the present of three voices one of which was almost silence it was so hushed indifferent people would only have guessed that mr dunn was speaking by the quietness in which the others listened but ruth heard the voice and many of the words though they conveyed no idea to her mind. She was too much stunned even to feel curious to know to what they related. He spoke. That was her one fact. Presently up came Mary, bounding exultant. Papa had let her stay up one quarter of an hour longer, because Mr. Hickson had asked. Mr. Hickson was so clever, she did not know what to make of Mr. Dunn. He seemed such a dawdle but he was very handsome. Had Ruth seen him? Oh, no, she could not. It was so dark on those stupid sands. Well, never mind. She would see him to-morrow. She must be well to-morrow. Papa seemed a good deal put out that neither she nor Elizabeth were in the drawing-room to-night, and his last words were, Tell Mrs. Denby, I hope, and Papa's hopes always meant expect. She will be able to make breakfast at nine o'clock and then she would see Mr. Dunn. That was all Ruth heard about him. She went with Mary into her bedroom, helped her to undress, and put the candle out. At length she was alone in her own room. At length. But the tension did not give way immediately. She fastened her door and threw open the window, cold and threatening as was the night. She tore off her gown, she put her hair back from her heated face. It seemed now as if she could not think, as if thought and emotion had been repressed so sternly that they would not come to relieve her stupefied brain, till all at once, like a flash of lightning, her life, past and present, was revealed to her to its minutest detail. And when she saw her very present now, the strange confusion of agony was too great to be borne, and she cried aloud. Then she was quite dead, and listened as to the sound of galloping armies. If I might see him, if I might see him, if I might just ask him why he left me, if I had vexed him in any way, it was so strange, so cruel. It was not him, it was his mother, said she, almost fiercely, as if answering herself, Oh, God! but he might have found me out before this. 
she continued sadly he did not care for me as i did for him he did not care for me at all she went on wildly and sharply he did me cruel harm i can never lift up my face in innocence they think i have forgotten all because i do not speak oh darling love am i talking against you asked she tenderly i am so torn and perplexed you who are the father of my child but that very circumstance full of such tender meaning in many cases threw a new light into her mind it changed her from the woman into the mother the stern guardian of her child she was still for a time thinking then she began again but in a low deep voice he left me he might have been hurried off but he might have inquired he might have learned and explained he left me to bear the burden and the shame and never cared to learn as he might have done of leonard's birth he has no love for his child and i will have no love for him she raised her voice while uttering this determination and then feeling her own weakness she moaned out alas alas and then she started up for all this time she had been rocking herself backwards and forwards as she sat on the ground and began to pace the room with hurried steps what am i thinking of where am i i who have been praying these years and years to be worthy to be leonard's mother my god what a depth of sin is in my heart why the old time would be as white as snow to what it would be now if i sought him out and prayed for the explanation which would re-establish him in my heart i who have striven or made a mock of trying to learn god's holy will in order to bring up leonard into the full strength of a christian i who have taught his sweet innocent lips to pray lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil and yet somehow i've been longing to give him to his father who is who is she almost choked till at last she cried sharp out oh my god i do believe leonard's father is a bad man and yet oh pitiful god i love him i cannot forget i cannot she threw her body half out the window into the cold night air the wind was rising and came in great gusts the rain beat down on her it did her good a still calm night would not have soothed her as this did the wild tattered clouds hurrying past the moon gave her a foolish kind of pleasure that almost made her smile a vacant smile the blast-driven rain came on her again and drenched her hair through and through the words stormy wind fulfilling his word came into her mind she sat down on the floor this time her hands were clasped round her knees the uneasy rocking motion was stilled i wonder if my darling is frightened with this blustering noisy wind i wonder if he is awake and then her thoughts went back to the various times of old when affrighted by the weather sound so mysterious in the night he had crept into her bed and clung to her and she had soothed him and sweetly awed him into stillness and childlike faith by telling him of the goodness and power of god of a sudden she crept to a chair and there knelt as in the very presence of god hiding her face at first not speaking a word for he did not know her heart but by moaning by and by moaning out amid her sobs and tears and now for the first time she wept oh my god help me for i am very weak my god i pray thee be my rock and my strong fortress for i of myself am nothing if i ask in his name thou wilt give it me in the name of jesus christ i pray for strength to do thy will she could not think or indeed remember anything but that she was weak and god was strong and a very present help in time of trouble and the wind rose 
yet higher and the house shook and vibrated as in measured time the great and terrible gusts came from the four quarters of the heavens and blew around it dying away in the distance with loud and unearthly wails which were not utterly still before the sound of the coming blast was heard like the trumpets of the vanguard of the prince of air there was a knock at the bedroom door a little gentle knock and a soft child's voice mrs denby may i come in please i am so frightened it was elizabeth ruth calmed her passionate breathing by one hasty draught of water and opened the door to the timid girl oh mrs denby did you ever hear such a night i am so frightened and i and mary sleep so sound ruth was too much shaken to be able to speak all at once but she took elizabeth in her arms to reassure her elizabeth stood back why how wet you are mrs denby and there's the window open i do believe oh how cold it is said she shivering get into my bed dear said ruth but do come too the candle gives such a strange light with that long wick and somehow your face does not look like you please put the candle out and come to bed i am so frightened and it seems as if i should be safer if you were by me ruth shut the window and went to bed elizabeth was all shivering and quaking to soothe her ruth made a great effort and spoke of leonard and his fears and in a low hesitating voice she spoke of god's tender mercy but very humbly for she feared lest elizabeth should think her better and holier than she was the little girl was soon asleep her fears forgotten and ruth worn out by passionate emotion and obliged to be still for fear of awakening her bedfellow went off into a short slumber through the depths of which the echoes of her waking sobs quivered up when she awoke the grey light of autumnal dawn was in the room elizabeth slept on but ruth heard the servants about and the early farmyard sounds after she had recovered from the shock of consciousness and recollection she collected her thoughts with a stern calmness he was here in a few hours she must meet him there was no escape except through subterfuges and contrivances that were both false and cowardly how it would all turn out she could not say or even guess but of one thing she was clear and to one thing she would hold fast that was that come what might she would obey god's law and be the end of all what it might she would say thy will be done she only asked for strength enough to do this when the time came how the time would come what speech or action would be requisite on her part she did not know she did not even try to conjecture she left that in his hands she was icy cold but very calm when the breakfast bell rang she went down immediately because she felt that there was less chance of a recognition if she were already at her place behind the tea-urn and busied with the cups than if she came in after all were settled her heart seemed to stand still but she felt almost a strange exultant sense of power over herself she felt rather than saw that he was not there mr bradshaw and mr hickson were and so busy talking election politics that they did not interrupt their conversation even when they bowed to her her pupils sat on one side of her before they were quite settled and while the other two gentlemen yet hung over the fire mr dunn came in ruth felt as if that moment was like death she had a kind of desire to make some sharp sound to relieve a choking sensation but it was over in an instant and she sat on very composed and silent to all outward appearance the very model of a governess who knew her place and by and by she felt strangely at ease in her sense of power she could even listen to what was being said she had never dared as yet to look at mr dunn though her heart burned to see him once again he sounded changed 
the voice had lost its fresh and youthful eagerness of tone though in peculiarity of modulation it was the same it could never be mistaken for the voice of another person there was a good deal said at that breakfast for none seemed inclined to hurry although it was sunday morning ruth was compelled to sit there and it was good for her that she did that half hour seemed to separate the present mr dunn very effectively from her imagination of what mr bellingham had been she was no analyzer she hardly ever had learnt to notice character but she felt there was some strange difference between the people she had lived with lately and the man who now leant back in his chair listening in a careless manner to the conversation but never joining in or expressing any interest in it unless it somewhere or somehow touched himself now mr bradshaw always threw himself into a subject it might be in a pompous dogmatic sort of way but he did do it whether it related to himself or not and it was part of mr hickson's trade to assume an interest if he felt it not but mr dunn did neither the one nor the other when the other two were talking of many of the topics of the day he put his glass in his eye the better to examine into the exact nature of a cold game pie at the other side of the table suddenly ruth felt that his attention was caught by her until now seeing his short-sightedness she had believed herself safe now her face flushed with a painful miserable blush but in an instant she was strong and quiet she looked up straight at his face and as if this action took him aback he dropped his glass and began eating away with great diligence she had seen him he was changed she knew not how in fact the expression which had been only occasional formerly when his worst self predominated had become permanent he looked restless and dissatisfied but he was very handsome still and her quick eye had recognized with a sort of strange pride that the eyes and mouth were like leonard's although perplexed by the straightforward brave look she had sent right at him he was not entirely baffled he thought this mrs denby was certainly like poor ruth but this woman was far handsomer her face was positively greek and then such a proud superb turn of her head quite queenly a governess in mr bradshaw's family why she might be a percy or a howard for the grandeur of her grace poor ruth this woman's hair was darker though and she had less colour although a more refined-looking person poor ruth and for the first time for several years he wondered what had become of her though of course there was but one thing that could have happened and perhaps it was as well he did not know her end for most likely it would have made him very uncomfortable he leaned back in his chair and unobserved for he would not have thought it gentlemanly to look so fixedly at her if she or any one noticed him he put up his glass again she was speaking to one of her pupils and she did not see him by jove it must be she though there were little dimples came out about the mouth as she spoke just like those he used to admire so much in ruth and which he had never seen in any one else the sunshine without the positive movement of a smile the longer he looked the more he was convinced and it was with a jerk that he recovered himself enough to answer mr bradshaw's question whether he wished to go to church or not church how far a mile no i think i shall perform my devotions at home to-day he absolutely felt jealous when mr hickson sprang up to open the door as ruth and her pupils left the room he was pleased to feel jealous again he had been really afraid he was too much used up for such sensations 
but hickson must keep his place what he was paid for was doing the talking to the electors not paying attention to the ladies and their families mr dunn had noticed that mr hickson had tried to be gallant to miss bradshaw let him if he liked but let him beware how he behaved to this fair creature ruth or no ruth it certainly was ruth only how the devil had she played her cards so well as to be the governess the respected governess in such a family as mr bradshaw's mr dunn's movements were evidently to be the guide of mr hickson's mr bradshaw always disliked going to church partly from principle partly because he never could find the places in the prayer book mr dunn was in the drawing-room as mary came down ready equipped he was turning over the leaves of the large and handsome bible seeing mary he was struck with a new idea how singular it is said he that the name of ruth is so seldom chosen by those good people who go to the bible before they christen their children it is a very pretty name i think mr bradshaw looked up why mary said he is not that mrs denby's name yes papa replied mary eagerly and i know two other ruths there's ruth brown here and ruth mccartney at eccleston and i have an aunt called ruth mr dunn i don't think your observation holds good besides my daughter's governess i know three other ruths oh i have no doubt i was wrong it was just a speech of which one perceives the folly the moment it is made but secretly he rejoiced with a fierce joy over the success of his device elizabeth came to summon mary ruth was glad when she got into the open air and away from the house two hours were gone and over two out of a day a day and a half for it might be late on monday morning before the eccleston party returned she felt weak and trembling in body but strong in power over herself they had left the house in good time for church so they needed not to hurry and they went leisurely along the road now and then passing some country person whom they knew and with whom they exchanged a kindly placid greeting but presently to ruth's dismay she heard a step behind coming at a rapid pace a peculiar clank of rather high-heeled boots which gave a springy sound to the walk that she had known well long ago it was like a nightmare where the evil dreaded is never avoided never completely shunned but is by one side at the very moment of triumph in escape there he was by her side and there was still a quarter of a mile intervening between her and the church but even yet she trusted that he had not recognized her i have changed my mind you see said he quietly i have some curiosity to see the architecture of the church some of these old country churches have singular bits about them mr bradshaw kindly directed me part of the way but i was so much puzzled by turns to the right and turns to the left that i was quite glad to espy your party that speech required no positive answer of any kind and no answer did it receive he had not expected a reply he knew if she were ruth she could not answer any indifferent words of his and her silence made him more certain of her identity with the lady by his side the scenery here is of a kind new to me neither grand wild nor yet marked by high cultivation and yet it has great charms it reminds me of some part of wales he breathed deeply and then added you have been in wales i believe he spoke low almost in a whisper the little church bell began to call the lagging people with its quick sharp summons ruth writhed in body and spirit but struggled on the church door would be gained at last and in that holy place she would find peace he repeated in a louder tone so as to compel an answer in order to conceal her agitation from the girls have you never been in wales he used never instead of ever 
and laid the emphasis on that word in order to mark his meaning to ruth and ruth only but he drove her to bay i have been in wales sir she replied in a calm grave tone i was there many years ago events took place there which contribute to make the recollections of that time most miserable to me i shall be obliged to you sir if you will make no further reference to it the little girls wondered how mrs denbigh could speak in such a high tone of quiet authority to mr dunn who was almost a member of parliament but they settled that her husband must have died in wales and of course that would make the recollection of the country most miserable as she said mr dunn did not dislike the answer and he positively admired the dignity with which she spoke his leaving her as he did must have made her very miserable and he liked the pride that made her retain her indignation until he could speak to her in private and explain away a good deal of what she might complain of with some justice the church was reached they all went up the middle aisle into the eagle's crag pew he followed them in entered himself and shut the door ruth's heart sank as she saw him there just opposite to her coming between her and the clergyman who was to read out the word of god it was merciless it was cruel to haunt her there she durst not lift her eyes to the bright eastern light she could not see peacefully the marble images of the dead lay on their tombs for he was between her and all light and peace she knew that his look was on her that he never turned his glance away she could not join in the prayer for the remission of sins while he was there for his very presence seemed as a sign that their stain would never be washed out of her life but although goaded and chafed by her thoughts and recollections she kept very still no sign of emotion no flush of colour was on her face as he looked at her elizabeth could not find her place and then ruth breathed once long and deeply as she moved up the pew and out of the straight burning glance of those eyes of evil meaning when they sat down for the reading of the first lesson ruth turned the corner of the seat so as no longer to be opposite to him she could not listen the words seemed to be uttered in some world far away from which she was exiled and cast out their sound yet more their meaning was dim and distant but in this extreme tension of mind to hold in her bewildered agony it so happened that one of her senses was preternaturally acute while all the church and the people swam in misty haze one point in a dark corner grew clearer and clearer till she saw what at another time she could not have discerned at all a face a gargoyle i think they call it at the end of the arch next to the narrowing of the nave into the chancel and in the shadow of that contraction the face was beautiful in feature the next to it was a grinning monkey but it was not the features that were the most striking part there was a half-open mouth not in any way distorted out of its exquisite beauty by the intense expression of suffering it conveyed any distortion of the face by mental agony implies that a struggle with circumstance is going on but in this face if such a struggle had been it was over now circumstance had conquered and there was no hope from mortal endeavour or help from mortal creature to be had but the eyes looked onward and upward to the hills from whence cometh our help and though the parted lips seemed ready to quiver with agony yet the expression of the whole face owing to these strange stony and yet spiritual eyes was high and consoling if mortal gaze had never sought its meaning before in the deep shadow where it had been placed long centuries ago yet ruth's did now who could have imagined such a look 
who could have witnessed perhaps felt such infinite sorrow and yet dared to lift it up by faith into a peace so pure or was it a mere conception if so what a soul the unknown carver must have had for creator and handicraftsman must have been one no two minds could have been in such perfect harmony whatever it was however it came there imaginer carver sufferer all were long passed away human art was ended human life done human suffering over but this remained it stilled ruth's beating heart to look on it she grew still enough to hear words which have come to many in their time of need and awed them in the presence of the extremest suffering that the hushed world had ever heard of the second lesson for the morning of the twenty fifth of september is the twenty sixth chapter of st matthew's gospel and when they prayed again ruth's tongue was unloosed and she also could pray in his name who underwent the agony in the garden as they came out of church there was a little pause and gathering at the door it had begun to rain those who had umbrellas were putting them up those who had not were regretting and wondering how long it would last standing for a moment impeded by the people who were thus collected under the porch ruth heard a voice close to her say very low but very distinctly i have much to say to you much to explain i entreat you to give me the opportunity ruth did not reply she would not acknowledge that she heard but she trembled nevertheless for the well-remembered voice was low and soft and had yet its power to thrill she earnestly desired to know why and how he had left her it appeared to her as if that knowledge could alone give her a relief from the restless wondering that had distracted her mind and that one explanation could do no harm no the higher spirit made answer it must not be ruth and the girls had each an umbrella she turned to mary and said mary give your umbrella to mr dunn and come under mine her way of speaking was short and decided she was compressing her meaning into as few words as possible the little girl obeyed in silence as they went first through the churchyard stile mr dunn spoke again you are unforgiving said he i only ask you to hear me i have a right to be heard ruth i won't believe you are so much changed as not to listen to me when i entreat he spoke in a tone of soft complaint but he himself had done much to destroy the illusion which had hung about his memory for years whenever ruth had allowed herself to think of it besides which during the time of her residence in the benson family her feeling of what people ought to be had been unconsciously raised and refined and mr dunn even while she had to struggle against the force of past recollections repelled her so much by what he was at present that every speech of his every minute they were together served to make her path more and more easy to follow his voice retained something of its former influence when he spoke without her seeing him she could not help remembering former days she did not answer this last speech any more than the first she saw clearly that putting aside all thought as to the character of their former relationship it had been dissolved by his will his act and deed and that therefore the power to refuse any further intercourse whatsoever remained with her it sometimes seems a little strange how after having earnestly prayed to be delivered from temptation and having given ourselves with shut eyes into god's hand from that time every thought every outward influence every acknowledged law of life seems to lead us on from strength to strength it seems strange sometimes because we notice the coincidence but it is the natural unavoidable consequence of all truth and goodness being one and the same and therefore carried out in every circumstance external and internal of god's creation when mr dunn saw that ruth would not answer him he became only the more determined that she should hear what he had to say what that was he did not exactly know 
the whole affair was most mysterious and piquant. The umbrella protected Ruth from more than the rain on that walk homewards, for under its shelter she could not be spoken to unheard. She had not rightly understood at what time she and the girls were to dine. From the gathering at meal times, she must not shrink. She must show no sign of weakness. But, oh, the relief after that walk to sit in her own room, locked up, so that neither Mary nor Elizabeth could come by surprise, and to let her weary frame, weary with being so long braced up to rigidity and stiff quiet, fall into a chair anyhow, all helpless, nerveless, motionless, as if the very bones had melted out of her. The peaceful rest which her mind took was in thinking of Leonard. She dared not look before or behind, but she could see him well at present. She brooded over the thought of him, till she dreaded his father more and more. By the light of her child's purity and innocence, she saw evil clearly and yet more clearly. She thought that, if Leonard ever came to know the nature of his birth, she had nothing for it but to die out of his sight. He could never know, human heart could never know, her ignorant innocence, and all the small circumstances which had impelled her onwards. But God knew, and if Leonard heard of his mother's error, why, nothing remained but death, for she felt, then, as if she had it in her power to die innocently out of such future agony. But that escape is not so easy. Suddenly a fresh thought came, and she prayed that, through whatever suffering she might be purified, whatever trials, woes, measureless pangs God might see fit to chastise her with, she would not shrink if only at last she might come into his presence in heaven. Alas, the shrinking from suffering we cannot help. That part of her prayer was vain, and as for the rest, was not the sure justice of his law finding out even now? His laws once broken, his justice and the very nature of those laws bring the immutable retribution. But if we turn penitently to him, he enables us to bear our punishment with a meek and docile heart, for his mercy endureth for ever. Mr. Bradshaw had felt himself rather wanting in proper attention to his guest, inasmuch as he had been unable all in a minute to comprehend Mr. Dunn's rapid change of purpose, and before it had entered into his mind that, notwithstanding the distance of the church, Mr. Dunn was going thither, that gentleman was out of the sight and far out of the reach of his burly host. But though the latter had so far neglected the duties of hospitality as to allow his visitor to sit in the Eagle's Crag pew with no other guard of honour than the children and the governess, Mr. Bradshaw determined to make up for it by extra attention during the remainder of the day. Accordingly, he never left Mr. Dunn. Whatever wish that gentleman expressed, it was the study of his host to gratify. Did he hint at the pleasure which a walk in such beautiful scenery would give him? Mr. Bradshaw was willing to accompany him although at Eccleston it was a principle with him not to take any walks for pleasure on a Sunday. When Mr. Dunn turned round and recollected letters which must be written and which would compel him to stay at home, Mr. Bradshaw instantly gave up the walk and remained at hand, ready to furnish him with any writing materials which could be wanted, and which were not laid out in the half-furnished house. Nobody knew where Mr. Hickson was all this time. He had sauntered out after Mr. Dunn, when the latter set off for church, and he had never returned. Mr. Dunn kept wondering if he could have met Ruth, if, in fact, she had gone out with her pupils, now that the afternoon had cleared up. This uneasy wonder, and a few mental imprecations on his host's polite attention, together with the letter-writing pretense, passed away the afternoon, the longest afternoon he had ever spent, and of weariness he had had his share. Lunch was lingering in the dining-room, left there for the truant Mr. Hickson, but of the children or Ruth there was no sign. He ventured on a distant inquiry as to their whereabouts. 
they dine early they are gone to church again mrs denbigh was a member of the establishment once and though she attends chapel at home she seems glad to have an opportunity of going to church mr dunn was on the point of asking some further question about mrs denbigh when mr hickson came in loud-spoken cheerful hungry and is ready to talk about his ramble and the way in which he had lost and found himself as he was about everything else he knew how to dress up the commonest occurrence with a little exaggeration a few puns and a happy quotation or two so as to make it sound very agreeable he could read faces and saw that he had been missed both host and visitor looked moped to death he determined to devote himself to their amusement during the remainder of the day for he had really lost himself and felt that he had been away too long on a dull sunday when people were apt to get hipped if not well amused it is really a shame to be indoors in such a place rain yes it rained some hours ago but now it is splendid weather i feel myself quite qualified for guide i assure you i can show you all the beauties of the neighbourhood and throw in a bog and a nest of vipers to boot mr dunn languidly assented to this proposal of going out and then he became restless until mr hickson had eaten a hasty lunch for he hoped to meet ruth on the way from church to be near her and watch her though he might not be able to speak to her to have the slow hours roll away to know he must leave the next day and yet so close to her not to be seeing her was more than he could bear in an impetuous kind of way he disregarded all mr hickson's offers of guidance to lovely views and turned a deaf ear to mr bradshaw's expressed wish of showing him the land belonging to the house very little for fourteen thousand pounds and set off wilfully on the road leading to the church from which he averred he had seen a view which nothing else about the place could equal they met the country people dropping homewards no ruth was there she and her pupils had returned by the field way as mr bradshaw informed his guests at dinner time mr dunn was very captious all through dinner he thought it never would be over and cursed hickson's interminable stories which were told on purpose to amuse him his heart gave a fierce bound when he saw her in the drawing-room with the little girls she was reading to them with how sick and trembling a heart no words can tell but she could master and keep down outward signs of her emotion an hour more to-night part of which was to be spent in family prayer and all in the safety of company another hour in the morning when all would be engaged in the bustle of departure if during this short space of time she could not avoid speaking to him she could at least keep him at such a distance as to make him feel that henceforward her world and his belonged to separate systems wide as the heavens apart by degrees she felt that he was drawing near to where she stood he was by the table examining the books that lay upon it mary and elizabeth drew off a little space awe-stricken by the future member for eccleston as he bent his head over a book he said i implore you five minutes alone the little girls could not hear but ruth hemmed in so that no escape was possible did hear she took sudden courage and said in a clear voice will you read the whole passage aloud i do not remember it mr hickson hovering at no great distance heard these words and drew near to second mrs denby's request mr bradshaw who was very sleepy after his unusually late dinner and longing for bedtime joined in the request for it would save the necessity for making talk and he might perhaps get in a nap undisturbed and unnoticed before the servants came into prayers mr dunn was caught he was obliged to read aloud although he did not know what he was reading in the middle of some sentence the door opened a rush of servants came in and mr bradshaw became particularly wide awake in an instant and read them a long sermon with great emphasis and unction winding up with a prayer almost as long ruth sat with her head drooping more from exhaustion after a season of effort than because she shunned mr dunn's looks he had so lost his power over her 
his power which had stirred her so deeply the night before that except as one knowing her error and her shame and making a cruel use of such knowledge she had quite separated him from the idol of her youth and yet for the sake of that first and only love she would gladly have known what explanation he could offer to account for leaving her it would have been something gained to her own self-respect if she had learnt that he was not then as she felt him to be now cold and egotistical caring for no one and nothing but what related to himself home and leonard how strangely peaceful the two seemed oh for the rest that a dream about leonard would bring mary and elizabeth went to bed immediately after prayers and ruth accompanied them it was planned that the gentlemen should leave early the next morning they were to breakfast half an hour sooner to catch the railway train and this by mr dunn's own arrangement who had been as eager about his canvassing the week before as it was possible for him to be but who now wished eccleston and the dissenting interest therein very fervently at the devil just as the carriage came round mr bradshaw turned to ruth any message for leonard beyond love which is a matter of course ruth gasped for she saw mr dunn catch at the name she did not guess the sudden sharp jealousy called out by the idea that leonard was a grown-up man who is leonard said he to the little girl standing by him he did not know which she was mrs denby's little boy answered mary under some pretence or other he drew near to ruth and in that low voice which she had learnt to loathe he said our child by the white misery that turned her face to stone by the wild terror in her imploring eyes by the gasping breath which came out as the carriage drove away he knew that he had seized the spell to make her listen at last end of chapter twenty three